Wish I had a had another dream, then I'd have left it. Instead, we're gonna go to the brink. Don't you think that we should forget? Give me all your love, give me all your love. 
for you to come through for all of your promises to be true it's heartbreaking and raise the mood I want to be Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to LCK Spring 2022. I'm Atlas, joined by Chronicler here for the final day of our second week. It's really starting to zip by. It's going fast, and uh, I think we have had an incredible first two weeks, and there's still a lot of questions up in the air. How good are teams? What's the peaks? What's the lows? And where everyone is going to end up? Yeah, and I think we have one of the peaks and one of the lows to start us off here today with uh, T1 taking on Sandbox. Thank you, you very much there. for the free oh. segue, my oh. friend. That was absolutely beautifully done. Yes, uh, T1 have been a little bit outspoken. Faker actually uh, revealed in an interview that they're still trying extraordinarily hard because they've had relatively weaker opponents uh, thus far, which has bloated their stats just a little bit. That being said, when they are faced, they look extraordinarily strong. Plus, the scrim fairies are saying that they're still doing an amazing job in scrims, and apparently BDD says that, yeah, he just doesn't really like facing off against T1 in scrims. But let's get into our points of the match to begin things off here as uh, Live Sandbox, two-match losing streak, of course, giving Kwondong Freaks their first win here in the LCK for Spring 2022. Cannot feel too good versus T1 not losing very much at all. And I will... Not be surprised by uh, a similar result here today. While I think that Live Sandbox have a lot of development, uh, obviously you have the challengers, representatives, you have the rookie of the uh, year from last year in Croco, and you have Closer. Uh, this team, especially with Dove also swapping off his main role, just doesn't seem to have the experience. I think individually these players show that they can at least go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a lot of our better teams, but it just doesn't really come together, whereas T1, they are insane. Yeah, they are pretty ridiculous. However, there are some fun matchups here today in uh, Closer versus Faker. Of course, Closer played instead of Faker for a few games last year. Um, of course, there was that whole debacle with wanting to, you know, the, the, the coaching staff stuff that was happening yeah. and the, the rosters being switched around all over the place. Uh, Closer definitely did have quite a few games um, for T1. But now Faker gets to put him in his place. 
really uh, solve it once and for all as to who the better mid laner was. And uh, I think that Team Diff might come into it, but definitely an interesting matchup. As uh, Carrier had a bit to say about Live Sandbox's bottom lane, um, they have a lot to learn from. So, uh, yeah, definitely some, uh, some fighting words, but it's Ice. He didn't exactly have a great debut um, with Kale, who is also a rookie there on the bottom side. Yeah, I, I, I don't even think this is BM. This is just objectively true. Right? This left, uh, left Sandbox roster true. is a roster with a lot of inexperienced players. And uh, the main takeaway for me will be how well do we see them develop throughout either this game or at the very least the split. Because uh, it's Gumi Yushi and Karia. Uh, you can make an argument for them being uh, the best bot lane in the world. And, and, you know, some people wouldn't agree, but there was also a lot of people that would agree. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's fine. Yeah, we haven't actually uh, seen Uzi play yet, have we? So I guess, <laughs> I guess that <laughs> argument isn't there. As let's introduce Liv Sandbox to LOL Park. Dove has another crack at the top lane. We'll see whether he does better against Zayus. But of course, no changes. It is Croco who had a bit of a shocker in the last game. He was playing so well in the first week, but wasn't able to follow that one up this week. See whether he is going to be improved. And Closer, as we mentioned before, is going to be there alongside the rookie bottom lane in Ice and Kale. And this team, uh, barring their uh, highlight performance in the first match that they played, has faced a lot of issues where they go in very aggressive and early skirmishes, then they get snowballed against, and they don't have the cohesion of the game plan to really come back from that. And considering players like Croco, I think it's understandable that they try to go live sandbox as an organization has always really favored that aggressive play style. Yeah, they have um, definitely been mono red for a very long time. Been yeah, very much LS for that one from like what three years ago now. Yeah. Still the same. Still applies. Yep, and a team that stayed relatively the same roster-wise uh, between last year and now is T1. Zeus towards the top side now for the remainder of the foreseeable future, and this team is just looking more and more terrifying every time we see them. And I have a feeling the Live Sandbox are not exactly going to be the test that they're looking forward to next week. So we're going to have to wait for, for a really big high-tier match. However, there is always the blue shell. And uh, there has been a lot of blue shelling. Not, not necessarily in match scores. Genji bounced back, but they dropped a game against Homa Life. And that does go and teach us a lesson that, yes, T1, clear favorite, incredible team. Uh, not a lot of switch ups. And I think that Zayus has the potential to bring this team to either greater heights, but still can't go for these niddly drafts that we've seen. T1 still needs yeah. to respect Lift Sandbox. If they do, I think this will be a fairly one-sided matchup. We've seen teams, especially... Yeah, I mean, yesterday, yes, yesterday is sort of looming. That's the elephant yeah. in the room that we do need to address <laughs> because Genji certainly they uh, dropped the ball in their first game, and I think it was a bit of a wake-up call for them. They came back, they managed to win the remaining two, and the last game was not even close. But uh, let's see whether T1 are definitely going to be all business. And historically, they definitely have been. Having a look at some of these stats here, of course, damage percent-wise, Faker, they don't lean on him quite as much. Gumiushi does a heck of a lot of work, but Closer is the linchpin for his team. And Closer and uh, Croco, I think that that two-man combo is what you're going to be looking towards if you're a Lift Sandbox fan. That must be where you're going to find your edge, but you're up against Faker and Owner, and then then I think Closer and Croco are, are going to be decent when they face off against weaker mid-jungler duos, but you're playing against the best player of all time, as well as Owner, who's just had uh, really an incredible ever run ever since summer. Yeah. And uh, that's going to be really, really hard to match up to. And actually, um, Owner and Croco were two of the junglers that were really vying for most improved player for last yeah. year and best rookie last year. Um, things like this, like they were definitely in the forefront of our minds. I think Peanut really took the cake for the end of the summer season when it came to that MVP jungler, which is why he was awarded that one. But Owner and Croco, both of them, were my second choice uh, when I was put to that vote. So looking forward to seeing how they're going to go up against one another as uh, a Dove fan from old times coming through here. And uh, we'll see how he does up against Zayas because this is going to be a rough one. Yeah, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, Dove, his uh, five-year debut anniversary was, uh, was recently. Yeah. Um, how old do you think Zayas was at that point? Um... <laughs> 
like it's one of wow. these questions with this T1 roster. He may have still been struggling with times tables. Let's yeah, just say that. It's, uh, it's it's insane, right? And and this player has developed from uh, after uh, having an okay performance in spring, right? But then still sharing the spot with Cuz and with Alan, just become de facto one of the best junglers uh, within both Korea and and also at Worlds. Yeah. Uh, just in general, it's uh, it's been an incredible development. Same for Gumiyushi, honestly, like. If you think back like a little bit more than a year, year and a couple of months ago when he debuted in the Gauntlet, when T1 is desperately trying to get to Worlds, and look at him now. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's pretty amazing, uh, the transformation. I actually think that his play is what has been the most impressive to me because I remember when he was playing instead of Teddy, there were a lot of moments where we're like, oh, he's not being able to position himself correctly in the late game. He's struggling to actually uh, utilize the strength yeah. that he got from his very powerful laning phase moving later into the game. And that has disappeared as a criticism, oh, yeah. 100%. And now he's just extraordinarily dominant laning phase into extraordinarily dominant <laughs> late game, yeah. which uh, I'm yeah. trying to find out. Like, it, it reminds me of the transition Deft went through when he went over to EDG, where yeah. he went from on Samsung Blue, very, very timid in the laning phase, to learning that crazy laning phase, whereas Gumiyushi, kind of the opposite situation is true, where laning phase always good, late game positioning is now what he's picked up. And uh, it is very scary. And Lift Sandbox have a rookie bottom lane, and it feels unfair, I'm not going to lie. However, they do need to leave it all on the rift. And Lift Sandbox, not a lot to lose in this particular game. They'll take away the Karma and the Twist of Fate to start us off here in this draft. And the good old Renekton is going to be parking himself on the bench. Zero and one so far here in the LCK. <laughs> Let's see whether uh, he just continues to get banned. He can finish the whole season with, like, 99% ban rate, zero one. That would just be the best. Would it be Atlas? Would it be? <laughs> Look, it'd be funny. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether it's I, I, I agree with that. And for the draft here today, I think for Liv Sandbox, uh, I would love to see a tailored aggressive draft. Uh, often I'm a fan of what I call the Fred of Brion strat, where you just draft the Yeah, well, I really belts. like, uh, yeah, definitely Wolf has, uh, uh, has something going yeah, Wolf, on there. Yeah, Wolf has seatbelts. I think Valdus calls them, you know, the hometown team. They're, they're and just, I call them the homework team. Um, and it's, it's yeah. just, there's, a, there's a few different ways to think about it, but uh, definitely they all kind of fit. Yeah, uh, where you just draft a all-around teamfight comp, I would like Lift Samus to go aggro. I don't think that if they don't win the early game, they have a chance against T1. So just go all in on the early aggression. Trin the mirror, I wouldn't mind as a quick pick up here, uh, as that is the pick that Dolph has looked the best on, and they can leverage that very, very well. For T1, as mentioned previously, uh, as long as they get a draft that allows them to either leverage their laning power or skill safely into a mid to late game, I'm going to be happy. Uh, just make it cohesive, right? Yep. We've seen that is one, I think, one of the main issues that they've run into in the past, but if they go and just pick up a Caitlyn Lux lane here, then already Lift Sandbox, their situation becomes a lot more dire. And yeah, Corky's also open, so... Um, yeah, you don't need to pick the Lux here, and yeah. Corky being available. I was going to mention this, uh, as far as the tier list homework was concerned, oh, um, there has yeah. been a little bit of it left um, unattended. And so Corky, who was permabanned all yesterday, uh, and the Caitlyn, both of which were extraordinarily dominant and are extraordinarily dominant, now go into the hands of T1, which um, I don't think I have to spell out for anyone, is real rough news for Live Sandbox. This is probably Jin Zin, right? Oh no, Zin's banned. So yeah, Jin J4. Jin J4 probably. But I, I, I don't want to see J4 here, because I don't think J4 is good into Caitlyn Corky. I don't, I don't think the pick provides nearly as much as he otherwise would, with both of them getting an easy way of getting out of the Cataclysm. Uh, and... I guess this is fine. It's it's good comfort. Yeah. That, uh, that at the very least will provide you with some team fighting power, but Lift Sandbox here, especially if a lane dominant support gets picked up here, can even leave that for later because Carrie has a champion ocean, right? Just pick something that shoves well. Like, I think Ice and Kyle are going to have an incredibly hard time already. And it's not like T1 need to win the early game because they get Faker and Corky. Yeah, I think um, Lux is the most obvious pickup yeah, here it because is. it leaves your hand open, right? Like, yes, you can have a few junglers banned away here, things like this. Um, but otherwise, it is not too much of an issue. Um, yeah, this owner has so many other picks. Like, it's only Zin Zhao that's been banned it away. And uh, Lip Sandbox also have their jungler to pick up as well. Yeah, there's just too much as well, right? There's Viego, uh, as I say, gets banned. There's Jarvan, there's Diana. Um, just a lot of picks that are still available here. Wonder if maybe with this Viego ban, Lip Sandbox are like, okay, let's, let's handshake on just banning junglers, uh, which would actually create maybe some diversity 
in a rule where we have not seen yeah. uh, as much of it. I think T1 would like to see them go for either something with a lot of engage or a more aggressive jungler, um, something that can kind of leverage their pressure that they're going to have on the bottom side of the map. Uh, I'd like a, a, a Talon for Croco. That's what I'd like. Yeah, I agree. Oh, Poppy to be banned away. Certainly uh, works out against the 90 Calibanet and the Valkyrie that uh, the carriers of T1 will be wanting to employ. And thus far, T1. Lee Sin, is it actually worth a ban? <sighs> is the question here for Live Sandbox? I wouldn't say so. They might uh, they might uh, opt into that regardless, but instead it will be Jace. Okay. And Trindamir is still available here. And now for T1, I think you pick the jungle pick, leave uh, Zeus with a counter pick on top, and then you're going to be feeling perfectly happy. And while I don't think the Lee is as strong as it has been, um, it's still a fine pickup in my opinion. Owner, uh, if he can just try and be his best rascal self, uh, then there's going to be no problems there. After hovering over a few fun picks, yeah. I land up on one that might not be the strongest, but I still have faith in Owner to pilot that. Yeah, I would have liked the Skana. Bit of a shout out to right. good old Captain Flowers over there in the LCS. Uh, hasn't woken up yet, I would assume, or hasn't gone to bed yet. We'll have to see. Um, definitely sound off if you are watching. As um, Gragas to be considered, and that means that I'm suspecting Zaius might uh, put either the lease in towards the top, top side, or it is just nah, which makes me a little bit sad, but that's all right. I think Zaius is, Zaius, Zaius is allowed to play nah. He's, yes, uh, yeah. no, it's just boring. Right? It is boring. It's just not, not no, that interesting, as that's a horse. Oh, I would love that. Horse Ooh. cat, horse cat is real horse, scary. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and it kind of fits into Lift Sandbox's style, right? Well, I think that Croco is one of their, uh, their their main carries, and okay, I like Heck this. Yeah. I right. like this from Lift Sandbox. Uh, it's it's fairly all in, but uh, I think you might as well. That bot lane now going to feel a lot less safe post level six for the Akram in pushing in, shoving, and overextending because his bot lane ganks are something to be feared. Absolutely. I really like this. The Nar was about as obvious <laughs> as it could possibly be, I, but it's it's just a really well-rounded draft here on T1's side, so you're not exactly going to be waving any fingers. As soon as that Corky Caitlyn was locked in, it was pretty much autopilot from there, and honestly, it feels uh, pretty standard. That being said, there is a lot to be interested in when it comes to Live Sandbox. I think the Hecarim is really, really cool, and Croco, empowered by the Yumi, this is like one of those moments where it's Hecarim, you know how he can just run a million screens away from his team? At least now he will have one teammate with him. You know? Guaranteed. It's, yeah, you, you mean Hecarim, especially if the Hecarim can get a, a little bit of a lead either in farm or in terms of kills early on, can be devastating to play into, right? They synergize incredibly well, the extra skirmishing, the speed up that gets converted into AD, and I think that, especially on the bot side of the map, there's going to be a lot of pressure available, uh, as well as that counter matchup in the top side. But I do think that even if Sam was getting the lead, the composition of T1 can run into issues that is fairly squishy, um, and the Gnar can be a bit finicky in the team fights without a primary form of engage. Yeah. I think there's uh, there's a lot to be excited about when it comes to looking at Liv Sandbox's draft as a whole. But when you put it up against what is pretty much like half the tier list, yeah. um, it's very, very frightening. Faker's Corky has been very, very strong. And Gumi Ishikaria on Caitlyn Lux against a rookie bottom lane yeah. feels about as unfair as it can be. Yeah. Um, it's real rough. But so we'll uh, like to see Croco spend some time there towards the bottom side of the map. And here we are on the rift for game number one. Live Sandbox taking on T1. I remember back to summer 2021. Was this not the last match um, of the regular season that T1 lost? Was it against Live Sandbox? Or was that uh, not? No, that, that was. That was uh, Prince with the... Yeah. yeah. Good old Prince. Aww. Yeah, he was actually very, very good. He was, a very, he was a very emotional player. You could see him really taking his losses to heart. And I hope we, I hope we get him. Yeah, I hope he comes back. It's yeah, uh, it was good, he good was to definitely have. he was playing for a very very long time, so yeah. you could understand him wanting to take a bit of time off. Don't know where he is at at the moment. Might have just left Korea, but he's definitely not here in Maybe the LCK. Closer and Faker uh, just facing off here in the mid lane. Do you reckon Victor Corky is the new uh, Corky Azir from old times? Of well, the most boring mid lane matchup possible? Yeah, uh, it's going to continue for a fair amount of time as well because. 
Uh, we are, uh, of course, um, not quite close to patch 12.3, which is the first patch that's really going to be influenced uh, by competitive play. And while I am hopefully going to see some corky nerfs, because while I think that Victor, while strong, in of itself isn't really choking out the rest of the meta, uh, Corky is. He is not good, or by which I mean way too good. Yeah. Uh, so he's not good for the game. He's not good for the game. Yeah. No. Uh, as uh, champions that scale that hard, probably should need a little bit more time uh, before they actually become a big threat. And uh, as mentioned previously, Gumiyushi and Karia oh. expected to really take the priority and the uh, overall control over of this lane. And Kael needs to play very respectful because we saw what happens uh, otherwise yesterday when uh, Lahans, who is a great uni player by the way, got yes. a little bit overexcited. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let's uh, let's we just we don't need to talk about that series ever again. I think I think that's absolutely fine. We can talk about the third <laughs> game. Um. That one was okay. good. Um. The rest of it not so much. Is Carrier just going to stand up here, um, threatening the light binding? Uh, which he absolutely can. You could see the early lane phase was actually okay for Liv Sandbox as far as trades were concerned because Carrier decided to take more pushing power. And now this is the result, right? You've got T1 bearing down on the turret, exactly the place that Caitlyn wants to be. What we are seeing though, and uh, is that Croco is pathing towards that bot side. They should be aware of this. Both junglers making their way over, and here you see some of the advantages that the Hecarim has. Now, farm junglers have been nerfed considerably, right? It's uh, not the meta that we had a year ago, where uh, they were incredibly strong. It was Uder and Hakrim running amok with Cam Tank. Uh, you need to have a bit more of an impact. Uh, just auto farming the jungler, I think, isn't going to provide as much as it has in the past. Yep. Uh, Owner, though, by skipping in camp, still going to be very much early on. And now providing some support. Could look for a dive here if Karius feeling confident about his bindings. Yeah, I think it depends on you and me timings and things like that. But instead, just going to go down towards the bottom side, setting up for a potential counter gank so that Gumiushi and Karius can do exactly this. And I actually really like that. It's the less risky play. And you can just make sure that things are continuing to go exactly the way they're supposed to. As Croco's going to be able to take a Rift Scuttler there in the uh, top side of the map. And we'll look for a little bit of a back, not going to be stealing away anything or going for any invades. One camp advantage there for the horse, um, which is to be expected. And you say that, you know, farm junglers aren't necessarily as popular as Ice. Going to be get bound up here. Peacemaker comes on in. Slight cancel of an auto there, but Gumiushi certainly sending the correct message there. And the T1 bottom lane continues to be good. But as I was going to say, uh, oh, as I was going to say, uh, okay, never mind. Uh, Zayas looking for a bit of a trade here towards the top side. Dove, absolutely no mana. Does have flash, so isn't going to die, but losing out on this trade. So as I was going to say, oh, oh never mind. Fake it, taking a bit of damage there in the mid lane. Okay, now, now you can. Yeah, and as I was going to say, <laughs> Hecarim is a farm animal as a horse, and therefore yeah. is probably more allowed to farm. It's got a flash forward, and that is first blood solo kill to Closer. Oh my goodness, Owner not gonna be able to trade that one back, as now Croco coming in towards the top side as well. Zayas is just going to have to die. Doesn't want to give over the assist to Croco. And I wasn't even allowed to say it. I still said it, and I got punished. Damn, T T1 also absolutely punished here in this early game, outside of here on the bottom side. And it's that bottom side that actually turns out to be a saving grace because with both those kills going over, there is still a slight lead. Or there's a very slight lead now for the Sandbox, about 1-200 gold um, because of this bot lane pressure. But a lot of things happening there at once. And that is, I'm sure, as closer, a kill that regardless of the outcome of this game... The amount of feel, catharsis of that kill oh yeah. cannot be measured. No. I don't think any of us can understand how good that would have felt. No. Um... As if you look at the history, right, Closer being heralded as like one of the most talented, hyped up rookies, up and comers, huh? playing behind Faker and never okay. really getting off the ground, then spotting this gank by Owner. And just flashing in. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was a little bit greedy. <laughs> yeah, Faker just uh, walking in range. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> As this is uh, one of the reasons why you always have to respect the Dragos. Nicely done by Zeus, because I think that an assist on Krakow would have been fine, but actually giving over a kill to the hack from this early would have been disastrous. Oh, closer. Not again. Yeah, it's not so good. As he's going to get the stuns up, and there's the flash forward, misses the Q. The T1 once again. Closer just outplaying him. 
really nice sidestep, and the attention not actually paying off. And this is, I think, as live sandbox, as good of a start as you could possibly hope for. Absolutely. Buying that bot lane, uh, getting uh, gold on Closer, who has been uh, the mid laner with one of the highest damage shares within the league. Again, that's not necessarily a good stat for the team. <laughs> but it does say a lot about how Closer is playing, right? Yeah, and uh, also how much his team relies on Closer exactly. to do well also. Because if you have a look at some of Closer's other uh -oh. stats, he's actually behind in gold a lot of the time and things like this. As only going to throw out the cube, does spot that his red buff is being taken. Oh. And Croco is just going to bail. Bit of a yeah. push here on the bottom side as Carrier looking for a little bit. No Lee Sin in the area as Light Binding is going to go wide. Peacemaker, a lot of damage just with the edge onto Ice. And T1 just going to reassert themselves here on the bottom side. And that's to be expected. That is something that T1 is now also somewhat relying on. As Carrier going oh, forward. Yeah, Light Binding connects again, and that's the cleanse. That was almost flashable for Gumushi, but doesn't want to uh, relinquish control of this lane. Of course, flash very important to have, especially up against the Hecarim. And that's a crazy thing, right? He doesn't need to flash because, yeah, getting a kill is nice there, but you know what's even better is shoving another non-cannon wave straight into that turret, getting up another plate and getting further and further ahead on this Caitlyn. Uh, actually utilize or keeping the flash means that you can also be much farther up without being nearly as scared. Rest yeah. of the map, though, T1 needs to play respectful as Crocodile Ghosts. Yeah, that is going to be the Q landing onto Closer. There's the kickback, special delivery, and it's actually Ono that locks down the kill. Croco now taking a lot of damage from Faker, but it's a one-for-one one in the end. You'll take that if you're a Sandbox fan. Is here on the bottom side, Gumiyushi. Trying to get some damage down onto Kale and Ice. The bottom block helping keep the bottom lane of Live Sandbox alive, but CS margins certainly not looking all that healthy. And I gotta say, is Carrier. That binding comes on in. Carrier's in trouble as Ice also almost dead. The exhaust comes through onto Gumiyushi. And he does have Ace in the hole, but I don't think has vision right now onto the Jin. So isn't going to pull that trigger. Personally, I would have loved to see something like a Sivir. Something with enough wave clear that left alone in the lane, you can just keep a perma clearing. You never actually engage because you have the Yumi, right? Like, there's no need for you to actually yeah. try and play the lane. I really like Sivir Yumi just in general. Yeah, it and... It be very frustrating for the poke as well. It's, it, it, it counteracts the poke, but the main thing to me is that, especially if you go for the Lethality build, you pick up an early tier, you can indefinitely keep clearing waves and you avoid this exact situation. Because Gumi Yushi and Carrier are playing this lane expertly, right? Just permanently shoving as long as they're aware of where Croco is, continuously trading, and Ice and Kao, they're kind of hanging on, but the reason why the gold lead is still in favor of T1, because of this bot lane. Yeah, Zumi's come on in there, as there's the flash out from Ice. Ace in the hole, can't be flashed. However, there is at least some sustain there. Kale holds on to his uh, heal for now, as Faker delivers a package to Closer. And Closer says, I didn't really want this. That's fine. It's not my but I, 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 I didn't order this. Yeah, exactly. Need to, need to send it back. Delivery service normally fantastic here in Korea, but that one is not what he wanted. Yeah, now he has to go to his neighbor, like knock, a knock with time, like, is, is this your package? Yeah, yeah. It's not great. Uh, what is great, while this, all of this has been happening, is that Zayus, despite that early gank uh, he didn't see coming, has still made great use of the laning power that is provided by the Gnar into the Gragas, even with Dolph going for a more laning-oriented build, uh, using the Comet and also going for the Everfrost. Um, has actually built up a sizable CS lead, so that deficit actually doesn't exist on top side. Nope. Has uh, ba uh, basically been completely mitigated by Zeus' his laning and making use of that knock counter pick in a way that we know isn't necessarily a given. And now T1 starting up this Herald. Yeah, and they should be able to use this Herald to move towards the top side, give Gumiushi even more plates. He already has four under his belt. That's like four dinners without having to do any dishes. Very, very good. It's T1. He's gonna have to deal with the fact that Croco is there. He does have the ulti available, but he's gonna get bound. Dove now looking for an opportunity. Zayas still charging up the Naba as in goes Croco. The curtains are being called as well as they take down Gumayushi to start this one off. Owner is going to survive, but Zayas is still massive in the back line. That's a double kill on both of the tanks as Kale's running for the hills and the Q will connect. There's the kick flash as Owner's not done yet. And the four of them are mopped up. Closer is the only one that remains. And while it was a nice start of the fight for Lift Sandbox, it's T1 that stands victorious in the end. Zeus absolutely clinching that team fight there with a beautiful stun. 
Oh, we're going to be looking at later toward the replay. They got the Herald as well. And although it was a nice early start from Liv Sandbox, I'm pretty sure they're going to feel a lot less good after seeing the results of that. More plates towards the mid lane. And yeah, you give up Gumiyushi. But I think by the end of that, it's T1. You don't really care. Yep, let's have a look at this one more time as T1 get themselves situated. And I really like this from the Sandbox. They focus on the Gumiyushi. They notice that he's the one that's doing a lot of the work in this early game. But if you drop the ball on what Zayas is doing, it's, uh, it's still not going to end up all that, all that good. And what happens there is that Crocker walks onto a trap that was laid by Gumayushi. Because if Crocker paths towards the south, he might get picked off right by Carrier, by Owner. So he tries to path back, get away from the fight. Uh, and he would have been able to. He's a hacker in with a Yumi on top of him. And the first part of the fight shows why it's such a deadly combo. But then... Oh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just beautifully executed and uh, really showcasing, again, that the best of Nars, they need good control of when that Nar bar is ready, and Zayus had his ready at just the right time to get a big, like effectively two man, but you know, KL was there as well. So uh, <laughs> stun and win that team fight. Uh, two one feeling a lot better. Owner here on bot side again has Dragon's Rage available. Very sneaky as there's the final chapter. They are trying to bait this one in. It's Gumiushi's going to flash get himself out of the way. Onslaught comes on in as Croco gets rid of Gumiushi from this fight. Closes come down though, so the man advantage there for Liv Sandbox. The kickback not really going to do too much as Gumiushi's doing some alcove gaming that he really does not want to. Wants to get a kill back onto Croco, but will fail to do so as Liv Sandbox clean up a couple of kills with the man advantage bot lane. And what I'm loving here from Sandbox is try to keep this a high tempo game. Don't give T1 the opportunity. Keep fighting with Croco. Try to get that horse as fat as you possibly can. Yeah. Keep using the power of their Yumi. And even with T1 being the one that was setting up a trap there, it's Liv Sandbox that finds a little bit more of an edge. But overall, we still see that T1, when it comes to actual plates, when it comes to shoving, when it comes to CS and objectives, they are the ones that are firmly heading ahead. Here. Although, it's 30 minutes in and we haven't seen a single Drake yet. Yeah, no one actually looking towards the dragons whatsoever. Just fight. Yeah. Drakes are irrelevant if you can just fight each other. That's exactly right. As Croco is running forward for even more fighting, Chronicler. And he's just going to walk past Faker. The flash, flash comes in, but he waits for it. It doesn't really matter. He's just going to helicopter down the man in the helicopter. Very unfortunate. His machine working against him. And Ona just going to have to watch as they do exactly what they want. Okay, final spark comes on in, but... Not going to be doing too much damage here as the support locks. Can't really fault Faker for that one. I know. Like your the horse big, is just your, running too fast. <laughs> your Corky with Flash and Valkyrie available. And you just get run down. And, and there is a reason why this man on the horse was the rookie of the year, right? Lifts yeah. out his team, without a doubt, has suffered a lot. But he is a fed hacker in with a Yumi on top. That is not going to be something like a place like this is just not going to have the same impact because his health bar goes up immediately. T1 though, again, while all of this is happening, while these skills keep coming through, T1 is the one that actually picks up the plates, the objectives. Look at the health bars of all those T1 turrets. They're looking pristine, Atlas. Yeah. And Liv Sandbox base already battered, slowly getting taken down as first turret bot going to drop here further, growing that gold lead for T1. Yeah, this is the problem, right? You look at the gold score and you're like, wow, T1 have had a really stable and comfortable early game. And if you had a look at the gameplay, you're probably like, oh, no, maybe not. But it is just far better homework done around this map. The Rift Herald utilized fantastically well. And the fact that Carrier and Gumushi exist there on the bottom side is just providing so much. As Ona goes in onto Ice here, just caught in transition. Croco, he's booking it. Let's see where he is going to go. The Q is going to come through, and Owner is caught between a rock and a hard place and a horse. As Faker is there, and so he's going to be able to get some helicopter revenge against Croco. So I wonder which build Croco is going for as so Dove. Yeah, that's a great double body slam as immediately the Valkyrie does have to come through. Faker's out of the fight, but can they find any more is going to be the question. The answer is yes on T1 side. They couldn't kill the mid laner, and Gumiyushi mops it up. And here T1 using great, or really showcasing that, yes, the Sandbox, your skirmishes are scary, and uh, you found a couple of nice fights, but if we know that you're coming, if we have the time to actually set up, can't just run into us. There's bindings, there's traps, there's Zeus, who again plays a huge role as a deterrent there. But this time around, the Sandbox not actually able to find another one of those skirmishes. I'm glad we're getting this. 
This yep. doesn't feel very fair. <laughs> I'm still going. I'm still going. I'm still going. It was nicely played there by Crocker. Okay. Extra little shield, and uh, we did see Carrier making his way over. And while this starts out nicely as Dove, because he doesn't have the cost. Oh, the binding. Yeah. My carrier really, really saving that one. And the rest of the team, they knew this was happening, right? Like, they knew they were setting up for a possible engage. And everyone was there. Uh, so, if there was a cask, I think maybe they could have knocked back Whoa. and traded a little bit better. Do you think that's enough control wards in that brush? No. No need more. So you're going to need five. So that's the maximum. His owner taken down to about half health here. He's going to flash, get himself out of the way. Onslaught of Shadows does basically nothing, as that's a big Gnar onto three into the wall. Back goes Ona, and he's actually going to be able to get the kill onto Dove and make it out. Now, Carrier and Gumiyushi trying to lock down the remaining members and Closer. Not going to have anywhere to go. Kale as well is now just a cat by itself. And that is definitely not good news as T1 look to take down Shirley as well. And man, I don't know how this game has turned into such a snowball, but T1 have done it. It is the, the continuous reward of actually playing better around the wave state. Yes, in terms of skirmishes, and this is what we said coming into this game. Liv Sandbox can match up to T1 as we're going to look at a tragic fight that happens here. Look at the lack of coordination here between Dove and Croco. Oh, that is an no. onslaught of shadows being thrown into a target that was already knocked away by the explosive cask. And that is, I think, the biggest issue that Liv Sandbox is facing here, which is that the synergy just isn't quite there, right? And, and, and we do see these nice fights, we do see these skirmishes, but as mentioned repeatedly, T1s were the ones who basically permanently had to shove everywhere. T1s were the ones who build up CS leads over the course of the entire game. Zayus also picking up a call, right? All these little things started to snowball and snowball. And then, once T1 had actually hit their spikes, as we've seen now, and they are ready for Sandbox, and it's a straight up 5v5, and the situation kind of changes. Certainly does. Level advantage there for Zayus, almost 100% uh, of a level. And this Gnar is just way too huge. Sterics, Sterics Gauge complete, as well as the Divine Sunderer. And I just don't see where it gets better for Liv Sandbox, unless Dove and Croco get themselves actually coordinated. Owner's just going to safeguard his way out there. And you're not going to trample your way in on that one, Croco, unfortunately. <laughs> trample. <laughs> nice. Horse puns. Woohoo! Definitely the most fun about having uh, Hecarim in the game is Gumiyoshi. He's going to get proud. Otherwise, he's going to be okay. Dove moves on in, spots two of what were three control wards and eliminates one of them. And uh, Vision feeling very immovable there in that brush. His carrier going to get slowed down, going to have to flash. Self out of the way is Faker looking for some rockets here onto all five members of Live Sandbox. Isaias is going to take this turret. He does have the teleport available as well, so if T1 keep them interested, he's just going to get even more from this one. Faker makes his way back to the turret, though. And T1 are getting corralled as Liv Sandbox look for this Drake. Will even out the Drakes. Nice takes a bit of damage there from T1. And I think with Shirley, T1 will be able to grab themselves an inner turret, maybe one on the top side of the map as well in trade for this Drake, if that's what Liv Sandbox keep looking for. Is Oh my goodness, all, the, all of the long-range damage comes on in. And Ice is just out of this one. No real opportunities whatsoever. That's your one. While all this is happening, Zayus is completely fine just pushing in the top. So, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, Magana is about up, guys. So just don't fight right now. And as it's available. Yep. And they're going to get both. Uh, as I say that, the rest of the team and the cavalry is coming for Zayus. So he. This is, very not, this is not like cake and eat it too. This is cake and then deliver to cake factory as well. It's like, yes, you can have a cake, but here, also have the factory to make yourself cakes all the time, if you would like. Why not a bakery? Just too much. T1 taking everything. Why not a bakery instead of a factory? I'd rather have a bakery cake as opposed to a factory one. Yeah, I think I've maybe been to too many of those uh, cake like shops here in Korea that are oh, just yeah. boxes of cakes upon boxes of cakes. So there's, a lot, there's a lot of cakes uh, in this place, and they're not from bakeries necessarily. No, no. I... Uh, I understand your confusion. Yes, I apologize. It's, it's, okay. it's okay. Definitely a little colloquial. <laughs> um, I've been here too long, perhaps. Or not long enough. Yeah. I, I think either works. And we do see now T1 being very cognizant of the limits they need to play within, right? And uh, for this sandbox, be really hard as ice. Every time he tries to move up, there is someone ready. Both Zayus and Carrier, I think, having just a, a splendid game thus far. Um, with the amount of pressure they've been able to 
dish out. Yeah. And previously to that move there by T1, where they just very calmly said, we don't, we don't need to go for Drake. We can just shove forming a response from this sandbox. But with the knowledge, with the vision, with the setup, they're completely fine. The one thing that T1 needs to avoid at all costs, and what I expect, because thus far they've been doing that, is overextending and allowing Dolph to flank, right? Because if at any point there's a deep ward oh. or Croco gets into the back line. Yeah, Faker holding onto his flash though, oh, as no. they're gonna set themselves up. That is a fantastic gravity field as Faker will get taken down, and that is just a swift pick off. Faker not wanting to use the flash. Yeah. As here on the bottom side, Dub doing a bit of damage there to Zayas, but I don't think too much is gonna come of it. Oh my goodness, Zayas does so much damage on this Nah. And we'll have bigger form of Nah coming up pretty soon. I don't know why I didn't want to say Mega Nah there, but I didn't. It's one of those things. T1 just going to send the cavalry down. But uh, Dove is not here any longer. As I was saying, you need to respect. <laughs> um, you're in a really good spot, but you also have a lineup that is overall still very squishy. Yeah, Zeus and Owner are good off tanks. If Zeus actually has Magnar available, then he's going to be hard to focus down. But the rest of that team... Uh. This is not where Ice wants to be, as the Q is going to connect and Ona, yeah, shouldn't have too much trouble dealing with this. Flashes after him, gets the kick, Q's gonna land, and Ona will pick it up so, so easily. Faker fighting against Closer here, and right now Closer is winning out. Minion Wave uh, is what Faker's uh, really concerned about, though, as the rest of T1 are rotating up. And Closer, this is, you're gonna have to do some pretty uh, interesting shenanigans to get yourself out of this one. Just Killing Faker is definitely a decent move, as yes, the TP could also work. Ona doesn't have his kick. And he's just going to see whether he can get himself a kill. Instead, he flashes. Final Spark comes in and closes just dead. So there are a few things that could have happened, but they didn't. As Gumiushi now trying to throw out some autos onto the horse. The horse just canters away gloriously. And Liv Sandbox. Kind of what we were worried about as they get later and later into the game, starting to fall apart a little bit. People getting picked off left, right, not having the control they need. As, ah, uh, yeah, that, that that was an unfortunate Valkyrie, uh, followed by not flashing, uh, even though uh, they definitely shouldn't, uh, should have for Faker, and then Ona just... There's a lot of vision here, right? So you feel relatively safe as ice, but the reality of the situation is you're not. Three of your members are on bot side, and your mid laner is also in complete no man's land, trying to get the cheeky kill on Faker, and. Uh, the play on bot side didn't even work out. Zeus just looks at it and said, uh, okay, yep. and then sounded off and wouldn't really care about what happened. And now yeah. the gold lead is getting insurmountable. Yeah, yeah I was going to use that word yeah. as well. Um, it's one that certainly would apply to this game. That being said, you know, uh, we've seen 6,000 gold surmounted before. Sure, I'm allowed to say that. Nothing is insurmountable. Well, I mean... <laughs> You say, you say that after saying that it's almost in some well, almost, but nothing is truly. We are, we are the creators of our own reality, Atlas. If if we just believe enough and T1 uh, walk again, yeah, three, four men strong into a gravity field by closer, then anything is possible. That's true. And Crocker's a horse. He's definitely mountable. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> we, we've hit a quota of horse puns, Atlas. Come we on. Absolutely have not. Hecarim's in the game. It is definitely no holes barred. It's okay. Ona lands a Q, not wanting to go in onto the Hecarim, you would assume. Azeus off to the side. Half a Naba is halfway towards being able to engage, potentially. Faker off to the side, looking for some potential rockets over the top. Sproko dives forward, and T1 kind of getting corralled into a position that Live Sandbox want them. Mid control is at least there. The Mountain Drake is what T1 are looking for. Now the soul point will be available. Close it down to 50% health and Faker just, if he lands these rockets, it is danger zone as Zayas looks for his opportunity. Can't quite get a decent NAR position. His flash is available though. And Live Sandbox are respecting it. It's exactly how they need to play this. Wait out the NABA and then try, try again. The T1 move over towards this Drake and they should be able to take it with the position of Live Sandbox. It's just if they can take a Baron or something like that being the question. But with a Jin, I just yeah. don't think it's ever gonna work. The only champion that does decent damage is the Victor, right? The rest of them not going to bring you what you need is Croco. Didn't even know what he was looking for there. No. As uh, Gumiushi just wanders his way out, he's like, sorry. Never mind. Yep. Soul Point now goes over to T1. And it's more cakes and cake factories and eating it too and things like that. 
As uh, Faker looks to take down the Raptor camp. It's been a bit of a slower game here for Faker in this one, but the beauty of this T1 is that Faker isn't required to be the hard carry every single game as it has been in other years. Because as we saw, like, he gets killed in the mid lane, but the bottom lane is absolutely dominating. Zayus dies towards the top lane, but it does not matter. He's still able to outlane the situation and then perform in uh, the subsequent fight. There's just a lot of potential carries here on T1. You need to be aware of absolutely everyone. And Zayus now actually on a face check here just a little bit. Croco and Dove not wanting to even fight it. They're like, this guy is too strong. Crush comes out and the explosive cast comes on in. Owner looks for an opportunity as Dove is the target that they're looking for. Blast Cone gets Faker over there, and oh my god, the damage. Zayas gonna finish that one off. Onslaught of Shadows used defensively is the worst feeling for a Hecarim player. And T1 think this is their opportunity for the Baron, and look, I uh, I would agree with them. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the Sandbox, it is, at this point in the game, looking for weird angles, trying to catch people off guard, but T1, they are not foiled by such tactics. They stick to the goal. And the goal is an easy Baron, uh, making that goal lead even bigger and bigger. And we're starting to see some other mistakes, right? Closer going for a Shadow Flame second there. Now he's building towards Void, but with the limited lack, uh, amount of penetration that you have, and uh, some magic resist on the side of T1, not going to feel super good about that one. And then on the flips, especially with that mountain involved, right? And then T1 yeah. is now just going to be able to siege everywhere at the same time. I don't know if there's any flank that can help out Live Sandbox here. They don't have the wave clear. Yeah. Not necessary either, because the poke from T1 is devastating. Faker doesn't even have his Ludens yet. Do you know what's looming here, Chronicler? Gigantic wallets. Absolutely massive, massive wallets. As T1, I mean, I don't think itemization is even necessary. When you have one third of the items of your opposition, you're probably not going to do so well. Yes. And uh, it's sort of irrespective <laughs> of uh, what item choices have been uh, put down there. So a little bit of a shame as Croco thinks he's found Faker yet again. Goes for a little bit of a Valkyrie and then discovers he is really dead. And uh, he's just going to get picked off. A little bit unfortunate. Unfortunate situation, as you pointed out. Not the best game for Faker. It happens, but the beauty of the T1 roster is that it doesn't really matter uh, as Croco also showcasing again this Hacker and Yumi. I would not mind to see this combo again. I no, mean, I actually that, uh, think it's really cool. Yeah. But uh, this ain't it, right? Like, Oh, this is... No, I don't want to talk about this. That's why I'm yeah. talking about the Hacker and being a nice... In live, something nice that we up. might actually... Okay, no, it's, uh, uh, it's the horse in the Thunderdome, not exactly where he wants to be, and he's just going to get taken down. Carrier explodes on the back line, though. His closer is very scary. Gumiushi flashes into ice, and that's a target that he actually wants to try and fight. Not going to be able to do so, though, as Zayas is the one tidying up. Owner's here as well. No one to safeguard, though, and he is going to... Oh, God, the boulder toss is just too much damage. And no now one it is stops Owner the and Zayas looking for this opportunity. His closer's like, oh, God. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do here, but... Doesn't have a kick, it doesn't actually matter. He's got a Q, and that is going to complete the ace. A messy fight for T1, but as we mentioned, the state of the wallets is more uh, what's doing the talking. When inhibitors are down, messy fights, as long as they are relatively even, are good enough. You know, you'll, you'll take it. Five. I think Faker was oh, not Oh, no, there Faker was not there time. at all. Yeah. No, because um, what I assume happened is, uh, as we can see here, uh, again, like I think mechanically nicely started off there. Uh, carry out, unfortunately, not able to get quite as much done. But now you're a Hecarim stuck in a pit without your ultimate. And it's really closer that, that really saves it and is able to do so much damage here. Kael with the very unfortunate pathing away from the rest of his team, which as Yumi is very much a death sentence, even more than for the usual sports. Zeus says no one gets away from the boulder. Yeah. And Out now to the face. Yeah. It's not even a boulder. That was the factory right there. Yeah, and he threw the fact the cake. They didn't even need the cake factory. They've eaten so much cake they don't want any. And it's just Zayas throwing the factory all over the place. Oh my goodness. To have that much cake. What would it and feel like? Too. It's beautiful. So uh tank a gold and there's a Drake, but we can also fight in jungle. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great idea. As uh 10 seconds until uh, the Mountain Soul is available for T1, and they just say, Live Sandbox, I'm sorry. You're just not going to come with us. Um, and I think they're going to have to oblige. Zayas throws out the ult for fun. It's on basically no cooldown, though. 
Asbury, and this is the binding. Croco getting taken down relatively low. It is going to be the Mountain Soul, but can Luke Sandbox find themselves a hero fight? Closer, getting closed in on here. Gravity Field is decent. Good light binding, but no follow up. Croco's able to trot his way out. Q doesn't connect. Jonas Strong thought might, that one might happen, as there it is, the kickback. On to Closer, and they do manage to secure it. Oh my goodness, they can't even get the kill onto Ona here as Faker once again is going to fall down. Dove up towards the top side, but just too weak to make his way out. Wanted to get the snipe onto Carrier, but the shields are just too big. And we've just got a teleport from Zayas. He's like, yeah, nah, kind of finished with this game. And he's going to look to take down these Nexus turrets. The rest of Liv Sandbox are scattered to the wind. And Zayas now with a few more autos will be able to do it. Throws a house around as Croco has managed to make it back. And they haven't even done any damage to Zayas yet. Can he actually get the work done as there's a good stun into the wall. Ice will get taken down as Gumiushi does so much work. If he puts a couple of autos into this Nexus, it's game over. But we're going to see if we can get a couple of kills before that one happens. Gumiushi doesn't want to really fight a fountain laser, but it seems like the only one that can do as much damage as him. And he'll settle for the Nexus. T1. Managed to take down Live Sandbox in the end. Individually, we saw some issues left and right by T1, and I think a valiant effort uh, that was given here by Live Sandbox, but I never really got the feeling that they were close to actually breaking T1. No, um, it was that feeling of inevitability that uh, has happened with uh, T1 and SKT oh, yeah. in the past, right? It's like, yes, we managed to get, like, the the, the, uh, the memory of Dumbledore comes back, you know? <laughs> Getting that kill for First Blood onto Faker with his Janna, and then the entire, like, that kill is irrelevant. And actually, they kill Faker a whole bunch of times this game. It's like, congrats. Still 10k gold down. Zayas is absolutely gigantic, and Gumiushi is just pumping out the damage. It uh, just doesn't, it's not that relevant, honestly. It doesn't matter. No. Yeah. And uh, full of sandbox, this is, I think, the perfect game for it. You learn a lot from this, right? Because you can go and what worked, what didn't work. For the Yumi Hakarim, was a great, great solution to give Croco more agency, but then the Jin got punished so hard in terms yeah. of laning phase. I think T1 won in every lane but mid. And then when it came to the later stages, uh, they were just so on point. And I, I mean, Zeus's game, like, I, I can't, I, yeah. I can't talk enough about it. Because he did, like, doing the most damage on his team as Nah of all champions. Yeah. When there was a fat Caitlyn, in of itself is insane, but, like, his positioning, the way he played around his Nah boss, his he ultimates. Saved, he honestly saved the game yeah. in a lot of ways. Like, that yeah. fight around the Rift Herald, if it had have gone catastrophically bad for T1, then it might have been that, uh, you know, that, yeah, that you're indicating to it, but that slight little gold advantage that Live Sandbox managed to pick up just before it went down, that could have been an extension of their gold lead, right? But no. Zayas was there, you had the Nabar exactly where he needed it, got that double stun, theoretically a triple stun, because a cat without <laughs> anyone to ride is a very sad cat indeed. And Live Sandbox back to the drawing board. I like the Hecarim. See whether we see it in uh, game number two, but that'll do it for this game. We'll see you after the break for the Analyst Carpet Space.
오케이 나나나 차가 나, 나 빨라 이거 더블 줄게 못 맞겠다 진짜 없어서 쌍타 깨긴 했어 <웃음> 우리 미드에 할듯 어, 끝낼만해 끝낼만해? 어, 어. 나도 아, 할만해 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 나도 절대 못 잡아 깨틀 음. 쌈빠도 될때 깨틀 지켜 깨틀 어, 깨틀 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 지켜 딘 볼게 딘 도플이야 어굿딘 잡았다 오나 어. 끝내자 왜 싸우자 그래 나 만년설이 아 다시 했어 아유 아왜 이렇게 했는데 sky falls and the sun turns black when the earth holds then don't look back hold me closer can you feel my heart we can conquer and win back all the tide is changing floods are We run on the edge and across the flames. The world we knew is not the same. Feel your soul with your desire. Walk through the fire. Leave this place and watch it burn. Standing tall now, your feet are on the ground. You fought your demons, nothing breaks you down. The tide is changing, floods are coming clear to see. The page is turning, can you feel this energy? Light breaks through the darkness, they are. So when we rise, we run on the edge and across the flames. The world we knew is not the same. Feel your soul, feel your desire. Walk through the fire. Leave this place and watch it burn. Let the king and queen return. See the sun so bright and high. We walk through the fire.
Welcome everybody to the Analyst Chairs and Collaborative Carpet Space. We are here. It is me, Valdez, with Wolf. And we're going to break down that first game, a relatively straightforward game. I thought that T1 um, it took them a little bit long. You know, they ran into a couple of horses here and there, but eventually they got to the win. So definitely a little bit of horsing around uh, in this first game, but T1 were able to get Caitlin and Corky in the first section of the draft, which felt Kind of like a big blunder there by Liv Sandbox. They banned the Aphelios early and the Karma on blue side. Again, somewhat puzzling start to the draft. But then, you know, Faker's Quirky got solo killed early. It was a pretty good lead for Liv Sandbox in the beginning of the game. And it started to feel like T1 were going to fall too far behind until Zeus Nar showed up and ruined the party. And Owner had a, a fantastic game on the Lee Sin, of course, as well. Yeah, you know, we were looking at the Lee Sin in the pick ban, and he had some other options, um, but, you know, we weren't super happy with it at the time. It was okay, though, because Owner was able to get it. Um, definitely, there's a lot of Nar and Zeus to talk about here, as you guys did. Yeah, and, and we'll talk about it, you know, as, as we get into the highlights yeah. and stuff. Like, it's it's so impressive what he's been able to do on this champion so early in his career. He's 4-1 and one on the champion so far, and has a 6.0 KDA as well. So, I mean, this is, is pretty insane considering he has played so few games. Like, he's really now only being the starter for T1 for the first time, and... We saw him play it in, to great fame early on in his debut game and played it a few times when he was very rarely subbed in over Kana. You can see behind us here, uh, we got a little- Nar and uh, over there Zeus. It's really hard to tell the difference between them <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah. With how iconic he has been on the champion. And this is the kind of hype that we had for Zeus leading into this season because of his Nar in the past. They give him this pick once more and he's really killing it. Yeah, he really is, and uh, we are going to take a look at our first highlight and kind of break down some of what he was able to pull off on this pick. This is the first, the first yeah. yeah, this is the first Rift Herald fight, and, you know, unfortunately for Liv Sandbox, it was very forced for them. They had a decent lead, so they felt like, okay, we can pull this off. They end up getting the first kill here onto the Caitlyn, but are way overextended, and Zayas is able to lock them all down so nobody can retreat. So the fight was already won, but Zayas locked the door so they could actually get three more kills here. And this was the, the first doorway for T1 back into the game. They actually were massively behind, I think almost 2K gold or maybe even a little bit above right before this fight. Then they surged ahead with all those kills. Yeah, and the thing is, is the Rift Herald was already taken. We saw yesterday uh, both Damwon Kia and Gen G, when they weren't in a position to fight over that Rift Herald, they just said, eh, take it. You know, we'll get plates, we'll get other stuff. But uh, a lot of the times, you know, LCK teams, they definitely, and not just LCK, but a lot of teams in high level League of Legends, they go back to, we must fight over this Rift Herald, but it was already gone, right? I mean, you already gave up that objective and you went into a choke point against the NAR and they got rightly punished. Yeah, Zayas again just showcasing how he can manage that bar is going to lock the door there. And T1 did have really good team fighting in this game. There were some big issues in terms of Faker's positioning when he was in the lane. It was a, one of his weaker games so far this season. Um, and it almost gave the opportunity to Closer to actually help Sandbox win the game. They weren't able to do it though in the end. Yeah, you know, everybody has off days, uh, even the best of us, so let that be motivational for you guys. We do have the second highlight ready to go, and it is the second Rift Herald fight. As you can see, it starts off pretty well for Liv Sandbox as well. Yeah, you can see, like, Croco is doing so much work with Closer here, and they're able to do a ton of damage to Owner, but Zayas just re-engages, and the rest of the team is so far away. Ice was actually pushed away on the bottom side of the map, so couldn't actually rejoin this fight. It was very, very low. And Liv Sandbox were really desperate to try to fish for any sort of kill they could get with this really strong Victor, who had a pretty massive gold lead at that stage. Almost picked Owner off, but just going one step over the line, boom, another big Gnar coming through there from Zayas. And I mean, I think you guys could tell where our POG minds are going right now for this, <laughs> this first game in the series. Yeah. I think everyone you know who drove the, the bus in this one. Yeah. I mean, look, Owner had a great game too, to be honest, True. on the least end. Some really nice kicks there, but it was really owner who turned, or rather Zayas to turn those major fights around. Yeah, and uh, we do have the POG ready to go, so we can reveal that right now and let you know who it is. It will be Zeus. Uh, no surprise here, 811 damage per minute on Nar. He out a Corky by a massive margin. I, I, Caitlyn. Yeah, and he, he out-damaged a Caitlyn too, but like, 
It, this is a quirky comp, right? And, and yes, Faker didn't have the greatest game and did build really defensively and, and struggled to do a lot of damage in these fights. But like this Nar, basically right now in the matchup into Gragas, because of how many Nars passive works, is just bullying a lot. We're seeing Nar really start to take off with some of our top teams because you and I, I think we're some of the biggest critics of Nar early on in the spring season because it's so difficult to execute these team fights. But we're starting to see top teams like Genji yesterday, T1 here again today, proving that with the right player, with the right amount of coordination, it absolutely can be pulled off. Yeah, definitely can. Uh, as you pointed out, Owner had a fantastic game. So many mechanical outplays, so many catches where you wouldn't necessarily find them. So shout out to him as well. We're going to take a look at uh, exactly how many votes there were. Yep, three votes for owner and one vote uh, for carry. The carry a vote, yeah, I you know, I, I, I thought he had some really nice ults that game. I actually helped secure a lot of kills. Yeah, uh, basically Ice didn't get to play the game because he was just poked out the entire game, which is what we saw in one of those uh, highlights. But uh, that's going to do it for this segment, guys. We'll to pass it back over to Atlas and Chronicler for the cast. Thank you very much, gentlemen, on the beautiful analyst chairs uh, that are also on top of that absolutely glorious analytical rug. Great stuff. Um, and yes, uh, Zayus had a great game. I really like that Jonah Strong was just being a bit of a savant with his uh, carrier pick. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because carrier also had a godly game. He was yeah. just very, very good. I think that it was uh, the sandwich that really uh, held T1 together was the top lane and the support position for that one. Um, but I think it's also really cool that we came full circle. Uh, Zayas had his debut game where he completely decimated on the Nah, and then comes back and does the same thing again right now. Can't believe that you go for a sandwich analogy and not one about cake. When that was that was the feat. No, 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 that was last game. That was last game. We're sandwiches today. It's not, uh, no, sand, now it's sandwiches now. It's, now. Yeah, we've sandwiches moved on. From here now. Yeah. Very well, very dessert well. Dessert first. <laughs> <laughs> I am the dessert first kind of person, honestly. I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. As going into the second game, I think that the Hacker and Yumi, that was great from the sandbox. Uh, the Jin Yumi into Caitlyn uh, Luck, definitely not it. And I hope to see a switch up from that and maybe try and uh, make sure that you don't play into one of the most aggressive punitive lanes that exists currently within League of Legends. Yeah. Uh, and that might make your game a little bit easier. Will you get a macro? Probably still the case, uh, but at least you won't be playing from such a Major deficit right from the get-go. And for the sandbox, no matter how you shake it, this is always going to be a hard one. I would always also like to see T1 actually ban the Yumi to make sure that we don't get a similar situation uh, where Croco can still do his best to try and carry. Yeah, exactly right. Actually, I'd like the bans to remain the same and then Caitlyn just be first pick, right? Like, that is the perfect way to go about it. Because then you don't need to... I, I don't think that the Yumi is that strong in the hands of T1, where if you get Caitlyn Lux, you're not just gonna be able to do the same thing that they did, right? That lane is just very, very powerful, as it is gonna remain the same on the side of T1, but instead of the Aphelios, the Caitlyn is gonna be taken away. So Liv Sandbox could go for the uh, the Yumi once again, but you run into the same issue where Gumushi gets arguably his best champion in the Aphelios. We'll see whether that works out. So it will be Ice on it instead. Um, ice, of course, uh, always reminds me of Vanilla Ice or Ice Ice Baby, and it's kind of fitting that uh, that song samples Under Pressure, because he absolutely was in the last game, and I believe will be now on such a carry. I've wanted to get that one out for a really I, long I time. I could feel that you that you had to get that off your chest, and I'm happy you did. I apologize, everyone, who uh, didn't like it, but uh, it, it's done now, and so we can move It's on. over. We can, we can move past it. like the pick away here from The Fresh, yeah, Thresh Jinx coming in from T1, and I like uh, prioritizing the Thresh instead. Yeah, agreed. Nautilus is a decent answer, of course, does well into the Thresh, doesn't provide as much peel as you might want with an Aphelios. Uh, but picking a Lulu into something of what T1 already has, I don't think is going to feel particularly good. And... Uh, Do you know who else is not feeling particularly good? Faker, he has to play another game on Corky. He's not psyched well. about it. At least he's not playing into Hecarim Yumi this time around. Might still be Hecarim, but at least there's no cat. I mean, the, I, they could just put Nautilus mid in the top lane. Hey, Nautilus's jungle clear was buffed at some point, which didn't didn't really <laughs> impact anything. <laughs> uh, there we go. Remember Nautilus jungle. I, I remember Leona jungle, man. Like, don't worry, I remember all of it. 
I remember yes. Lulu Jungle. Thankfully, we had Spirit here in the LCK <laughs> that taught you that literally every uh, champion is a jungler. Sky's the limit, Absolutely. as long as you want it enough. As there is the Jinx, no surprises there. I think that what Liv Sandbox have drafted so far is a composition that if you fall behind into the range, the scaling that T1 has is going to get decimated. I like it that way. I think that if you get into a late game scenario, we've already established that you're not going to win. So you might as well try and get as much done as possible early. Some early uh, jungler banawains, I think, would be good here from T1. Take away the Jarvan as well. Although, again, last time around it was even better. But uh, I, I still wouldn't be too afraid considering that you have a fresh here, which mitigates a lot of what the Jarvan can provide. Yep. Um, I do want to talk about Silas just for a little bit. We've seen Silas actually do very well into the Corky. And uh, Closer had a great game last time around, all things considered, right? Uh, things kind of fell apart ab around him, but managed to get that solo kill in lane and uh, was having a pretty good time. Um, so we've seen this before and it did work out. So excited to see it. Uh, the, uh, like you were saying, Jarvan going to be taken away here by Liv Sandbox. I think uh, Xin Zhao yeah. remains on the ban list. So the big three have already been taken off the board. Diego, maybe? I personally would like a... Ooh, interesting. Because I, I was wondering, with the Silas pickup, a possible Gnar answer from Zeus has been kind of mitigated because you don't generally want to pick Gnar into, into Silas. You can, yeah. but uh, we know that that is a, a really big risk that you're taking, meaning that T1 is now, I think, going to pick up the Gragas here if, uh, if it is not banned, which it is not. It's the Poppy again coming through here. So if they don't pick up the Gragas here, then I think you can guarantee that that is going to be the pickup here for Liv Sandbox, picking a Gnar into Silas. It's not going to feel very well, even with the matchup being as good as it is. And we're also going to see what is Croco going to play this time around. Really, always the player I'm going to have my eye on when it yeah. comes to the sandbox. Yeah, he's uh, just the one that you want to be Ooh. checking out. Gwen being considered now as well. So looking okay. for some AD damage from the jungle, from Croco. Um, Gwen certainly has, uh, has been performing well. Hasn't picked up a lot of wins so far this season, but we've seen exactly why she's strong in a lot of instances as the Hecarim being considered once again. Less powerful without the Yumi, but still will be another threat and a lot of AoE potential as far as CC is concerned from Live Sandbox if it is locked in. Croco having a bit of a conversation about it. And I actually, I don't hate it, but it isn't going to happen. So it's a bit sad. Trundle going to come through instead. I do really like the Trundle here though. Uh, really good into well, uh, basically anyone except the Corky thus far. That does mean that the Gragas is just uh, up and available, and I think you're gonna be comfortable with that. This I would love, think that that uh, kind of fixes the only issue that you might have with this T1 composition, and then your only risk becomes getting bullied a little bit too much early, and... I actually, I, I kind of don't like the Orn just because Subjugate has one really good target if you pick Orn, right? But if you play 10 Gragas, which I assume is gonna be the case, then... Nah, you just play full AP Gragas. Uh, he might. He might. I uh, personally think that, considering what they're playing into uh, and, and what they have, I think the Gragas is a, is a nice pickup and that you would still want to go tank regardless. Yeah. Um, but this is this lift sandbox, right? Like, Kroko is going to try and snowball either mid or bot side, play as aggressively as he can there while Gumayushi and Fake are trying to scale up. And then if that doesn't work, if Ona finds counter ganks, uh, then the game is over very, very quickly. Yeah. I actually think this is a much more balanced draft, though, uh, for Liv Sandbox to try and deal with. I thought, looking at the last one, T1 having such an incredible advantage in the bottom lane yeah. is just a recipe for disaster and a lot of cake analogies. Um, this time around, a very different story. Closer on a great pick into his counterpart, um, as well as Croco being able to be there to uh, shred through these tanks and allow Dove to really get the work done. Plus a lot of extra CC available there on the bottom side without a Caitlyn uh, that they have to deal with. Certainly does uh, make me feel a little bit better. However, this is still T1. They still have the Corky, which even though Faker had a bit of a rough time in the last game, he will still be Corky. And uh, Jinx as well is going to be able to carry extremely effectively in the later stages of the game. It's just that Zayas not going to be as powerful uh, as he was on his Nar last time. And we'll see whether the Viego can actually get off the ground here for him. And here we are under the rift for game number two. T1 being able to stream ahead. If they win this, then they are undefeated for the first two weeks. And Liv Sandbox wanting to get to a 2-2 scoreline, which 
pretty respectable, to be honest. There are some other teams that did a lot of winning last year that are also on a 2-2 record. So the Sandbox try, uh, trying to uh, fight their way back. And for Sandbox, I think any win that you can get is one that you're going to be happy with, even if you don't win the actual series. Uh, and just try to get as much as you can in terms of uh, scores might help you down the line. I think that when it comes to playoffs, the Sandbox is not a team that we're all going to think of. But with other teams like DRX, like Chrome Freaks Sandbox. kind of faltering, where I think our expectations for a lot of us were a little bit higher, that might create a vacuum where a Live Sandbox or Hanwha Life, which, sure, not at the top of our list, but yep. we also see moments of what could be with these teams. However, in this, uh, this game, uh, I think Live Sandbox definitely going to have to try and get a lead. Can be on closer, can be a nice, can be in terms of objectives. But if you let the T1 composition 3D scale, they will have everything they need in a mid to late game scenario. They can poke, they can engage, they can skirmish really well with the Viego, uh, they can set up picks. And if you don't kill any of the three between Owner, Faker, and Genushi, they will uh, yeah. demolish you pretty, pretty quickly once uh, two free item spikes are hit. Uh, the thing that I do really like about Live Sandbox is their ability to side lane. I think that Gwen Silas is pretty powerful. Um, if you manage to get some control and allow that to uh, be a thing that happens. Like you were talking about, if uh, T1 get any sort of advantages, it's pretty impossible for Live Sandbox. But they do have Disengage in, uh, in the Trundle as well, as far as the 3 is concerned. And if Dove has a game like this, right, where he's able to put on a lot of pressure and actually get powerful as the Gwen, then it will be very, very strong as Carrier. Going to get uh, Dredge Line, but is able to play mm. Kale, and actually, as you could see, is uh, pretty happy to do so. It's a 100% win rate here for Gumiji. Okay, it's pretty good. And Jinx, uh, as we learnt, we kind of knew this in week one. Our LCK teams refused to really go towards it, but now we're seeing a lot more Jinx, and she does do quite well into the Aphelios. Honestly believe that Aphelios should not be a first priority pick or a high level ban unless you're playing into T1 or Dom1. Like that's the only situation. Yeah, Because no, Dog Dom and Aphelios, or Dog Dom and, uh, or Gumiushi and Aphelios, one of the two, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I, you don't want to play against that. I respect it. I understand. Fine, we can make that not happen. Uh, but for any other team, we still see this champion be so high in priority when I'm really glad it's getting punished more and more by the Jinx. Jinx Fresh is a perfectly acceptable response. Uh, a lane that, you know, needs some time, but it's not like it's that weak. It's very safe. Uh, it has decent setup between the Chompers and everything that Fresh provides. So, yeah, honestly, no reason not to go for it. Um, but they are playing ST1, so it's uh, an unfortunate scenario. Yeah, exactly. You kind of want to pick it away as well. Is Dove going to uh, get barreled and booped a little bit here by Santa Gragas? But we're going to see Dove scale into this matchup, right? And so Zay is going to have an okay time in the uh, early stages. I got the hiccups yeah. just a little bit, um, so you'll have to bear with me there. As those things. Yeah. As, uh, okay, Zay has another drink. Yeah. Um, when you're trading very, very short with a Gragas like this, it's uh, not good because he has Grasp and he has damage mitigation. Uh, he has a very oppressive trading pattern where he can unload all his cooldowns on you right between. His empowered order, his E, and then a Q, and then he can saunter off. Um, and Dove not really at the point in the game yet where you can look for reliably longer fights, because that's where the Gwen yeah. is really going to win out, especially post Rift uh, Rith Maker, at which point Zeus is just going to be relegated to a wave clear and uh, kind of hang in their duty, which is also perfectly fine. Or as winning team fights duty as well, just uh, yeah. leave the lane and make things work elsewhere. He is Baker here having a better time? in the mid lane, which is definitely good news. Closer, of course, not going to have the same range as he did on his Victor. Uh, and so he's just going to be dealing with many waves for a lot of this early stage of the game. So now going to get spotted here. And I wonder where we're going to see the first uh, jungle attention being put. Closer also not going for the teleport here, meaning that any potential side laning in a 1v1 scenario later in the game really going to be new to more so looking towards that 1-4 with just Dove yeah. somewhere off. Um, but, and this is what I want to see, it's good for Roams, right? KL making his way towards mid, yes. Croco looking for owner, also perfectly fine. Getting closer ahead, I think, is essential, especially considering the extra offensive power that you have in this might be a perfect way yeah, Croco, gonna wander in. Owner gets to the brush in time as he looks to try and clear out 
A little ward there. Rocco gonna do the same thing as uh, both of these control wards should be taken down. Kale wandering through the enemy jungle. And Croco is going to make sure he secures these popcorn chickens and does so pretty comfortably. Bit of denial, and I really like it. Liv Sandbox staying very even with T1 at this stage, while Vega wins out on a nice trade there. Trigger Vision makes his way back to lane. Closer picks up some rockets. Throw them away towards Vega. That's okay. Oh, man. See, it does work out quite well. You know, you get yourself uh, some of your own rockets, and things are great, as Closer does, of course, have the Kingslayer available. It's a good hook from Carrier, though. So he decides to go in. Flash comes out. Ignite is there, and it's ticking on to Carrier as well. Has to flash to escape the final rocket there. A lot of summoners traded. There's another battle here towards the top side of the map. Dove, not quite as immune as he would like to be. However, wins out on the trade very nicely against Zeus. Ooh, and that was an unexpected amount of damage from Closer uh, because Kyle uh, not actually able to get the hook off there, right? Carry as posturing and Kyle then hooking a minion trying to get uh, I, I'm not sure if he didn't see the minion or if he was trying to just get as close as possible to land an auto. We'd have to check the replay for that. But I think Carrier not quite expecting as much damage coming out there as it did. Ghost only available for Dove. No flash, no instant movement, but oh, it will get spotted, so he should still be fine. Yeah. Uh, vision just going to be cleared out, so maybe Dove has to play a little bit more defensively. As we can see, much better news for this sandbox. No passive losing uh, happening at this particular stage. We do have only under a minute before the Rift Herald is available. That is going to be where Zeus is going to find a lot of his power. Dove not going to be able to go back just yet. Has to deal with these minions first. And the Gragas fresh off a shop, ready for the Rift Herald, is definitely exactly the way you want him. And that is going to mean tempo lead here. Really nicely done, right? Like just very cleanly textbook play from T1. Owner helping out, meaning you can completely safely shove in that wave. Now Dove is going to shove in the next one, but has to back. And that should mean that there's an opportunity. However, Faker, a little low on mana. Kumiyushi also backing just now. So not sure whether T1 have actually created a window for themselves here where they can go for an uncontested Herald. And meanwhile, I, as Liv Sandbox, I think you're perfectly happy not doing anything because you do have a Thalios. One of the champions that, when left alone with a turret, yeah. can shred through it very, very quickly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, owner here, just going to help hold this lane for Faker. We'll be able to do so, Croco taking his red buff, and both of our junglers will then be able to path up towards that top side and check on this Rift Herald. Some pings going out here from T1, and they want to be able to grab this one as Faker's picked up the package. And T1 do have a lot of extra power here um, around the Rift Herald for now. So, now we're going to start it up. Let's see. The rocket going to clear out that mid wave. So, mid control, package acquired, fresh shop for the Gragas. As fake. Okay, going to get hooked. Wow, that was some range and some hitbox from the dredge line. As now we're going to go for a 50 50. Owner locks it down. As now Zayas is in trouble running away from this one. Super Mega Death Rocket comes down as Dove is just going to get that knee to work through. And Owner comes down. Oh, not able to get the eye. Unfortunate. Liv Sandbox, actually, as that happens, will be able to win, on that, win out on this moment by a large margin. They'll pick themselves up a kill and deny. We have a crucial eye of the Herald. No Shelly in this party. Also putting ahead Dove. And in a scenario where you're looking to at least have the opportunity to put this Gwen in a side lane. She picks up a plate. She shoves an entire wave into the turret. Zayu's getting put further behind. Whoa. Okay. Flashes and flashes. Okay, Cal. I see you. That's some aggression right there. I like it. Zayu's going to move it back up towards oh. this top side. But that was like basically a whole wave yeah. uh, that he missed out on. Really bad news, and now Dove is in a very great spot. And remember, we have to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the game. Live Sandbox need this for their composition to they remain do. in control. And the key thing here, of course, is that yes, Faker survives. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Kind of us right there. Uh, Faker survives, but one of the key things that makes them, I think, opt into the fight here is that they have a Corky with package. Right, that is an incredibly, incredibly strong tool that you can use to split the fight, that does an insane amount of damage. Instead, that has to be used defensively. And I think Zay is also not really quite on the same page as he was looking a lot more aggressively for that fight, because I'm pretty sure T1 was like, we can do this. We, we have the tools, we have the technology, we can make it work, unfortunately for them. Not enough, it's a small lead. And as you pointed out, 
Uh, we have already established that I think Glyph Sandbox are the ones that, if not a hand in gold, at the very least need to be had in like control of the map. Yeah, couple, tempo couple definitely needs to be there. Yeah. And I think for a team like Glyph Sandbox, that requires being ahead in gold as well, right? Because we know that T1 managed to find macro advantages, sort of what feels like out of thin air. And so I think Live Sandbox might need just a little bit more of an edge. Uh, so we have guarantee they have a lead. Closer here in this mid lane as these corky rockets seemingly all the time. And Silas is so far working out very well. Does have one assist to his name, only behind by under 10 CS, which has a melee versus strength matchup you can be pretty happy with. He's body slam there on to Dove, but He's got the leeching Leah. He will uh, be able to Ooh. heal himself back up again as we've got a bit of a lane swap, yeah. And I don't know if uh, Lift Sun looks really ready for this. Kyle is on the uh, top half of the map and it might have some suggestion. Oh, the hook barely going to miss. And by barely, I mean actually quite a decent miss, but that's the playback and Dove is still dead. Gumiushi throws out the Super Mega Death Rocket and Zayas stays alive. And so the beginning of this lane swap working out very well. Trades of rockets here as salvos go backwards and forth, but here on the top side is where it's all about. Dredgeline going to connect once again. Kale's just landing amazing ones, but it won't matter too much. A couple of plates to go down here as T1, we mentioned these macro plays, and that's 400 gold they put into the bank. Teleport down towards the bottom side. Zeus is going to pick up all of this uh, golden experience under this turret. What it also does, which is uh, it, it kind of disallows what would usually happen, which is Lift Sandbox going for a second Drake. Because I think that second Drake actually uh, is a really nice way for Sandbox to get more of the aforementioned control, right? Get into a better position as they move into the later stage of the game where they're going to be a bit more reliant on T1 uh, making a move on them when they don't necessarily want to do so, but because both Kyle and Croco were forced to respond uh, towards that topside play, it's not really an opportunity here, and that is a very laid back. Uh, with Dov having bot, now Croco is going to have to catch the wave. I don't, I don't think he really can, even with Kyle on his way, and yeah. this happened last time as well, right? T1 is just so relentless in playing for plates, and the sandbox is not responding well. This is the problem, and you saw there towards the bottom side, right? Zeus was really struggling under that turret, taking a lot of damage, missing a lot of CS, but as you saw, Duff wasn't farming at all. He wasn't anywhere near any lane. So it's it's absolutely fine, and even though it might look like a bit of a worrying time, it is absolutely not. Faker picks up yet another package. Bit of a delivery man here at the moment, and it is going to be Ona that secures the Hextech Drake. So it is just everything going down, and it's kind of what we were warning everyone about earlier on because T1 have now ah. turned this into a thousand gold lead without really doing too much as it's going to be Chemtech Drake. It's a little bit of a shame. The great uh, equalizer. Spake is going to have to use another package oh, defensively, so but that's all right. He was uh, a little bit overextended and is able to do so because of that. Well, this is this is what the people of Zone want. Atlas is the great equalizer. If yeah. you are ahead, no longer will you be ahead because uh, everyone from Live Sandbox assumed uh, behind from uh, from henceforth um, will be doing more damage when they are in the toxic zones whoever has more health uh, is going to take a little bit more as the camouflage is you know also not great We've, yeah uh, we, and we also have to talk about, about we, we need to talk a, a bit of, a bit more about the state of the poros as well hopefully that um, that poro safety account is going to come out because yet another chemtech soul is a bit of a worry these stack up and uh, as we do that, Runeterra gets a little bit hotter every year. And I don't think we need to it, tell you more about it. In the name of progress, you know, um, yeah, I, Cam Tech Tech is being, being used. And, and we need to think about the poros. You know, that there's been uh, worrying reports on the migration patterns. And yeah. it's important that we act, but we still have the opportunity here on Runeterra. Exactly. Exactly. Dove going to get slowed down here as Zeus with his uh, Cam Tank. Is going to be all right. Chem tank in the chem tech rift is uh, just a lot of chem stuff going on, and it is a little bit confusing. But I'll hopefully be able to stay on top of it this game. As Zeus Santa Claus just uh, dealing with these minions quite nicely. And yeah, so as the dust settles, it's not exactly a thousand gold lead, but T1 managed to get themselves a Drake. We've got three minutes until the next one, and honestly, as far as scaling is concerned, we've mentioned it before. If Live Sandbox plays side lanes effectively, yes, they can scale well. Um, however, just for team fighting and front to back and range and things like this, T1 are in a brilliant spot as the game goes on. 
Yeah, it's just the ease of execution, right? Let's yeah. unbox, I think, uh, if their opponent makes a lot of mistakes, their compass is, is, is very, very good. But I think you can snowball really easily off of a single pick. Uh, you have a lot of punishing power between the Nautilus and the Silas. Like, you can easily isolate, uh, isolate a single target and blow them up. I don't think T1 are really going to run into that. I actually think that the Camtech uh, Rift unironically is a really great boon to Sandbox because it's going to really, really make it a lot harder for T1 to maintain a tight grip, a lot of yeah. control uh, of the entirety of the map. As Dove sees and says, yeah. oh no, 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 no. That's a lot of no red silhouettes you. there in the brush. And he's like, mm, no, 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 no. <laughs> and a good call as well. Turns out. I don't want that. Yeah. Closer is, could potentially be a saving grace, as you can see, still uh, even when it comes to the CS and things like this. Everfrost is now done, so a bunch more CC as he gets on the chase. And Ice managing to find that Calibrum Q. Feels pretty good. I believe it's called a Moonshot. Is that called Moonshot? I don't know the ability names of all of the different guns, Qs, unfortunately. Shameful, Adler. Yeah, I haven't put in the Shameful. Time. Um, there was a time where I actually just refused to learn what any of the gun names were, um, just because the fellows just had too much stuff to remember. Thankfully, I got those down. It's just the uh, the different ability names of all the different cues of all the different guns, just a bit tough. Thankfully, that's turret, which isn't named turret, but we should get a better name for the Aphelios turret, I think. Uh, like, we don't, it feels like one of those things where we should have an endearing LCK name for it as Faker. Yeah, might uh, be in trouble here, but no. Able to Valkyrie between the uh, <laughs> wall and the pillar. Faker's like, not playing Hecarim now, <laughs> are you? Huh? Huh? Feels, I'm safe. Look at me. Feels a lot better. That being said, it will be pretty frustrating if he gets, like, interrupted out of a Valkyrie with a oh, pillar yeah. and he's like, ah, curses. As Kale, yeah, that was not the dredge line you wanted to take. It's great body slam as the CC is just everywhere. Super Mega Death Rocket might have been overkill, but it's still going to get the kill as Croco with the subjugate there. It's the package! This one was used offensively! And Ona picks that one up as he's transforming into absolutely everyone. That's a pillar that will guarantee the zap, but I have a feeling that Live Sandbox might be okay underneath this turret, but the turret may not be as much. And 15 seconds to the Chemtech Drake. T1 can pick that one up. Oh, Much dear. more control here. Is, oh, I don't think you need to go for this T1. It's okay. Look at these rockets from over the side. Faker unanswerable as he slinks back into the Chemtech fumes. The bane of horrors everywhere. But definitely good for staying in camouflage throughout Summoner's Rift. And that is going to be the second Drake to go over to T1. Okay. Start stacking these ones up. They're going to be feeling pretty good as, yeah. Kale did not want to be taking that one. A little bit of uh, counter synergy between himself and his jungle. Hasn't been the first time that we've uh, seen that, unfortunately, as this was just a beautiful package there, especially after the flashes to come through, right? Still knocking him towards the side of that Raptor pit. Uh, yep. Easy pick up there. And now Turret has not fallen, but has gone very, very low. Will go down relatively quickly. T1 picks up the Drake, taking away one of the big pressure points. And if you go into the mid game or in late game, even on even footing, that's T1, right? Like, I, I'd still favor them for a myriad of reasons. Um, but now it's it's getting worse. They're getting a lead, they're getting farther and farther ahead. And if Faker gets accelerated, if Gumiyushi hits two items, and Liv Sandbox don't somehow find a big flank angle from Dove, or somehow close it and maybe make his way through the camouflaged fog and yeah. try and get close because he doesn't have TP available. Uh, it's going to be an incredibly, incredibly tough uphill battle for Sandbox. Yeah, this is the problem. You can see they're trying to side lane now, but the defensive play around these sides has been working out so, so well for T1. They can rip through the waves, and uh, these turrets don't stand much of a chance either. So you can see it's the Silas towards that bottom side, trying to get that split happening. With Ignite, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Dove was doing a decent job there on the top side, but getting out rotated not quite fast enough and t1 continue to uh firmly grip this game not a lot of answers just yet slightly over a 1000 gold lead nothing insurmountable as we were no. talking about and discussing last game yeah it's um, but still it just feels like it doesn't there's there's not much of a it gets better from here type situation right like that's that's why we're talking about this game like this, even though the gold does look so extraordinarily close. 
it's it's possible for sandbox, right? It's it's not a composition we've seen those as well, especially from sandbox. I was well, yep. we've reached 25 minutes. Pack it up, pack it up, boys. Let's let's call it's it. It's not as Olaf a drugs as it has <laughs> been in the past. You're absolutely right. But um, it's uh, I, I think still a T1 that are feeling extremely comfortable with uh, the state of the game that they're in. They're not going to be at any risk. They can trade multiple drakes uh, and try and get barons, right? They don't really have to check in the fog. They have a range advantage. Uh, as long as they can keep some semblance of map control, which they are very diligent in pushing forward their vision lines and uh, making sure that they uh, remain as vigilant as they have thus far. You can engage, you can disengage. It's going to be really hard for Sandbox to really get anything going. Um, and I don't know how you're going to get through. Yeah, here are sandbox, especially considering how they've been playing thus far, right? Because uh, their picks have been okay. You know, they, their windows have been decent, but the early game actually went relatively well, it did. right? Yeah. They were able to find a couple of cheeky little picks and things like that. But then we spoke about it, and oh no, ice caught out of position here. Only going to hold forward. Super Mega Death Rocket, not quite death, but definitely yeah. Super and or Mega. And Gumushi continuing to push on forward. This is what happens, right? Like, Ice gets chunked, and then where does the good news start uh, for Liv Sandbox? Maybe it's Dove rotating his way up. Croco making his way in as well. Puts down some dirty ground. There's enough of that on this rift. Don't, don't need to add back to the away. issue, Croco. Come no, on. exactly. Trundle is only part of the problem. Yeah. You know? It's not great. Uh, but you also see that's exactly the type of mistakes I think you need to avoid. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, good tippy. Yeah, teleport gonna get Faker out of there and does mean that uh, Close is gonna waste some time there towards the top side oh. of the map. And, it's yeah, this is just, it's ring around the rosy. But this is the beauty, right? Like, it works twofold, because yes, he used it to get out of the gank, but the rest of the sandbox is trying to collapse on Faker, thinking that he might be a weak spot, but instead he teleports towards the mid lane where the rest of his team is standing ready with a wave, yep. and they just get a free turret, and this has been happening. Basically the entirety of the series. Exactly. The only better global taunt than Teemo is Faker. And uh, it worked out to great effect here uh, I, uh, to get that in a turn. I personally argue that Teemo has been replaced by Yumi. That's true. Uh, although it is more difficult to just straight up walk over and kill a Yumi. Because she's often attached not to something you, more not scary. If not if you all are hands. <laughs> I mean, that's true. That's true. But I mean, there are always exceptions I agree. to the rules. I agree. Ice, Ooh, it's a little bit dangerous, that positioning. Vision's still there for T1. Faker's gonna take one of his own rockets, and actually, Ice did a fair bit of damage there. Calibrum at the ready. Crescendum there as well. The team fight tools are available, but now T1 walking on in. Dredgeline going to connect. The depth charge as well. They're trying to focus down the Gragas, and they will get him, as these rockets from Closer are doing a lot of work, and T1 gonna have to back away and give over the Chemtech Drake to live Sandbox. A great play from them. Closer starting to assert his dominance, dominance here on the Silas. And there you do see where the comp of the Sandbox excels, right? We mentioned previously, if they can find a single target, they go through very quickly. I think Zeus may be feeling a little false safe sense of security considering how tanky he is, but for Gwen, that's not a lot. Oh no, eyes caught out of position. Good uh, dredge line there though from Kale to try and stop him from going down as Croco. He's not going to be so lucky. Closer turns up again a little bit too late, but he left his team for the Wolves. And the Wolves have consumed them. Kale now trying to flash his way out. Titan's Wrath kept him alive for a little bit longer. But now Gumiyushi is excited. And why wouldn't he be as he's picking up so many of these kills? The Moonlight Vigil goes absolutely wide. And in the end, it's an ace for T1. Don't ask me how they did it, Atlas, but this is vintage T1 right there. Looking like they lose a fight on mid, baiting in your opponent, and then looking like they might just end right here, right now. Yep, they certainly could, and 404 Jinx was not found by Liv Sandbox in that team fight. I think is uh, what that scoreline is telling us. These Nexus turrets not long for the world, and from what looked like, Liv Sandbox making a decent play, finding themselves a skirmish, has ended up with a dead Nexus. And uh, first, it's going to be a dead Croco just for a little while longer. And Kale is also going to suffer the same fate. But the Nexus is not going to survive. And T1 will do it in just over 25 minutes. Can't even fault Sandbox for that one. This is just a sheer class of T1. Yeah, they needed a warm-up game, you know. There were some <laughs> moments that weren't perfect. But this team showing I mean, here 
I mean, that was also like it was basically just fake. Yeah, Closer was, was also really nowhere well. near his team, and his team was still yeah. pushing really far up. And then T1 got a 4v4 that they should never have really been able to get, but they were offered it. It was on a silver platter, and they were like, oh, really nice platter you've got there, and they took it, right? And you have to give credit where credit is due. Playing out exactly that moment was very, very nicely done. And I hope we get the highlight of the final, uh, final fight from, from Gumeyushi, because uh, picking a POG was kind of hard, because not a lot happened in this game at all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, no, it's, but uh, it's I, not exactly obvious. I hope we, we get one, uh, because the movement that he showcased there, his zoning with Jinx, the, the back and forth was... I, I, if you didn't catch it the first time around, I'm sure we will see it, because it was a uh, beautiful, beautiful set of plays, and as a whole, uh, well, T1 definitely looking the cleanest out of our top three thus far. Yeah. And top three is, of course, even though they're not in top three <laughs> score, would still be yeah. Genji T1.1. Uh, Genji T1, no, i sure. Obviously. Okay. I mean, that's our top three. That's I, I know, that is I, literally I, our I top know, three, okay? I know, I know. And but sometimes you just have to look at how the game's going. Okay. And okay. Uh, okay. nominate the top three. Yes, I, I do believe that uh, <laughs> Dalmon are going to come back. If they're going to, do you know what? who they're going to have to go through? T1. Oh, I know. Because that's next one. <laughs> Our life only gets better and better as the season goes on and oh, these boy. stories develop. Uh, but if T1 continue to play like this, especially if Zayas continues to play like this, like he did in game number one. Yeah. Oh, man. It is going to be a... Uh, a tough fight for Damwon Kieran. I think that if you're predicting a 2-0 for T1, all power to you. I actually don't I don't see how I can fault it. This team's no, looking very, it's, very powerful. It's incredible, right? They are looking as good as, uh, as we expected, and that is not necessarily a given. Yes, they changed minimal things, but still, Zeus, a new player, a player with very limited experience. Yes, he wasn't the roster for all of last year. <laughs> so we get a little bit <laughs> a bit uh, of a whoopsie of a, of a here. slip and slide. Yep. Um, Gary's like, get me out of here. Oh, no. Yeah. Please don't give me the PNG. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, T1 just, they look incredible, right? And then on the flip side for Live Sandbox, I think that today was, was a decent upgrade, day. actually, to be yeah. honest, uh, from think some of their day. other days. Yeah. I don't think you could have expected reasonably more against a team that's as good as T1. There were some nice individual moments. I think the drafts. Barring letting that Caitlyn through uh, to one of the best spot lanes in uh, the LCK, if not the world was not the move, but outside <laughs> of that, there were moments uh, that I think showcased that Liv Sandbox as the season progresses might have more, uh, but the T1 was really <laughs> pretty good at most. Yeah, they were. And this actually went okay for Liv Sandbox. We mentioned that their earlier game uh, on T1's yeah. side was not exactly the most clean. That hook also not quite there, but the play and the movement around the map, the macro decisions here from T1 were what won them the game because this just bought them a 1.5k gold lead just by being in better positions on the map. And then they win a skirmish like this and then Live Sandbox feel like they have no way back in, right? Yeah, it was uh, simply not enough time, not enough spaces and it felt like T1 were playing with an extra member. And this is how this started. I love this. This is effectively kind of splitting the fight apart, right? It's a one versus one versus five. And then the four people are also kind of there. And Faker sets up this package. They all go in thinking they can maybe get it done. And again, I want you to look at the movement here on Guma as he moves forward. Because he's he wants to kill. That's one dodged. Yep. And Gale Force is back That's into it. position. Okay. And yeah. now it's pretty much done from here. We get to listen to T1 as they get this work done. ゆみゆし、デフリーエクサイト。ですね。ファイル、ファイル、ファイル。今からだで。だ。あ、なな。見た見て。なんだ、なんだ。お、ハイマネ、ハイマネ。あ、そのでばっかな。いけるかな。あ
T1, first game, you know, it was a win. Not the cleanest, but it wasn't a bad win either. We had a lot of individual highlights. And then the second one, uh, yep. they just demolished Liv Sandbox in what can only be described as a, a one-sided affair. Yeah, it was uh, pretty clinical. Honestly, it felt like it wasn't that far over until what? it was absolutely until over. Until it was. Um, yeah. <laughs> just to quote Scar there, just a little bit. Uh, as T1 probably surprised our analyst chairs as well. They're probably scrambling to get towards those chairs. Hopefully they had enough highlights, things like that. But thankfully, it's right now that we get to find out. Let's throw it over. Thank you, Atlas and Chronicler, for breaking that down. Not a lot happened in that game, uh, to be totally frank. And we were, in fact, struggling to scramble to get some highlights yeah. because there were two fights that happened in that game. Yeah, as soon as Atlas said that, I was like, no, it's actually true. We were like, <laughs> we're looking for the highlight. Um, and uh, I got I got the big X. <laughs> We've the got a special intro. I'm like the one of this. I'm <laughs> Chronicle and I are like the newest parts of the LCK, but I get like the magical like 10 year anniversary <laughs> fade in. Anyway, let's take a look at the draft here. The Corky went through again. They picked it up. Can't fault Sandbox as much this time around because Liv Sandbox were like, didn't go so well for Faker last game. Maybe he won't have the same success. And to be totally honest, throughout the early mid, early to early mid game, there was some missed package opportunities. Faker was using it mostly defensively. It was only after we got to, uh, towards the you know later part of the mid game and as late as the late game, you could call it in that 24 minute game, yeah. Faker did start actually doing things with his yeah. quirky. And there were some cool parts of this draft. I, I really liked the Thresh takeaway personally. Like you see the first pick of Felios, you're like, well, I'm gonna take away one of the strongest uh, support picks there. You go ahead and you pick up the Jinx as well. So you have a really strong bottom lane. But Trundle for me was, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Trundle in general. I thought it was a little bit questionable when you're going up against so much range with the Corky and the Jinx. I feel like a lot of the time you're kind of just running around with your, your pants on fire. Yes, you can steal away some of the tankiness of Gragas, but I don't know, didn't didn't feel like he was doing a lot. And I mean, it's hard to tell too, because again, not, not too much happened. Like even when they were trying to force fights, it was difficult for them. Yeah, one more note on the draft. The Silas pick there felt like more of a NAR denial pick than anything else. We have seen some Korean players out here believe that Silas is somewhat of a counter pick to the Corky because you could steal the rockets away. If the Corky makes a mistake in lane, you can kill, but not a huge fan of it. And in this draft, I think he was extremely low impact. Yeah, uh, didn't end up doing too much. Uh, did shoot a lot of his own rockets though, which I suppose was pretty cool. Um, we do have highlight number one. So we're gonna go ahead into that. This was Faker's first package. Uh, that was pretty cool, to be honest. Yeah, the first package that really ends up being high value here, helps secure this kill. And you can see that T1 are so ready to actually collapse in here and set up for Faker when he does teleport in. So really nice coordination here on the side of T1. It's a game that's easily forgettable, I think, in a lot of ways because it was very slow, it was very passive, but in moments like this, T1 knew exactly when to like snap their fingers and go for an engage. And that decisiveness, I think, is why they were able to decisively take the victory in the end because a lot of the time you're just kind of edging around in this meta, but being able to, to press the go button like that is what uh, ends up giving them those advantages. Yeah, and you can see kind of the difficulty for Liv Sandbox as well, trying to find an engage desperately with Nautilus and Trundle and it just not working with all of the mobility on the other side. We're gonna take a look at highlight number two and break down this very long extended fight, kind of a wonky engage with the package this time. Yeah, the positioning here is a little bit awkward for Liv Sandbox and the package doesn't end up being like a huge, huge boon for T1, but it's just enough of an edge to actually let them close the distance here. And then Gumi used his movement here on the Jinx, chasing down these kills, going over here and looking for the trap on ice. As he really had ice's number in both games here, so, so heavily, um, you know, even though First game was definitely a more interesting <laughs> scenario there. Uh, yeah. I think he he definitely ended up kind of gapping there on the bottom side. I still needs a lot more experience, I think, before he ends up uh, coming into his own here in the LCK. Yeah, I mean, Liv Sandbox still playing around with some of the rookies, seeing what fits a little bit better. Will it be MB? Will it be Ice in the end? We still have to wait and see. Um, you know, as well as you're going up against one of the best bottom lanes, if not the best bottom lane in Korea, who did just get counter picks on you in the draft. So can't really fault them too much. We didn't get to see too much from Ice this time around. And uh, definitely a big ask. I think if you're Liv Sandbox, you go into the series, you say, well, we probably learned a decent amount and we, we try to build off of that. Whereas for T1, you know, another 2-0 under their belt, 
I'm not sure that after the series you can say that OT oh, one's better than Gen G just yet. I still think we really need to see them face off. Yeah, I think we're we're talking about a very big skill disparity between these two teams, a big draft disparity as well. So yeah. this one is definitely one you take with a few grains of salt, but great for T1 for the standings. Yeah. Well, guys, we do have the POG ready, so let's check in and see who does pick it up for game number two. I think there were only two options in this one. Yeah. And it will be Gumi Yusi who picks it up. I think Gumi Yusi and Faker were the, the options here. Gumi Yusi having a lot of great stats, obviously having the perfect KDA in this game, high DPM. Had the counter pick matchup, of course, in the bottom side there. The Thresh pick away was really nice, as you mentioned in draft. And he was always there to kind of catch the engages. Like, Faker's damage is not going to be as impressive as a lot of Corky's will be in this meta because he played more utility. He actually used his package in most of these fights to set up traps or to yeah. cut the team in half rather than actually looking for massive damage. And he played so much more safely in the second game that uh, minimized some of his poke damage, but he didn't get caught like he did in game one, which we saw several times. Uh, it was a split vote for me. Like, I really, I was going back and forth. I voted for Faker, and then I was like, I want to cancel that and vote for Gumi, but I stuck with the I stuck with the uh, Faker vote in the end. Yeah. Um, you know, even though he had some rocky starts to this game, he, he did very well. And we'll see what the split ends up being here. Okay, 11 and 13, and it seems like... The, uh, me and, uh, me and you Chronicler. You and, no, I think that's Teddy over oh. on the, the Chinese broadcast. Oh, that's a China that's broadcast, okay. Yeah. So, uh... Yeah, I mean, maybe I, I was pushing you a little bit to keep your Faker vote. I thought he, he had some really nice engaged setups with the package as well. But yeah, the two of them, I like that they both get some representation and uh, that they do, they uh, they pick up some votes of their own. But Guma does pick it up this time. Guys, we have the interview ready, so let's hand it over to Jisun for the translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jisun with the POG Interpret Translation, joined by Seus and Gumayoshi from T1. Congratulations! With this victory, T1 is now having a sole possession of the first place in the LCK. How do you feel? Yesterday, Honda Life Esports was able to get a game off of Gen G, so yeah, we were able to climb up to the first place. Feel, it feels awesome. And this is my first interview with you, Zeus. How are you feeling? First off, I don't think I performed well today. So it feels great to win the POG, but still, I'm a little bit unsatisfied. I didn't perform. But Zeus, rumors say that T1 is doing a fantastic job in Scream, so could you kind of tell us more about it? We are pretty much close to not being defeated. Just kidding. Well, I think, yeah, we don't really lose much. We can say that. However, and there is a jinx about, you know, a team that's really strong in Screams cannot actually win a lot on stage. So how strong was T1 compared to the Scream T1? Well, game number one wasn't that clean, but I think game two was decent. What about you, Zeus? I mean, Kuma Yusi in Scream oh, is way stronger than he was today. So, Kuma Yusi, Korki, was T1's mid lane pick for game number one and two. A champion that is not that strong early on in the laning phase. Well, we didn't have any str um, specific strategy about Quirky's laning phase. It's just good in general, especially later on. So we just we just wanted to secure that pick. And I think we'll keep using the champion in the future. Zeus, your NAR was popping off in game number one. A champion that actually debuted LCK last year. I think today was even better. So does T1 kind of trust your NAR pick? I don't know how my teammates think, but NAR is one of my comfort picks for sure. You know, you know the, the NAR bar control or everything. I'm really good at it, but I don't know what others think. What do you think, Kuma Yusi? It's alright, you know. It's good. Are you being strict to him? Uh, no. I mean, he was doing alright. That's what I think. Speaking of Norbars, yeah. 
You were always turning into Meganar whenever team fights were about to happen, and you were actually the sec did second most damage in that game. And you are the youngest champion here in the LCK, but you are so good at that champion. So, how long has it been since you practiced that champion? I mean, since last year, to be honest, because that champion got buffed last year. But you know, that's not a Nar is not a difficult champion to kind of execute. So it's really fun to play. Guma Yuzi, Caitlyn Lux are the two strongest champions down on the bottom lane in terms of the lane phase, right? Do you also agree? I don't think they're like the best, but as long as me and Kara get to play them, every champion becomes the best. Game 2, you had a phenomenal performance on Jinx. They didn't really have too much um, action happening, but Nautilus was not able to finish his first item up until 24 minute mark in the game. So, are you getting close to becoming the best AD carry in Korea? I think I've pretty much secured it, but I want to be the best AD carry in the world. Looking forward to accomplish that title this year. And Aphelios versus Jinx matchup is actually is in a huge favor of Jinx. What do you think about that matchup as well? I have already mastered that champion matchup, so I'm pretty much confident in either side. My Aphelios, you know, everyone knows about it, and I'm so good at Jinx as well, so... If I get to play <laughs> either of them, I will still win the lane. And Zeus, you are also farming a lot of experience here on the LCK, but I think you are fully um, improved now. Do you also agree with that? I don't know, you know. I mean, I think I have to become a lot better and improve. I have a long way to go. What is your personal goal this year? First off, you know, getting the best result in the LCK, maybe winning the LCK. Your next opponent is Nongshin Red Force. You guys will be playing against Kana. Zeus, what is your mindset heading into that match? Kana, he's doing a great job. You know, he's really talented. So I think I have to prepare really well. This days, Peter, he's so cute. He looks so cute. I mean, I'm, I want to bully him until he cries. <laughs> Lastly, we have a packed stadium of T1 fans. Any message over to them? Thank you for showing up here. You know, I really appreciate all the support. Thank you. Today, as well, I'm so happy to see so many fans supporting us, and we will do our best to stay on top of the LCK. Thank you. Congrats once again, Guma Yuzi and Zeus on the victory, and now back to Valdez and Wolf for the analyst task. Thank you. Thank you, Jisun, for that awesome translation of the interview. Great to hear from Zeus and Guma Yuzi as some harsh words against Peter. I'm not sure if I can stand for that, but we'll see how it goes in that next matchup as we're going to take a look quickly at the standings as well and see where we stand after this win. Yep, T1 with a 2-0 here do pass Genji by just one indicator point here as Genji did end up having to take that win 2-1 last night. So slight lead there uh, in terms of our big three right now t1 a lot of people are, are raising eyebrows going is this the best of the three only time will tell we'll have t1 against genji and dom one kia coming up a little bit later on because we haven't had that matchup yet we had the sick one between genji and dom one kia but a lot more information needed before we can make those claims. Absolutely. And the next matchup, guys, will be Kwangdong Freaks up against DRX. DRX looking for their first win. Kwangdong Freaks looking to join the middle of the pack with a 2-2 two and two record if they do pick up the win. Should be a pretty close one, I am expecting. But, guys, we are going to take a bit of a longer break before we do get to that second matchup. So stay tuned. We'll be back with the second half of LCK.
first blood. LCK의 첫 킬 기억나시나요? 어 솔직히 말씀드려도 되는지 모르겠네 잘 기억이 안 나요. 미리 질문 내용을 살짝 듣고 미리 좀 찾아보려고 했는데 저는 찾기가 어렵더라고요. 저는 도저히 이 도저히 기억이 안 나네요 이게. 뭐 어떤 팀을 이겼다 뭐 그런 거 정도는 생각해 보면 알것 같은데. 네네. 두 팀의 선수들이 경기를 준비하고 있는 선수들 또 어떤 모습 들일지 선수들을 만나보도록 하겠습니다. 함께 보시죠. 자 개막전 스톱 시드 바로 MIG 프로스트가 나옵니다. MIG 프로스트 지난 인비테이셔널 우승에 있는 용산 저희가 그 9층에 전용 경기장이 있었는데 그때 용산 일대가 뭐 난리가 났죠. 내가 생각했던 것 이상의 또라 또 다른 종목이 생기는구나. 이 스포츠에 또 다른 역사가 쓰이는구나. 원래 그 함성 소리는 방음 부스를 약간 뚫고 들어오거든요. 하는 약간 그 진동처럼 울림이 들어오는데 어그 현장감이 너무 좋았던 것 같아요. 그때 진짜 어 장난 아니었습니다. 저때 어떤 생각으로 게임했는지까지 뭔가 기억이 날것 같긴 해요. 자 경기 시작됐습니다. 자, 파란색 체로창이 MIG고요. 보라색이 리트리퍼입니다. 작은 아마 <웃음> 완전 고갈된 상황. 자, 네. 아, 예전 롤은 그래픽이 이랬었나? 라는 생각이 가장 먼저 들고요. 아, 정말 많은 발전이 있었구나 라는 게... 근데 저는 이것도 익숙하긴 해요. 이때 게임을 너무 많이 해가지고... 어, 확실하게 지금 차이가 와... 아이들 뭐 습정을 들어가서 도움을... 갱킹이라 그러죠. 도움 가가지고 킬이 나왔다든지 이런 상황이 전혀... 이거 위험해! 이거 위험해! 아... 어... 어... 저건 좋다! 네, 결국 포스트 블러도... 점화 데미지... 예, 데미지 계산이... 아, 이거구나... 와. 아, 근데 이때 건우 형이 라인들이 진짜 세긴 했어요. 사람들이 다 벽을 느끼는. 아, 근데 제가 모를 만 했네요. 탑에서 킬난 거라서. 탑 건우 시절 캐넨으로 말파이트 상대로 멋진 솔킬을 보여줬네요. 예. 네. 아, 근데 킬각 잘 잡았다. 좀 부럽네요. 이럴 때첫 킬이 딱 밝혀졌을 때 저였으면 되게 좋았을 텐데. 예, 네, 뭐 없나 싶네요. 뭐 첫, 어, 첫 어시가 저였다든가. 아, 그때. 아 나름 이게 짬바가 꽤 되는 세 명이 했었는데 척킬할 때 우리 한번 제대로 이거 이거 영원히 이거 남을 거니까 이 스포츠 역사에 이거 저 라이브러리에 들어갈 거니까 우리 제대로 한번 이랬어야 되는 건데. 역사에서 첫 키를 기록한 주인공이라는 걸 장건홍 선수 본인도 안들 때는 모르겠습니다만 첫 발자국 레디인 거랑 거의 똑같다고 저는 보기 때문에 족적을 남겼다? 네, 여러 가지 면에서 참 키의 가치가 크다 리그 오브 레전드 챔피언스 코리아 그 웅장한 역사의 첫 발자국? 그런 느낌이라고 말씀드릴 수 있을 것 같습니다 <웃음> 생각지도 못한 집이 생겨서 좀 놀랐는데 편해요. 사실 여기서 뭐 먹을 것도 먹을 것도 주고 물도 있고 뭐 아는 사람들도 많고 해가지고 생각보다 편한 것 같아요. MC 하면 또 오픈이 아니겠습니까? 그죠. 준비한 거 있나요? 아 그래서 그걸 좀 고민 중인데 어떤 식으로 할까 좀 고민 중이에요. 동작 같은 거. 
잠시만. 이따 지나 그러면 하나 하나를 생각해 놓고 오늘 1일 미션으로 가, 가볼게요. 선수를 불러가지고 그거 한번 이렇게 같이 하기. 백 하면은 옆에서 가족. 어 안녕하세요. 저희 오프닝 1화 오프닝이거든요 헷가족. 잠깐 혹시 저, 빨리 와주세요. 자리해 주세요. 어디서 맡은 거예요 지금 진도가? 지금 오프닝을 해야 되는데 오프닝 멘트가 너무 어려워요. 아 보통 분석 데스크 오프닝 멘트 어떻게 하세요? 제가 안 하죠. 핵가족 홍보할 떡들에 핵가족 스티커 붙이는 중이에요. 다 수작업. 아, 어, hello guys. Hello, hello. Uh, do you guys know, know me? 아, 아, 니크. 아, you know me. Thank you. <웃음> Thank you, thank you. I'm living in LSK. You're living here? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's my home. Are you okay? Do you need help? <웃음> can we help you? Yes, I need help. Okay, okay, what can we do? 홍보가 영어로 뭐지? Everyone, uh, let everyone know. Hack family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are the family. Okay. <웃음> <웃음> yeah. This is rice cake. Heck, 가죠. Heck, 가죠. Yo, 자주 뵙게 될 거예요. 떡 하나씩들 받으시고 떡인데 하나씩 어? 받으세요. 아, 감사합니다. 또 들어가죠. 아 여, 여기도 여기도 들어갔나? 나 살, 나 여기 많이 왔는데 여기 못 들어가. 여기 들어가도 되는데요? 피디님 안녕하세요. 어, 어, 안녕하세요. 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 제가 여기에 온 아, 이유는 두 가지가 있어요. 아, 네. 일단 첫 번째로 핵가족을 홍보하러 왔고. 아, 네. 아 지금 바쁘시죠? 아, 좀더 바쁘, 짧게 해주시면. 아, 짧, 짧게 할게요, 네, 짧게, 짧게 할게요. 그러면 그, 왜 저를 분석 데스크에 쓰지 않으셨어요? 아, 분석 데스크에 쓰지 않으셨어요? 아, 제가 아, 차가 제 힘으로. 저보다 리라님이 좋은 점이 뭐였어요? 아, 리라님이요? 말씀을 참 청산 유수처럼 잘 하시고. 저는 청산 유수처럼 잘 못하고. 저 핵가족이 분석 데스크보다 더잘될 거예요. 저 핵가족이 분석 데스크보다 더잘될 거예요. 아, 네. 아, 네. 알겠습니다. 그럼 대신 요거 한 번만 해주시겠어요? 화해의 의미로 핵. 아, 이거 빨리 해야 빨리 일하시죠, 또. 핵. 핵. 아니, 진짜. <웃음> 나, 나, 나는 근데 이렇게 터놓고 얘기할 수 있어서 너무 좋았어. 왜 내가 아니었는지. 근데 또 이렇게 확인 사살 받으니까 뭐. 앞으로는 될 일이 없을 것 같아요, 저도 사실. 리라, 리라님 얼마나 잘하나 한번 볼게요. 백가족, 파이팅! 어, 뭐야, 안녕하세요. 어, 어, 안녕하세요, 선수. 잠깐만, 잠깐만 얘기 좀 하다가요. 아, 좀 있으면 경기 있으시죠? 네. 아, 경기 파이팅 하시고, 핵가족, 앞으로, 뭐지? 아, 지금 자다 일어나서 많이 잔다? <웃음> 아, 진짜 자가지고, 아. 자주 뵐것 같아서 저도 잘 부탁드립니다. 네, 잘 부탁합니다. 아, 잘 부탁드립니다. 여기 핵가족 떡 하나 받으시고. 감사합니다. 네, 가시기 전에, 핵! 핵! 가족! <웃음> 감사합니다. 오늘 경기 파이팅 하세요. 감사합니다. 아 어, 지금 선수도 오는 것 같은데? 누구지? 지금 뭐 하고 있나요? 지금 저희가 촬영 중인데 제가 여기서 살고 있어요. 아 그거 봤어요. 봤어요? 핵가족. 핵가, 어, 핵가족 알아요? 네. 아 그러면 저희 집에 잠깐 잠깐 15초만 그럼 보고 가세요. 집 있어요? <웃음> 네 집이 있어요. 지금 바, 바쁘죠? 내가 시간 많이 안 잡아먹을게요. 아... 여기가 집이거든요. 어때요? <웃음> 잘하고 있어. 일단 경기 끝나면 내가 또 찾아갈게. 에이? 가죠. 가죠. 지금 하나 생명 손대영 감독님하고 코치. 아, 아, 아. 이거 주인 기다리는 똥개도 아니고 이거. 약간 큰일을 보시나 본데? 어. 
아, 감독님 오늘 경기 파이팅입니다. 저희 이사떡, 이거 핵가족 이사떡입니다. <웃음> 파이팅! 감사합니다. 네. 5분 기다려서 5초 얘기했다. <웃음> 씁쓸하네요. 그러니까 도전할 때 제일 긴장감이 좀 넘치나요? 아무래도 부담감이 좀 생길 수밖에 없으니까. 그것도 근데 중요한 것 중에 하나가 카메라에 내가 어떻게 나오나. <웃음> 아니, 솔케모가 카메라 신경 쓸 수도 있지. 불편하대? 너가 그런 거 아니고? <웃음> 영준아, 이 정도면 안 불편해? 좀더 가야 돼? 알겠어, 알겠어. 좀더 더 가주세요. 전 참, 참을 수가 없어서 콜라멘이나도 먹으려고요. 콜라멘도 오랜만에 먹는다, 이거. 깔끔하다. 너 오빠, 안녕하세요. 너 오빠, 안녕하세요. 이거야, 아니? 응. 진짜 이렇게 하면 확실히 아니고? 응. 아, 이러고 있는 거야. <웃음> 한번 누워보세요. 아, 빨리 한번 누워보세요. 편해요, 은근. 편하게 누우셔도 돼요. 네, 여기. 확실히 올 때만 눌러야 돼. 한번 눌러보세요. 가시기 전에 이거 한번 해주고 가세요. 핵! 핵! 빨리. 가죠. 감사합니다. 일단 한번더 찾아뵐게요. 네, 허준아. 아, 안녕하세요. 네, 안녕하세요. 저 여기 이사 와가지고 집한 번만 보고 가세요. 집이요? 네. 네, 여기 집이 있어요. 저 보고 싶었나요? 아니요, 전혀. 저한테 카톡 했잖아요. 아니, 전혀. 한 번. 본인 꿈에 나왔다면서요. 아니요, 전혀. <웃음> 말을 그런 식으로 해, 또. 사람들이 진짜 안 친한 줄 안다니까, 그러면? 아니, 진짜 안 친해, 이거. 여기서 주무시는 거예요? 네. 어쩌다 가 <웃음> 어쩌다 이렇게 됐어요, 그냥. <웃음> 우리 옛날 담원 느낌으로다가 같이 한번 누울까? 여기 월세 몇 시에 왜 이렇게 좁아? 아, 여기 좀, 여기 좀 좁아. 프로그램 잘 되면 은 나중에 좋은 데로 이사할 거야. 잘안될것 같은데? <웃음> 이거 하면 이긴다, 오늘. 핵! 아, 허수야, 진짜 사람들이 안 친한 줄 안다니까? 아, 너가 장난으로 그러는 거에도 사람들이 진짜 안 친한 줄 알아. 가족하면 좋아? 느낌 알잖아. 핵! 가족! 야! 파이팅! 파이팅! 고맙습니다. 아, 촬영 안, 아, 저, 너 대기실 저쪽이잖아, 저쪽으로 가고. 아, 잘하고. 네. 연탄 중입니다. 리라님 얼마나 잘하시나 한번 보려고요. 나도 저기서 자주 했었는데. <웃음> 안녕하세요. 찾아뵙고 딱 드리려고 제가 이사 왔거든요, 여기. 아, 네, 들었어요. 노숙을 하고 계세요. 아, 노숙이라니요. <웃음> 네. 리라님 실수하시면 다 거의 제 자리예요. 네, 개막이 1차 분석 데스크로 인사드립니다. 안녕하세요, 이정현이고요. 이제 슬슬 분석 데스크 긴장되는 시간입니다. 네, 리라님 잘 하나 보려고요. 실수 하나 하잖아요. 바로 캐치할 거예요, 제가. 신나 비리리 선수의 음. 아지르가 나오면서 주도권을 많이 가져갔었고. 출발 일단 굉장히 안정적인데? 어, 잘하시는데? 이거 안 되는데? 안 되겠다. 목표 바꿔야겠다. 분석 데스크에 다시 들어가는 것보다는 핵가족이 분석 데스크보다 잘 되는 걸로 갈게요. 안 빼세요! 아, 빼려고요! 아, 근데. 아, 저 약간 긴장하신 것 같았는데 되게 잘하시네. 야, 너희끼리 칭찬하지 마. 그러니까요. 아마 제가 필요할 때도 있을 거예요, 아마 나중에. 아, 네. 별로 원하시지 않는 것 같은데? 시제! 하나생명 e스포츠 성업 중! 축하드립니다. 두두 선수 잠깐 혹시 인터뷰 가능할까요? 마음껏 때려봐. 가시죠. 여기 여기 안 되나? 네. 아, 너무 누차 안 돼? 아, 진짜 편하게 앉으셔도 돼요. 누워도 돼요. 제 집이에요, 제 집. 저랑 그럼 놀, 놀다 간다고 생각하세요, 편하게. 네. 뭐 인터뷰 한다 생각하지 말고. 너가 또할 것도 없어. 저가 너할 것도 없어. 네. <웃음> 오늘 첫 경기 이겼는데 아침에 모닝 동은 잘 나왔나요? 아, 이거. 오늘 네. 경기 직전에 여기 화장실에서, 대기실 화장실에서 음. 
처리하고 왔습니다. <웃음> 여기 LCK 화장실이 또 괜찮아요. 비대도 있고. 네, 깨끗하다고 하고 시원하게 처리하고 나니까 또잘 풀리네요. <웃음> <웃음> 아 다행입니다 질문을 그럼 몇개더 해볼게요 아, 네. 혹시 프로게이머 하면서 손이 엄청 빠르신데 한칸 타자는 몇 정도 나오세요? 마지막 해본게 고등학교 시절이어가지고 그때 몇? 600타 정도 나오고 600타? 평소에 누구랑 제일 친해요 하나에서는? 바로 옆에 있는 온플릭 선수가 가장 친해요 음, 개인적으로 온플릭 선수 이렇게 뵈면은 키가 엄청 크시잖아요 그래가지고 볼 때마다 와키 진짜 크시다 약간 잘하는 것 같다 이런 생각 하는데 같이 지내면 어때요? 천장 좀 낮은 데 오면 이제 아니 저게 머리에 닿네 <웃음> 이런 느낌을 받을 때가 많아요 사실 이렇게 오늘 인터뷰를 길게 한 거는 이 핵가족에서 처음인데 아 전에도 하신 분이 전에 하긴 했는데 좀 짧게 했었어요 아이씨 신발 좀 빨고 냄새 나잖아 가시기 전에 해야 될게 하나 있어요 백 <웃음> 빨리요 가죠 <웃음> 감사합니다 아 두두 선수가 사람이 너무 좋다 가족 한명딱 만든 기분이야 지금 또 오늘 홍보도 하고 다양한 선수들과 사람들 만났는데 어떠셨나요? 혹시나 좀 긴장해서 못할까 걱정을 했었는데 제 능력이 제가 생각했던 것보다 기대 이상이었다 좀잘 나온 것 같아요 이 정도면 은 충분히 방송 분량 뽑고 편집하고 아마 많이 남으실 거예요 이 정도면 은 진짜 힘들거든요 이제 그래서 오늘 밥값을 다 했기 때문에 쉬도록 하겠습니다 고생하셨습니다 들어가세요 들어가세요 고생하셨습니다 아. 아우 고대다 고대 아. 날아오 정말 잘 갈까? 여기 자고 갈까? 안녕하세요 안녕하세요 자 성캐님하고 비밀로 얘기할 게 있으시죠? 
Wish I had a
be true It's heartbreaking And raise the mood I wanna believe Believe in you You can run and you can hide Learn to live with your delight Oh baby, I'm losing faith Get to the chase to do Don't let your demons define you You can run and you can hide Learn to love on your delight Oh baby, I'm losing faith Get to the chase
chance for the world One hope can save us now Our time for history Brave hearts will win the day Run strong all the way It's time for you and me Cause nothing can hold us down on the ground nothing can hold us down on the ground we can be heroes we can be sky fall and the sun turn black when the earth halts then don't look back hold me closer can you feel my heart we can conquer and win back all the tide is changing floods are coming 
Wish I had a had another drink, then I'd have left it. Instead, we're gonna go to the brink. Don't you think that we should forget? Give me all your love, give me all your love. Give me. All your 
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for our final match of the week. Week two will conclude. Kwondong facing off against DRX. An opportunity for DRX to find themselves a win. Maybe. Maybe. And they need it. Uh, because Kwondong's only win was also against a Leaf Sandbox. And as we all know, that team is very much in the developmental stages. So not looking yes. too hot either. So really, I mean, both of these teams kind of are too. Uh, not necessarily guess, as far as yeah. the experience the players have individually, but trying to work together as a team, somewhat of a yeah. difficulty. I want to um, bring everyone up to speed with a theory. Uh, the theory is uh, strength of schedule. Um, and DRX have had a really rough one. They debut, live sandbox, and they, they take the L, and it was not great. And then they have to face off against T1 and Gen.G, our two undefeated teams here in the LCK. So I think that their last two matches don't actually give us all that much new information and probably just points them down a bit of a spiral, which could be a problem. So that's the hopium um, for DRX fans. Kwondong, though, just coming off a victory and looking a lot better. Let's bring up points of the match and check out what there is to look forward to this time around, as this is not it. That's the that's the last matchup, and it there, yeah, we, there go. we go, nailed it. All right, Quando Freaks collected their first win against Live Sandbox, and DRX were unable to do so, and DRX wanting to tie things up if they were able to take a win here. Of course, that means that both of these teams will have taken one win this week, and that would definitely be good news for DRX fans because I think a lot of us put DRX closer to the middle of the pack rather than the very bottom. And both teams have had a lot of issues in the jungle. A jungle, of course, a very important role at the moment, has been, honestly, for as long as memory goes back. Yes. Uh, when it comes to League, and Pioshik not looking anywhere like a player that we know he could be, because I don't think he was ever very high on the list. He was never up there with the Canyons, the owners, but he was definitely a player that, especially during the Hacker and Manude matter, showcased that he could carry his team. He was the Udia guy. He, he, he was. He was the one that brought and, it out first here in the LCK. It, and him and Kingen have both looked just like shadows of their former selves versus an LM who had a series that he really needed, uh, where he finally was able to get the win and get that pivotal POG. Exactly. Let's have a look at the most important lane for this match, though, when it comes to narrative, and that is Teddy versus Deft, a tale as old as time. Teddy has pulled ahead in the matchup, of course, uh, since joining uh, SKT, now T1, uh, and then leaving afterwards. But, of course, 28 to 24 in his favor back in the Deft KT days. It was a little bit of a different story with Teddy uh, playing on Jin Ed, been drifting uh, back and forth which is uh, really cool to see. Teddy back on top. And if you'd ask me, I'd say that today does have an edge for Kwang Nong. I think that Alam in particular looked a lot more like the player that we expect him to be. Not necessarily to carry for his team, but a serviceable jungler that can enable the strength of his solo lanes and yeah. his AD carry. No, I agree. And also, Hoyt not being a complete liability yeah. in their last series was definitely very, very good. However, they were up against Liv Sandbox's rookie bottom lane in Ice's debut game. So, yeah, you have to look at the opposition before you actually really uh, get an opinion on this. And I want to see more out of this Hoyt-Teddy bottom lane because it just wasn't enough. Also, Teddy discovered that uh, he could play Jinx and after that, didn't lose. He's on like 25 KDA across the two victories uh, that he managed to pick up on that champion. Deft, one of our most famous Jinx players here in the LCK, has not actually played the champion yet. Has been playing it a bunch in solo queue though. So looking forward to seeing what he's gonna have for us. As Keen on the top side of the map is going to be an absolute pressure point here for Kwandong Freaks. I think that Keen is going to pose a big problem here for this team right now. DRX, of course, kinging up there towards the top side, struggling. Kyoshik as well. Zeka not having the debut here in the LCK that he wanted. And Deft and Beryl sort of stuck in ELO hell just a little bit. Yeah, they've uh, not had the greatest of times. I think Zeka has been just invisible. I don't think he's been the core issue, but he definitely hasn't been the solution, whereas Deft The lack of communication has been ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely very, very apparent uh, here on DRX. That is something that can be solved with time, um, but hopefully they ramp up the speed at which the solution is gathered. And if King and Piyoshi can't bounce back, if we can't see them in the case of Kingen, uh, go back to some of the games he played on 2021 uh, Summer DRX, where he was the one shining light of a roster yeah. that had an incredibly tough time. 
I would not be surprised to see some challenger swap ups come through next week because with the RX, it's so clear that topside is an issue. Uh, King and Piyoshi and Zeka, they need to step it up, and if they don't, their challengers roster is currently 7 and 1, standing at the top <laughs> of the standings. And yeah. I, I honestly think that leave the bot lane alone, you know, Deft Barrel, they have shown a lot. Um, as you can see, like, considering how yeah. hard Deft's like uh, overall opponents have been, and he's still doing this well in lane. Isolated, I think says a lot about that bot lane is not the problem in D-Rex. No, it's not, but Teddy has also been doing a lot of losing and has a lot of phenomenal stats. So yeah. you're talking about the fact that Deft ain't as bad as what the scoreline says. Well, Teddy's yeah. just good. Like, it's just pretty crazy, uh, statistically, as we can see right here. And I think that Jinx is gonna be very contested here today. I think Aphelios will likely be a trap pick and uh, I'm very interested in how that draft is going to go because Caitlyn is another one that Deft in the early laning phase looked absolutely fantastic on. Yes, they dropped the ball after that, but it is another thing worth looking at uh, here for both of these teams. Very interested in how that bottom lane is going to go and then what we can do to augment uh, a powerful bottom side for both of these teams. I think for Kwandong, it's a lot easier because they have Keen and Keen is just really good. Keen just win. Yeah, Keen will be fine. Keen. If you give him attention, he'll be very happy, but he doesn't need it. Uh, and that is not going to be the case for their opponents. Kingen has just looked lackluster overall after what I thought was a very rough split team and organization-wise. But him individually, up until the end, when uh, the losses really started compiling, um, felt like a consistent threat. And I 100% agree with you. Either of these two teams, blind pick of Thalios, not going to be happy. Nope. Um, I'm Please giving it. Not. I'm uh, definitely gonna say that if there is any blind pick of Felios, it will lose. I think that that is a guarantee. Because yeah. both um, of these players, deft one man army is what that sign said as well, which is uh, a little bit too true and a little bit sad. As Keen is about to fall asleep. It's just ah, uh, just another one of these top matchups that's easy for me because I'm really good at the game. It's taking a little bit of a nap, getting himself ready. I like it. Kongdom Freaks fans out in force. Aw, that's actually it's really, really cute. The win and lose at the bottom. Oh, it's really adorable. Bottom emotions. Yep. That uh, that we're going through. Well, King and hydrating, which is exactly what you need to do. I am uh, also, we both have water up here. You've Bunny. got a tea. You've got a tea over there, I think. No, it's just water. It's just water? Yeah. Okay, never mind. I never am mind. partial to, to mint. Hold it. There's someone holding their breath until DRX wins, and we need to alert the hospital. Uh-oh. Because that has been at least two weeks of no breathing. Might go on for a little bit more, Atlas. It may. It certainly may. But I think this is uh, probably a closer matchup than a lot of people were expecting given the fact that uh, DRX have just been against the most difficult opposition uh, at this point. And yes, we're not ever going to assume that they're going to be able to beat Genji and T1. They're just not a team, not especially happening. at this stage of the year. It's just not going to be a possibility. However, we should uh, be able to stand more of a chance against a team that's also trying to figure themselves out and get themselves some of that coordination. So here we are into the draft for game number one, Kwangdong Freaks versus DRX. Kwangdong will be on the blue side. If they win here, it'll be their first blue side win, which is interesting. Caitlin taken away again. Bot lane matchup going to be the key thing for me here. If you shut that down, DRX and their current form, I have seemingly nothing to stand on. Yep, even if you don't. If you just win hard enough elsewhere on the map, it doesn't actually matter, is uh, what it's looked like. That's I'm trying, I'm trying to find angles, okay, Atlas? <laughs> and it's not easy with DRX, even considering their opponents. And you just you take that, you can't take that away from you. Yeah, Come I, on. I, I was like, it's I don't know, something. I was doling out a lot of opium before, so I'm, I'm hoping that... Uh, <laughs> kind of pulling back. Yeah, I need, yeah. To, I need to sort of censor myself never, just a little never, bit. Never, um, you know, go over your recommended daily dose of yeah. opium. Uh, but I do agree with you, I think that even previous to the split, these two teams were expected to be of a similar power level. Just not the place where they are right now, uh, which is uh, a lot lower on the standings, and I think a lot of us would have expected. Karma ban, please? Yeah. Oh, Renekton? Yeah, okay. Renekton ban comes through, so the Karma will be first picked. And that means that DRX are going to be walking into an Ezreal Karma lane, potentially, which could be very, very difficult to deal with yeah. unless they have something else planned. Maybe Jinx Thresh is also um, very tempting, but... 
I think that you just love karma here and you're pretty I happy. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. Um, the one thing that this does is I think it makes the chink pick a little bit more awkward. But if you pick Asriel, you're still perfectly happy in playing into Fiendos, right? So it's still it's, not yeah. still not something that you're going to feel good about. And then you run into the issue where Karma is going to be able to just have the shove. Please. Please tell me. Please tell me it's happening, Deft. Please. Give, give, me the, give me the Thresh Jinx. Oh, just lock in the Jinx first. That's even better. Oh, finally. All right. This is a Game of League <laughs> Legends I'm happy to watch. Okay? This is this confirmed. Is, We're this all right. Is what you need. We're all, all right. Atlas. Atlas, Atlas. They didn't need to lock that. They could have gone with the Zin instead. Pyoshik, of course, a, one of his picks that he really does like, but instead just locking down that bottom lane. And I personally do think that the Jinx uh, blind is somewhat of a risk. Uh, although in this case, as, as you pointed out, I think that we kind of know what's going to happen unless Teddy wants to throw a curveball and randomly lock in something like a... <laughs> like I was going to say Sivir. <laughs> uh, but it's Varus. Varus again. All right. Hey. All right. Uh, although, although, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play Devil's Advocate here. We have not been a fan, I think justifiably so, of Varus into Aphelios. That counter pick doesn't work. However, I do think with Karma, Varus is a pick that can shove very, very well, that can actually apply reliable pressure in lane, and then will be able to outduel a Jinx Whoa. early on, as that is a very quick lock-in of the Akali, either for Kingen or for Zekka here. I think Ida actually seems yeah. like a really fun uh, flex pick that has been banned a lot today. I think a lot of people picking up the fact that uh, Akali with, uh, you know, the chem tank, <laughs> yeah, demonic no. embrace build is pretty broken. Um, but does make it through, and that means that either Zekka or Kingen will be able to uh, play that one. Okay, LeBlanc taken away. Um, a few of the matchups that uh, Akali doesn't want, I guess, will be targeted out here. Xin Zhao yeah. might have followed up with a Lee Sin ban or something like that, uh, but maybe I uh, Quantum Freaks, are, Freaks aren't too worried about it. No, I, I, I honestly, if Pioshik plays Lee, I don't think you're, you're very upset. I don't think Lee is in the strongest of spots right now, and Pioshik never was a particularly impressive Lee. Uh, so I think that you're not going to be too bothered by that. Uh, I do wonder if we see a Viego ban here. I do think that limiting the early snowballing potential and the early coverage that the RX have is going to be pretty important because with what Kwangdong Freaks have here thus far, it's a type of draft already where if you find an early lead on, on your Varus and the Karma can run a mock, you can hard engage with your Jarvan. Uh, it's a composition that can very easily transfer leads around the entirety of the map that can fight really hard at a point where death should not yet be online, right? And yeah. that is going to be pivotal. Well, Camille going to be taken off the board, and now DRX to uh, find themselves either a jungler or a Gregus. But it will be the Viego, and I like that a lot more. Yeah. Because oftentimes we just see Gregus locked in, and it's just not very fun. And hopefully Kingen's on something that... Uh, he enjoys because he hasn't been having a great time. It's now Kwangdong Freaks. What are they going to do to round this one out? Oh. Looks like Poke might be the aim of the game. This is kind of cool, actually. Fate Zoe was always very good as well. But, uh, you know, talking about hovers and you'll get burned. That's how that works. No, We're going to get death raid into the mid lane. I think that that was an angle, right? You can go for the... Uh, there was two angles. If you go for the Zoe and the Jace, then you have a straight up Poke composition. DRX is engaged thus far. Not that good. They're probably locking a Gragas or something, or something that can provide. Ha! No, they won't. Yeah, I mean, I mean obviously they're not going to, because uh, Kwangdo and Freaks have clearly decided to go for the team fight uh, build instead. Personally, I don't mind it. I think that uh, Victor is quite nice into the Akali, a good neutralizer, if you will. And then that will be the counter pick. King and was historically one of the champ uh, one of the players rather where we were fine with him playing not but that was king in his previous form i don't know to what extent he's going to be able to limit the or uh, rather to push this matchup as much as we've seen happen literally today we got a clinic on now yeah by zeus earlier today and uh following that up is going to be a tough act as i think wang Dong, really nice comp here a lot of power in basically every lane set up everywhere for alim uh, and I'm Durex, team fight as well? Yeah, no, no, it uh, definitely works out. I'm thinking about what the Thunderdome looks like, and honestly, it is pretty much a Thunderdome with yeah. the, uh, the Cataclysm going down, and then you've got 
chaos storms and death rays and piercing arrows and then you're locked in there because of the chains of corruption like the wombo combo potential here is really really scary uh keen pretty good gragas player just in general plays very aggressively uh when we used to see it but hasn't been playing so much of the gragas so far this season um, I'll double check just to make sure that he hasn't got 50% of his games on Gragas, but it doesn't really feel like something that he's been defaulting to. Yeah, he actually hasn't played it yet. So this will be the first time that we see Keen on the Graggy on the top side. And a Cognitive Freaks comp. I really like it. It's very well-rounded. It spikes early with the bot lane. Jarvan obviously has a lot of power at any stage of the game. And then for DRX, I think that these champions have a lot of power, but it is more finicky. Akali, and now both these champions are very reliant on careful execution. And Viego can also feel a little bit useless if the early skirmishes don't go your way. Yeah. And then if you let everything count or everything hang in the balance of death to his jinx, even for that good yeah. of a play. Well, I mean, that that, champion, it's happened before it and, has. and it wins. So maybe that's just the strategy here. It's like, well, everybody else just have fun and let's hope that uh, death can hard carry. But there has been some losses. Um, especially last year, it wasn't necessarily the year of Deft's Jinx, but he still has around about an 80% win rate if memory serves. So that ain't bad uh, for a gentleman who's had a career that uh, has lasted since like what, end of 2013? Yeah. yeah, something like that. Maybe the beginning. That was a long time ago, nine years ago. Wow, nine years ago, right? I've been doing this for is this, a is while. This, is, this, is this the moment where you're like, oh no? No, it's not an oh no. It's just a, it's been a while. Oh. <laughs> Why would it be an oh no? I don't know. Sometimes you think I'm ready for a midlife crisis? Yeah. No, I'm not, not necessarily, but sometimes you're just surprised by the passage of time. That's it's true. something a lot of us have experienced that's, over that's true. That's true. the last couple of years. Indeed. With not a lot happening. The but passage of time has been slower over the last two years, guarantee that. I don't know. I feel like it, it has just felt like no time has passed because we've all been uh, sitting inside playing the League of Legends. Stagnation, just too much stagnation. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Well, it um, depends how well you've been doing in your games of League of Legends as far as uh, how fast the time goes, you never know? Never as good as you want that, Liz. <laughs> never as good as you want yeah, it to some, be. It's something that I want to get off my chest. <laughs> never mind. Okay, <laughs> let's have a look at how these lanes are going to shape up. Uh, Nara and Degragas, uh, we saw demonstrated, be pretty good for the Nara, this state of the game. Um, and Akali versus Victor is an even matchup, as shown to us by Chovy. Let's see how Zeka does. <laughs> well, yeah, that's Chovy. Um, as, uh, as mentioned previously, I think that in terms of laning phase, the Akali is fine. Uh, the nice thing about the Victor, of course, is that you can have somewhat of a deterring kind of deal going on where it's going to be hard for the Akali to consistently dive into enemy backlines. So, yeah, we had to bring it up. Yep, that's an all-time LCK total, 91.3%, uh, only four losses here in the LCK, it's Deft. He's going to have his uh, support flash out of the way, so things not going so well for the gentleman with the pretty ridiculous win rate. Um, that's LCK total, I think his all-time total is closer to 80, oh. um, but it's over even more wait, games. Wait, Yoshik, he's coming, but they're so low in level one. Yeah, this is really rough as Beryl is going to break those chains. Pioshik's going to make his way in. Can it still work out? There's a lot of minions here as well, because this is quite dangerous. Hoyt not going to get stunned up. That's a good sidestep. And also Pioshik missing that one, unfortunately. So we'll have to back away. Elm now with a lot of space to roam. We'll head up here towards the uh, chicken oh. camp and might even just three buff Pioshik here. Oh, 100%. Yeah, no, that, that, that buff is gone. And that is a big risk, right? Because if that gank pays off and you're able to punish Teddy and, and Hoyt as they try to crash in that wave, then you're not going to feel too bad about it. But it's a huge risk that you take with your pathing, because Pioshik, he didn't path from, say, top side to bot. No, he cleared his entire bot side and then pathed all the way back, all around the Dragon Pit. And then if that doesn't work out, then Ellen says, well, thank you very, very, very much. I will gladly uh, partake in a feast of jungle minions I like this here from Barrel, but the damage has already been done, right? Like, yeah. uh, Alum is just going to be able to walk out of it easily. Oh, King, you can't die to this. Oh, no. He's going to get knocked up, and he's already down so incredibly low. The hop comes through, but that is flashes, and so easily the kill comes through. And yeah, you're exactly right. That was way too telegraphed for King to die. Uh, can't happen and already. DRX, the issues that we have seen previously still persisting. And I wonder what the communication is there, right? Because if Beryl 
gets over that pit and he sees that the Krugs have just been taken. You know LMS topside for a fact. Then Kingen, you can't get taken down like that. Not sure what happened there in the comms of DRX, but it's a clear sign that with how things are looking right now, Deft also getting punished a little bit for the roam that Beryl made. Although I have to say, with uh, the overall state of the CS, he's still not going to be feeling too bad. But Bioshik now going to be behind fairly, uh, a fairly large amount in terms of experience, even though the actual creeps don't look as bad as it might. And an early kill for Keen, who has gone for the damage build, right? He has the combat. Yeah. And this actually can be a matchup where if the Gragas gets really far ahead early, that spacing that King is going to be able to do is not going to be nearly as, as impactful. No, exactly right. Now, Elam, he's going to try his luck here on the bottom side, and he was seen by the Lantern, or at least by something. And that means that uh, DRX are just going to back away immediately. This bottom lane, very, very important, but as we can see already, He's certainly going awry for DRX elsewhere on the map. Merc Tread's completed now for Zeko, and he's feeling a little bit more feisty here in this matchup. Having a bit of time. Does want that level 6 before he can really start to grab some control. So far, he's been doing all right. Actually, a head in farm by just a little bit. Beryl is put on a leash just for a moment. He does manage to take some CS as the Flame Chompers come on in. Piercing Arrow is going to go wide, and Ellen unable to find too much here on the bottom side of the map. DRX able to shove out mid. Yoshik's able to get through his jungle yet again and is now up on uh, uh, camps just a little. And as Kane still just, he just bucks the trend a little bit when it comes to the uh, the way matchups are supposed to work because uh, his Gragas certainly faring a whole lot better into the Nar. Golden Dodge there by King and who's gone for the second Doran Bla uh, Doran's Blade in an attempt to still maintain a certain level of relevancy in this lane, but. Actually, with that lost chapter already finished, Keen can just shove these waves in, and it's going to be really hard as long as he plays around that Narbar. Gragas is really hard to punish, especially with explosive cask available to him. Overall, though, uh, we actually do see Zeka being able to find a lead for himself in this lane. Fake. Yeah. Not quite sure what happened there, but not what you're looking for. And even on the bot side, Teddy, uh, with the amount of attention that was uh, that was found, and Barrel going on a merry-go-round trip all around Summoner's Rift. Kind of surprised to not see the leads be a little bit more pronounced there in DRX. He had that behind, but it's not that much uh, as I think it should have been. Uh, yeah, Piochik. it's just first blood. It's half of a first blood, yeah. actually, uh, as far as Kong Kong's lead. So you can see the farm definitely working out here for DRX. Yeah, Yoshik also has fully ca uh, ca caught up, right, as, as Alan has focused on trying to look for a bot side gank. Didn't work out. And if Viego actually ahead in terms of farm. Yeah, feels great. And of course, Viego does farm a little bit faster than Jarvan, you'd say. And also, Jarvan generally likes to set up tents more. I think it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Just that, in terms of overall impact of that early game, I thought it was going to be more pronounced. But Kwangdong not really been able to leverage that as much as uh, I think they could have possibly done. Yeah. Ooh, cannon going to be missed there. Jonas Strong immediately leaves the area. Like it a lot. And Zeka looking for another back opportunity, 76 CS. Really, really farming out very, very well on the Akali. As maybe it is just an Akali thing, farming really well into Victor. Um, certainly not how it works in my games, but... I don't know. I don't know Aww. what to say, man. Uh, as Death throwing some vision down. If we manage to get the sweeper out. And Elm not going to be seen, I don't believe. This piercing arrow is not going to quite find barrel. So it will be the... Uh, the Poke Varus as well, we saw, I believe it was Henna, um, go for a bit of the Rage Blade option, um, which is definitely far less popular. But it honestly, Varus himself is just pretty unpopular right now. Yeah, it it's makes sense, I think, because uh, he was playing a Fred of Rion comp, so he had like five frontliners, I want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, I think it was fine. four, uh, based on the amount of players in the game. But No, no, he was frontline as well. Oh, he was frontline. Because he, oh, he, he went shield bow and then he went straight to the as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, jokes aside, that was, of course, uh, I think in that situation, really nice. I think here it's understandable. You have a little bit more lane pressure with the lethality build. You can shove easy. And Ooh, I don't think you're getting a lot of vision. autos off against that DRX comp. Oh boy. Very uh, I was looking for it, yeah. And every, uh, all of the information is now available. As that ward, very, very cheeky. Picking up a lot of information here for Kwandong Freaks as Ellen moving on over. 
Control wards going down, both teams. King and Smaga. Yeah. Throwing some houses around, things like that. Actually, it's just the concrete. Now oh. Quando Freaks are going to come on in. Can King and actually get in there at the right time to find the Nar? There it is! Exactly the same spot as Zayas in the last game. But this time, it did not work out. The Super Mega Death Rocket goes entirely wide as the heal comes out from Deft relatively late as well. And the Rift Herald is claimed by Guangdong Freaks. <laughs> it looked like exactly the same play, but this time Guangdong were not hindered by it. Or well, big difference there, and that could have been, I think, even more one-sided for the Guangdong Freaks. As look at this ultimate from Teddy here. They see him coming, he's on vision, but regardless, Yoshi can barrel immediately get blown up, and then King and uses the last of his Narbar, which is nice, but because the coordination isn't there like we saw. And that's a T1 game. Uh, Zeka not actually able to do as much damage as I think he would have wanted to while they were stunned. Yeah. Because of that, it is still Guangdong Freaks. They get a favorable trade and they pick up the Eye of the Herald. I'm not entirely sure what uh, Pyoshik was, was doing there, but unfortunately just was a non-factor in that fight. King and trying his best. But even the Super Mega Death yeah. Rocket just trying to go snipe off a target that was already dead, things like that. And Certainly not working. It wasn't Eric. vision. That was yeah. the, that was the key thing. Like he, Teddy wasn't throwing a change of corruption uh, out of fog. Like it's notoriously a really hard ultimate to hit because it's so slow, right? The the yeah. miss up, the, the projectile speed uh, should be easily dodgeable, especially for two players that at the time both had flash. And it's these type of moments that I think could change the course of a fight. Because if both Pioshi and Barrel don't immediately die there. Uh, and they flash out of it, they make sure that they don't get trapped by that Victor combination of the Gravity Field as well as the Chaos Storm. Yeah. And the fight might go completely differently. Well, Kyoshik still with his flash, actually. In fact, all the flashes outside of Kingans are still available here for DRX uh, for this potential ocean fight. Zeka has a lot of friends here in the mid lane, does need to be a bit careful. Good sidestep there from Beryl gets him out of the way of the Piercing Arrow. It's just going to be a bit of a back. Not lo looking for the dragon just yet. So he's going to need to be a little bit careful, but is. So he's going to be fine. And it looks like Ellen's going to be able to take this opportunity to either head down towards his bottom lane or take the Drake. As Depp's going to take a lantern, and it might just be the Drake that they settle for as we move on in. Okay, no. Still sticking around. Yeah, wanting to try and go for this dive, and Pyoshik's on the top side of the map. I don't think that they have information of that, so this is still relatively dangerous for Ellen, but he gets the bad news that he's on a ward, and he is just going to back away. I feel like that's a wasted opportunity, right? That was almost a minute in total spend looking for a gank on an Akali with Flash and Ultimate. Yeah. Uh, and then subsequently a bot lane that was underneath the turret and also has most of the sums up. I think Dragon could have died twice. Yes. Well, I don't know about twice, but definitely like one and a half times. Yeah. Which is enough to, to, to get the buff. Yeah, to get the dragon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Kwangdong Freaks not excelling in pushing their lead uh, the way that I think we were expecting, but also maybe that's a little bit too much to ask of a team that very clearly is still finding their footing. And at least in terms of mechanics, I thought that first team fight... Yeah, was, very, very nice. It was very well synergized, right? There was no hesitation from LM. The moment that the Ultimates came down, everyone piled on top of that DRX uh, duo of the jungle and the support. And that, to me, uh, gives me even more so than whatever comps, whatever uh, scaling elements in this game might suggest uh, the edge to Kwangdong Freaks thus far. But in terms of gold, it's not that big or that relevant of a lead. No, and uh, as the game goes on, I think Deft is going to be far more relevant than Teddy as far as just the champions that they're playing, right? Um, so if DRX can play around that, then there is still hope. So DRX fans, don't uh, don't worry too much just yet, but if another fight like uh, what we saw in the river happens again, it's certainly worrying territory. Um, because if DRX aren't coordinated, then it's likely Deft just gets picked off and dies, right? And things like this, um, which isn't going to help out. Kwangdong now pushing down, and maybe, just maybe, they'll actually take this dragon, as there's so much vision for DRX, so DRX will know exactly what's going on. Um, they but can. with Pyoshik backing, yeah, yeah, it's just I not going to be it. I don't think they really can, right? Because both Pyoshik and Zaka desperately needed the back uh, as they have finished their first mythics, and uh, that means that Deft is getting shoved in, can't really contest the priority, and the shove against a Varus. 
Uh, and then the same thing happened on mid. So DRX, yeah, it's nice that you finish your mythics, but you're going to give up the Drake. Although, to be fair, again, it, it already should have died. So maybe yeah. as DRX, like, eh. Yeah. He may take those as uh, Chains of Corruption are going to land, gets onto death, and he just explodes. That's going to be secured by Hoyt as now Pioshik finds himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Barrel included in that one. It's a double kill, in, in fact, for Hoyt, who's 2-0-2 two <laughs> two now. This karma is mega fed. And DRX, Whoa. it's whoopsie after whoopsie, just a little bit. And it is such an unfortunate timing because for DRX, again, it's just not coming together. And, and I want to reiterate that uh, you see it happen in so many little things, right? The team is just all off doing their own thing. Zekka and Pioshik backing and picking up the Mythics is fine, but then why are Deft and Barrel in a position to get engaged on, right? If you actually have the Akali, level 11, has the first item finished, if you have a Viego there, then that skirmish might be playable, but instead you're just beyond, um, as we see Pioshik even there, right? And then in the backside we see it, but it's the same issue that happened last time around, where people are just getting caught by Teddy's Chains of Corruption, and I... I yeah. I can't really excuse that, right? That, that is not something where if you have flash, that should not happen. Deft uh, has been a little bit um, greedy with his, with his summoner spells in the past, and that has uh, certainly continued into that moment right there. Still, not 100% uh, end of the world or anything like that. It's 1.3k, nothing really to worry about is now DRX thinking about starting off this Rift Herald. Kingen still charging that Narbar, but he's on the bottom side of the map. Teleported at the ready. Keen does not have his. So DRX playing around TP advantage should mean that they should be able to collect this one. And it looks like Quandom Freaks are going to give them the adequate levels of respect. There's another Chains of Corruption is going to land. It's magnetized here for Teddy, but it's still going to be Shirley going over to DRX. Nice find out by DRX, able to pick that objective up. And... Well respected, I'd say. I don't think Squang, you can really move in there because of the teleport play that you made earlier, even with King and not having his Narbar uh, to mostly full. And there's really no need, because while I do agree with you that in terms of uh, scaling Deft, his Jinx is always going to be an absolute menace when we get to the team fight stage, at the same time, I think that you have an AP Gragas that is always going to be relevant to the damage Victor skills very well. And then it becomes more of a question of execution, which thus far, as Kwangdong, they've definitely been yeah. uh, on the better end of. And for Kwangdong, I want to start to see them stack Drakes, because I do think that it's something that I always talk about when we look at Nas, is that if you are the team playing Nas and you don't have Engage, it means that your positioning on the map and you getting first prior on objectives is way more important, because your plays are going to be a lot more telegraphs, and if you don't have vision control to find a deep flank and your opponents have flash, then that big Maganar play, that's one of the big reasons why you won the pick outside of pressure and lane, which as we can see, hasn't really panned out. Um, I mean, he's even. That's, um... Exactly. <laughs> then you're in <laughs> deep trouble. Uh, yeah. Just shows how different um, certain series can be. As uh, Teddy, yeah, catches that wave in mid. We'll give DRX the opportunity to move towards that top side, but it looks like King, uh, Keen is not going to be bothered by it. Fate moves down to catch this wave delivered to him by Kingen. One minute and a half is likely to be when we see something more, as Hextech Drake for DRX is exactly what they want. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, ability haste. Really nice for well, basically everyone on the team. Actually, the attack speed is kind of kind of meh, kind of kind of so-so. Um, it's not the end of the world. Take free stats wherever you can get them, and that means that. There are a couple of Drakes available here. Obviously, Infernal Rift kind of goes without saying. Yep. It is a huge nuisance for DRX. It mitigates how much King is going to be able to do with the map opening up a lot more. Uh, and then in addition to that, more damage for things like the Fire Teeth Arras are just uh, generally unpleasant. As Fate, second time we've seen this, is going for a Lich Bane second, even with the Crown. Yeah. We're really going to be looking to weave in a lot of those Ordos as uh, the fights progress. Certainly um, was one of our more aggressive builds yesterday. I personally enjoyed it a lot. Seeing a bit more damage, it's a lot of fun. However, uh, it's with the crown this time around. I think it was Ludens and the Lich Bane that uh, we saw last time. It's pretty fun. Anyway, uh, Kingen trying to hold on to this wave on the bottom side. Pyoshik just desperately trying to get through the jungle and is doing so pretty efficiently. As we can see in the farm, he's actually ahead by quite a few camps. 
is now slinking into the river. Eight seconds before that Hextech Drake comes up. Good vision to be gained there by Pondon Freaks. As Teddy throws out Scryer. And now the rest of Quantum Freaks all grouped up as five in an instant. And now Kingen, look at that Narbar. Absolutely perfect. He's standing on a control ward as well. Gives himself away with that boomerang flying out. It's now DRX have to deal with the mid wave and Quandon. They can collapse onto the Nar, who does hop away. It was pretty dangerous there, but he is going to survive. Should be all right. But the rotation over is through darkness here for DRX. Teddy slinks back in and he is in control of a whole lot of this boat. This, uh, these piercing arrows are starting to hurt, especially when they're coming from darkness. And Kingen, now the Mega Nar comes in and that is not the timing that he was looking for. As Pyoshik actually walking in a little bit late. As the concrete comes down, there's a chance of corruption once again. He'll need to try and click on that land, but it's not going to work as the Nar goes down. Depp able to get some free damage as Zekka looks for the backflips. Will get it. Doesn't quite do enough work on the back end, though, of that perfect execution. And Teddy free hitting now. Getting some flashes out of DRX as the piercing arrow hits onto Deft. And DRX with one missing, as well as Quandon Freaks, but the health bar is much bigger on Quandong's side. Yeah, I think Quandong can push in the turret and possibly also play. Alan might make his way over very, very quickly, and I don't think you can do a lot here as DRX. And again, while that was happening, Pioshik still holding the Eye of the Herald, feeling obliged to just drop that towards the top side, walk into the jungle. And you can do that. That in of itself is excusable. But then King and can't be that far up. And this is, again, the disjointedness that we've been seeing from DRX that has really been costing them a lot as King so far up here. And it's, again, third time in a row. Ultimate from Teddy. This time, though, it does come from the fog. Yep. Um, but it remains a question why DRX is that far up. And now over the warrior, it's really hard to deal with and get through all the damage that's available for Guangdong Freaks, who surely can get themselves a second Drake here. Because now for DRX, the moment has passed. I don't think they can contest. And I wonder what soul we're going to see. Yeah, looking forward to uh, a Cloud Soul, personally. I'll be very happy about that. I have a feeling it'll be Mountain. We haven't had a lot of Infernals. That's true, not a lot of Infernals. Uh, what will it be this time? No, it's a Cloud. You're welcome. Had to do it, Adler. I did indeed. Why? Um, well, I mean, obviously DRX also knew that it was a cloud. That's why they didn't fight for the Hextech soul because they wanted to get four oh, of the best that, drakes in the game. That, mm, that, uh... You gotta go fast, Chronicler, okay? <laughs> you gotta go fast. Just wanna give Defs' Jinx more time. Yeah. That's all he, that's all, that's all he needs. Mm -hmm. All he wants. Okay. No, he just also wants as many clouds as possible because then he can run around really fast. And what does Jinx really like doing when she gets excited? run even faster. Exactly. Mm. And so therefore, the faster she's running, the happier yeah. she'll be. It's just, it's canon. I think it's, you know, this this sort of logic is just almost too obvious. As uh, DRX, yeah, they're not in a great spot. This game, all jokes aside, 1.5K, it's not the end of the world or anything like that, but it just feels like Quantum Freaks are making better choices around this map, getting better control, doing their homework a little bit more effectively than that of DRX thus far this oh. game. So don't like this build from King and going for the Gill Force. Uh, can, or sorry, the Gill Force, the um, uh, Gold Drinker. Thank you very much. There um, it is. Considering what you're playing into, right? Uh, because if all goes well, the one moment you're going to find is go in aggressively. And Poseidon doesn't provide you with nearly as much as... Boy, well, getting a little bit feisty there, but I think they actually yep. want to go without vision. Yeah, Beryl just there to try and assist, potentially. Zekka underneath the turret should be able to deal with these minions. Go to the side, just try and make sure it's all going to be okay. Another Chains of Corruption lands. Teddy just does not miss these at all. As Beryl has to flash to get out of the way. Teddy's deadly on this uh, Lethality Varus. It's and the King first Varus. There we go. Yeah, the first Varus I actually feel like is doing, doing a really good job. And like actually doing what you'd expect from Lethality Varus that we've seen. Thus yeah. Far. It turns out if you hit every single one of your skill shots without fail, he's pretty good. Just hit all of them. <laughs> yeah. Nah, he missed a couple. There were a couple of piercing arrows that were avoided, but the uh, Chains of Corruption have just been fantastic this game. They have a bit of free time here in this mid lane. Teddy will pick up the wave. The Siege on the top lane has not really been working thus far. Zekka has just been able to catch a whole bunch of these waves. He's still ahead in farm by just a little bit as well, which is uh, good news. 
for DRX fans. Pyoshik, oh dear, he'll take a lantern. That'll get him out. It was almost just put on a leash and locked down, but that's what happened. And actually, after that battle, Zeka is now 101 on Akali, which is yeah. very good news for him. And if they find some of these mid game skirmishes and he's able to, you know, lock down a priority target and destroy Teddy, take him out. Then it could be that DRX find a way back into this game with yeah. their Jinx insurance policy. It's definitely with the pace that this game has gone thus far. Uh, a game where I think we're going to see a lot more items. Because to me it feels like Kwang is saying, okay, we have a game plan and it is play for Soul and then get Elder and win the game. Yep. Uh, and DRX's game plan, which I wow. think consists of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not Clouds, Atlas. I want them to not, fight over the Drake. Not everyone cares as much about Cloud Drakes as you. I think they just want to hit their free item spike and theft and then try and team fight and hope that works. I, I don't feel like they should try and take on more. That is a very clear, achievable plan. Uh, but I think the overall priority and the over control in this match still in the hands of Kwang Dong Freaks. I think the DRX is going to be really hard to consistently get onto these fights uh, yep. without being poked down. And uh, even if you do get on, there's the explosive cast, there's Karma Shield, there's Fate that's going to do a lot of AE damage, whether or not you're hidden in your Twilight Shroud. Uh, so I think DRX can definitely still win here. It's not like oh, yeah. Guangdong are running away with this game, but based on the fights we've seen thus far, it's hard to imagine. And I'm imagining a lot of things because we get a lot of time and space. Yeah. I think Kwandong aren't running away with the game. They are slowly walking away. I feel like they're walking with the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're not running away. They're like, the, you know, the in those the action movies, you know, yeah. the cool people movies, like where it's in slow motion, you see them walking. And this is like ultra slow motion walking away with the game. That's, that's what they're doing. But they're looking real cool while they do it. Um, certainly like not the, high octane. Yeah, when the, uh, when the astronauts like make their way over to the space. Yeah, yeah, there it is. There it is. So they're both doing that, but then they're walking towards each other. Yeah. And we're waiting for resolution when they meet each other, but they yeah. never do because it just keeps slowing down the closer we get. Scientists are still trying to calculate the space between them, and it's uh, it's actually very very difficult to come up with. As King in, might just be uh, okay, taken down to about 40% health, and then hit Mega. And that was lucky. But now they know that uh, he doesn't have his Mega available. He was also backing in a very greedy position as Super Mega Death Rocket to come through and try and soften up the Kondong Freaks as that is the first chance of Corruption to miss. And that might actually turn around this fight. Zekka coming on in. There's the teleport from King. And remember, no Narbar whatsoever as can Ellen lock this one up? And no, it's actually Teddy that does it. So that is going to be Soul Point locked down for Kondong Freaks. And they'll just run all the way out. They're like, nope, okay, this is fine. We did it. We know what they fight. wanted. Why would we? Yoshik, that's dangerous, that positioning. There's no turret there, remember. And Ellen's going to steal away the jungle. That was beautiful from Quando Freaks. Oh, another successful heist, Atlas. Indeed. No action required. That's not what we do here. <laughs> it's not about aggression, it's about passively winning the game. And Quangdong are doing that pretty, pretty effectively. The gold is basically even. One Cloud Drake is going to mean nothing. However, the control of the map with the fact that you have to force your opponent to battle you for the soul is the important part. Unless the Rx don't care and just want to give away the soul and then maybe they won't fight for it. I'm not entirely sure. But this is this is feeling like the LCK staple which is give four Drakes and flip at Elder. Oh yeah, that's what it is. That's what that's what's happening here, right? That's the movie you're yep. watching. Yep. Yeah. So, um, that's that's how it's how, how the best do it. <laughs> uh, um, um, can I have an easier question? Um, <laughs> uh, it's okay. like it's like okay, okay. So Secret agent if you no 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 um, easier question. Okay. If you have from point A <laughs> DRX approaching mm -hmm. right at um, fifteen T mo. Wait wait. A DRX are approaching from point A. Yes. Let me write a diagram. Uh, okay. They're, they're approaching yep. fifteen T mos a minute. Right. 15 teamers. But as they minute. as they approach the middle point, they slow down by three teamers. Okay, the closer they get. Okay, they they keep slowing down. Uh, so they were decelerating. As we're gonna have a little bit of a fight here. Deft is gonna flash this time. Very nice. 
That is going to get him out of danger. However, now will not have that very key cooldown for the next ensuing fight if it actually does come through. King in wanting to front line, but the inner turret is well and truly dead. Death will go down, Beryl goes back. DRX, they lose a turret and a flash and a lot of map control from that. As, okay, Pyoshik does find the stun here onto Teddy, who does try and turn this, and Keenan might actually just die to this one. Yep, Keen says, come back here, but the rest of his team does not. The rest of his team have just left him alone, and Keen will die. Two and a half minutes on the Drake, but the Baron is live. We'll see whether DRX actually fancy themselves. A bit of, uh, a bit of that. I don't know if they can. Teddy's Lodo, and Seka has finally found a good flank angle. Yeah. A lot of danger and a lot of vision. The homework that DRX did on the top side of the map has definitely been fantastic, as you can see. Our Nofries have to limp their way into the darkness. As Kingen, with a very nice Naba, spotted there on vision, as you can see. And the rest of Quandon Freaks are just going to try and chase him out. Beryl, can he find a hook? Kingen, can he get in there? Keen, 10 seconds, has to pee. Yeah, there's the flash hook, and it lands onto Elm. He's going to flash away immediately. The box does absolutely nothing, but DRX, can they get themselves in? They know that they're on a timer, because Keen can teleport, and he is going to do so now. Quandong Freaks trying to come on through and start this fight off for themselves. Super Mega Death Rocker doesn't do too much. And no real commitment <coughs> from either side. Nothing happened. We're back at where we started. Yeah, and so 15 back to the teamers map. per minute. Yes. And they're decelerating at how many? Oh, uh, wait, we, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta. Okay, you can break this. Quick, in. quick, quick look at this. Um, as Teddy getting a little bit greedy for the arrow. And then here, it's a miscommunication where Keen could have definitely just used that cast, or cast credit to make sure that everyone could get out. And that miscommunication that leads to a roundabout of um, flashes and hooks and, and King and trying to flank. None of it actually leads to anything. Do you know what happened? DRX caught up in gold by 150. People are saying so, that nothing happened so, to that last fight. That is 100% untrue. I am sorry, and I will do that. After. Yeah, good. Thank you. Appreciate that. As DRX start off the Baron and stop the Baron. Teleport to come through from Fate. Yoshik has kept this one leashed as over the wall is King. Good Narbar positioning, but not good health bar positioning. That <laughs> burst. He just keeps walking into Fate. Yeah? Fate just keeps blowing him up. Fate has a habit Stop of going. catching up to you. Uh, Chronicle, it's just how it works. As Yoshik having to get out of here does end up using the ult to escape. Does still have the flash available. King in in Meganar right now, but Kondo Freak's so good at spacing, not allowing that Nar to get in at the moment that he wants to. And now it's just going to be Mini once again. Teddy chasing him out. And he's uh, like, get out of your jungle. It's not your jungle. He does have his uh, get soul. teleport available. Yeah. And yeah, they should be able to make their way down to the soul if they'd like to. Yeah, that, that's going to be the actual end result of this. So. That was more, you know, not necessarily a lot happening. Um, and then the result was Quantum Freaks take the, the yes. Cloud Soul. So, back to Moth. Yeah, okay, so 15 <laughs> teamers per... That's yes. how they're traveling. They're yeah. traveling... Which direction are they uh, they're, traveling? They're, so they're traveling to point B. Ah, where, point B is where, over here. Yeah, where Quantum Freaks ah, okay. is making their way over towards point A. At so they're, they're about they're, they're to going, they're going intersect. To, yes. okay. that's, that's the goal. Well, right? King in. That was almost worth play by playing, but not quite. Okay, so how fast is uh, how, are Kwangdong moving from. Kwangdong are moving at 18 Timos. Ooh, okay. 18 Timos a minute. Uh, so they're going a little bit faster. But if they don't meet in the middle, Kwangdong freaks will take the northern passage. And DRX will take the Southern Passage, just making them trade places. Whoa, this is getting very complicated. And, and, and also, and, and, if and they're traveling at different speeds, they're not going to meet in the middle. That's, so that's just... That's, so that's the problem. Like, how long does it take for them to actually meet? Because if they can see each other, they'll, they'll go in, right? Valdez, he, he stated a rule earlier. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was something about... Um, math is really fun on stream. Um, <laughs> math, you definitely do it. Yeah, something like that. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think that what will happen is that Quandong Freaks will get to the middle a little bit before DRX do. And then? And then they'll take the northern route um, towards the Baron Pit. 
<laughs> Take the Baron as Pioshek has to get out with this off break. Ooh, Kane's gonna flash. It's a big cooldown. Actually really big. Yeah. Five minutes until he'll have that one back again. See whether they type in an all chat. Dude, can we just wait five? Chill for five, everyone. Chill for five. Uh, gotta get that cooldown back up as DRX currently uh, behind the ex exact same amount. They didn't, they didn't manage to get any dragons. But there's a really cool dragon coming up right now, and that could have been their plan. Give four drakes, take Elder with Yes. Game. You know? Like I've seen this like strat. It's minutes. beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you did. You did. It's a strategy. Whether it's a good one, we're not entirely sure. However, it is one. As Keen is going to complete his Zonya's Hourglass to make sure that he can stopwatch whenever he wants to. And... Oh, this is going to wait out that... wait out that flash. Should we even be talking about flashes being used? Because, uh, I mean, death is back up. Again. Well, yeah, when it comes to things like the Gragas, it's actually really important for how he carries himself in teamfights, right? Because Gragas is one of those picks where the body slam, unless coming from Fog, is something that's very answerable. And that's why you see, especially in high-level play, that uh, unless the body slams are used reactively, the body slam generally will be combined with flash if you want to guarantee, if you're not talking about just trading patterns in lane. So that actually is a considerable lack of pressure specifically for Keen. The problem is, of course, that LM has all the engage he possibly want. So in the grand scheme of things, it still shouldn't matter as much as it's a party of wave clear for both sides. Yeah, Deft is actually just going to lock down this turret. Should be able to do so. There we go. So they traded for the inner turret on the top side of the map, but the bottom lane inner turret is also going down. So DRX trading up right now. Currently they're behind 1.2k. But that brings us back to... Yep. Yeah, there we go. Back to 300. Beautiful. Because it can't really... It should never escape the, you know, 300 to 500 range. It's how this game goes. It's extraordinarily <laughs> even. <laughs> In all extraordinarily things. even. Yeah. A really big point now hit for that as well uh, with the Infinity Edge. At this point, if there is a team fight and Kwang Lung Freaks don't take care of Deft, uh, he can with two free autos blow up the entirety yeah of it's getting freaks. really scary this oh, is part of spike is just yeah. massive and we're, we're joking around and things like that because the game is moving slowly but honestly a jinx composition that can just cruise to jinx having four items you will take that you know if that's a fortune that you wake up to in the morning and you are offered it on a platter you'd be like all right yeah that sounds good that sounds like a great way to to play game one you know if i was drx and that was an option heck yeah yeah, but I don't know how much they can enable the Jinx, because this is the big thing. Outside of specifically Barrel playing Guardian, and that does, of course, provide some survivability. But look at the amount of damage, poke, and dive available for Guangdong, right? Uh, yeah. Especially because Keen, look at that cooldown on Flash. It's almost up, has Lucidity Boots. Um, not quite sure if he went Cosmic Insight. Might very well have done so, which would oh, be yeah. even more... Uh, rapidly available, and if that flash is available again and Deft gets hit by anything, it's a big, big problem. King and has Mega. I don't know whether they knew exactly what was going on. Some poke coming down there, but doesn't do a whole lot of work. Of course, Inspire, one heck of an ability there from yeah. the Karma. Oh, this is uh, the, the bot lane is heavily shoved in. Yeah. Uh, he's gonna get some free damage on the turret. And you think you take this down reasonably fast just because of the victor, but hope yeah, from yeah, the Rex is gonna, bad. They're going to back away. Kyoshik going to dash out of the way of the Chains of Corruption. Another one is going to miss here. Looks like DRX have got their dancing shoes on now, as that's a good stun. Hook is going to come through as well as Keen moved out of position, and Kyoshik immediately gets out. That's the ulti. He's like, nope, not having any of this. 30 seconds on the Elder Drake. DRX, this is what you planned for. The gold is 100% even between these two teams. There is a Cloud Soul on Quandom Freaks. One of the reasons why Cloud Soul is oh. so fantastic is it allows the gold to show more about evenness of power level. Oh, see what I did there? Yeah. 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 Took a negative and I I, I I admire that quality. Thank you. Atlas. Thank you. I think it's important when mm -hmm. casting the MCK at times. <laughs> As now all the game has boiled down to this one point. This the one moment. This is it. Actually, it actually is. Like the one no, whoever yeah. wins this fight wins the game. That's Kingin. Good Nabar positioning. But Kwandong have been very good 
at just avoiding Daddy. the situation. We've got a big zoom in. I was a little bit frightened for a moment as these piercing arrows are important. The Narbar, I believe, they've, uh, yes, King is still so ready. He's juggled it nicely this time as they're funneling into a choke. Not necessarily what you want to do, but Def takes way too much damage. We'll now have to try and heal up on these popcorn chickens. Delicious. Not a lot of life steal in the build right now. As Keen looking for King in. He's able to turn it relatively well as he gets booped back. Very tanky, but is he tanky enough to just soak five members? Fundon Freak's not actually just going to engage into it. 4,000 damage already done here by Teddy. As we slowly but surely eke out this moment. And DRX need to try and start something. They need to allow Def to get some auto attacks in there as King. And he comes back. The Nabar is done. Don't flip it. Yeah, Zekka's off to the side. Oh, no. Beryl taking a bit of damage here. And this is all about Teddy. How much poke can he actually land? How much can he force DRX out of this area? as the Elder Drake's going to reset. Of course it does. The Zaps are coming in. Def not quite able to find too many of them. King in, snag. There's the flash body slam. Good flash from King and gets himself out of the way. Is Pyoshik, he finds himself a stun as well. And now the Narbar is almost ready. That's the four-man Nar. In goes Zek. He's been waiting for this moment and picks up the 900 gold. And this is exactly what we were talking about. Zeka picks up the double in the back line. And this is it, ladies and gentlemen. This is how you win League of Legends. You give four dragons, take the best one and win the game. All you need, Atlas, is one, one team fight. That's exactly. all it takes. If you do it right, if you pick your opportunities, one is all you need. And the Rx, they find the one. I have, look, I respect it so much. Everything about what happened this game was just, it was just leading up to that one moment. And you can imagine in the comms, it's like, no, no, I, I win the last fight. I carry the last fight. And that was probably being said by both Zekka and Deft. And it was all about Zekka in the end. Man, that was sick. That was sick. It was a lot of waiting, but I actually felt like the payoff was worth it. Are you with me? No? Not quite sure. No, I need more time. I need more time. I need more time. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I have an answer to that. Um, and, and picking a POG was very hard for me, that game. Yeah, that's a that's um, a toughie. That is that is definitely a toughie. I, I, Who I won the last team fight? Uh, I'd say Kingen, but it might be Zekka, right? Like, I think I think both are fine. Kingen also made the big whoopsie at the beginning. He made, no, no, no. There were, there so, were right? Like, there it's were a hard. Lot of whoopsies. So, like, but, th but this is the problem. Do you count the approaches that didn't work out or the one that did? And I think for Guangdong, their main thing going into the next game needs to be decisiveness, because I feel like in yeah. so, so yeah. much of this game, they were the ones in control. If you actually hard pull the trigger on that Drake, the moment that King is out of Mega and gone. But if you look at, like, the, the my favorite thing about this game, my favorite thing about this game is the fact that the gold graph will literally be a flat line. Yes. It's just a, often we talk about heart monitors, you know, where it's all going up and down, no. it's throws, counter throws. No, this is we lost the patient. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, at the very end, he came back to life and killed a Nexus. That is basically what happened. And uh, of course, DRX fans finally able to breathe based on one game win. They still have a long way to go they're going to win the series because one more of these has to happen. And look at that. That's the gold graph I'm talking about. Yep. That, that, that's a gold graph. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what's fantastic? So uh, on Sundays, it is we, we don't get to have all of the analyst chairs um, no. and, and the, the collaborative carpet space, unfortunately. But we do get it after this game. <laughs> we do get it after this game, and that is the main thing. As uh, we are going to go to a short break, ladies and gentlemen. When we get back, the analyst chairs and collaborative carpet space break down that incredible game.
나 본다. 아, 오케이. 걸로 걸로 건너 볼로 건. 천천히 해봐. 천천히 해봐. 천천히 해봐. 이거 싸움 볼수 있어. 나 이거 영원체 갖고 있다. 갈 거야, 갈 거야. 걸릴 수 있어. 그래, 그래, 그래. 가자, 가자, 가자. 앞에부터, 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 앞에부터. 앞라인부터. 앞라인부터, 앞라인부터. 바로 잡을 수 있나? 나이스! 미드 가자, 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 미드 미드 가자, 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 미드 sky falls and the sun turns black when the earth calls and don't look back hold me closer can you feel my heart we can conquer and win back all the tide is changing floods are Run on the edge and across the flames. The world we knew is not the same. Feel your soul, feel your desire. We walk through the fire. Leave this place and watch it burn. Let the king and we return. See the sun so bright at night. We walk through the fire. Ascending from the ashes, bonfires in the hay. Standing tall now, your feet are on the ground. You fought your demons, nothing breaks you down. The tide is changing, floods are coming, clear to see. The page is turning, can you feel this energy? Through the darkness, they are fires in the night. Nothing can break us when we rise. We run on the edge and across the flames. The world we knew is not the same. Feel your soul, feel your desire. Walk through the fire. Leave this place and watch it burn.
Welcome back, everybody. We are here on the analyst chairs and collaborative carpet space plus imaginary desk that most of you can't see. It's me, Valdez, with Wolf, and uh, we're going to break down that game uh, that we did just have. Uh, it was a game of League of Legends. And there's one thing to mention, you know, DRX has been on a losing streak in games and matches 11 in a row. They were able to finally break that up with this win of games. Now they're going to be looking for that break of the losing streak of yeah. matches. So just to put this to, into perspective and make sure everybody understands what this means, there are six series of League of Legends in the hole and they had an 11 back-to-back -back games. Every one of those six losses was a 0-2, so they have not won a single game in 11 games until just now. But they were able to pull it off. I think we should start talking about the draft here. Jinx coming through for Def. Def doesn't usually like to play this champion unless he knows it's going to be a win. It's kind of a meme in Korea. Like he's not going to pull it out unless he's absolutely sure. And they were able to take it in the end. Look at these two drafts. I thought, you know, in a lot of ways, Liv Sandbox's draft looked more well-rounded. It's what you and I like to call a model composition. Very, very well-rounded. Very great front-to-back team fighting. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of... It's not Liv Sandbox. What am I saying? Kwangdung Freaks. That's the wrong uh, logo there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there was a lot of... by production. Got him. <laughs> there was a lot of uh, K-ramming going on from the yeah. Kwangdung Freaks. This continues to be an issue, Valdez. It really does. I mean, there was no focus on the side lanes at all. They sit in the mid lane as five. Uh, Victor would go up and push one lane, and that would be it. Um, we do have this nice, uh, once again, just showing off Def's win rate on the Jinx. Uh, here's Def and Jinx as well. 42 and four now, and uh, yeah, he's pretty good at this champion. And like you were saying, I mean, he didn't want to play it unless they were. he knew they were going to win, and apparently he knew this time. Yeah, I mean, there was not a whole lot of gameplay happening until that last fight. Um, talking about Deft's Jinx, he was a little bit disconnected. If we jump into our first highlight, you'll see that there was a little bit of a, an error there on the bottom side of the map. But this is when Kwangdo Freaks had a lead already, and the DRX were trying to look for plays. Teddy hit so many of these chains of corruptions throughout the entire game, and this is one of those huge moments where DRX end up losing out big time. Kyoshik's able to escape, but can't be said of Barrel there. And so Kwangdo have this massive lead. They, I mean, in terms of map control, they could theoretically have. They have an objective lead. Only the third Drake was ever contested by DRX. The other ones were just given for free. But like you said, no side laning. Just grouping up in mid until we had our final fight, uh, which, you know, I guess we should go ahead and put it up like... <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> this we had the first fight. That was the first fight of the game. This was the second fight of the game. Um, and Kingen had a big moment, finally. You yeah. know, like, he was able to get the timing with his Narbar, he was able to bounce on the head and get a four-man uh, knockback. And this is after they, fought. They, they did ring around the Rosie twice on the Elder Drake without fighting, and Kingen was able to, I mean, DRX actually kind of masterfully bought enough time for him to get another Narbar up because he had lost his yeah. first one. They went all the way around the Drake pit, then he had I his Narbar up again. I was losing it. Here. We were yelling at Laughing. the TV like, just use your Narbar, like what are you doing? They were literally <laughs> running away. They were just like, no, we will not fight. Absolutely no fighting. I, I felt a little bit bad oh. for Atlas and uh, Chronicler on the desk, but we were just losing it back here. And uh, I suppose it worked out, right? Because they, they got the perfect engage finally. And even some shouting at the end as they were pushing in, they were like, this is the last, it, it was only one team fight. All you need is one was. fight. All yeah. you need is one fight. All you need is one fight. And uh, well, they got their one fight and they won the game. So can they do it again? Will we see a repeat of that game again? I'm not sure anyone wants that wolf. I mean, this was, I I think there's a lot of symptoms we've seen on Kwangdong Freaks in terms of them not being able to control the map or side lane at all or set up vision for objectives. They were gifted so many objectives in this game, it would be hard to tell if you didn't look closely that they did almost no setup for these. And I think that symptom is really showing through. I might be the only one, but I predicted DRX to win this series. They won this first game in a similar fashion. I expect that they would take the series by just playing the map better and overall setting up for team fights better. It took a long time. Yep. There was a little bit of ring around the Rosie, but my expectation is I think they can close it out. Yeah, I mean, just in on that note, like DRX were doing some nice things, like trying to beat Baron fights, you know, trying to go for some stuff. They weren't uh, going for the dragons, but once they felt safe enough, they were like, okay, let's actually do some stuff. And all the time it was like, they would try to engage it into Kwangdo and Kwangdo were like, nope. And then it was just a back and forth. It was like a tug of war. And it was happened. really it was really quite comical every time they started the Baron. Cause Kwangdo would be like, wait a minute. Like that's not mid lane. Yeah. That's not what we're looking at right now. We, we've pushed all the way up to the inhibitor turret, but don't have any vision on Baron for some reason. Yeah. We should probably go check that one out. Uh, 
Kwangdong, fantastic mechanical players on this team. Uh, I think Fate hasn't lived up to the hype yet, but everyone else is doing great individually. Yeah. They've got to get that map reading under control. They actually need to push advantages. Please, Kwangdong, you could be a really good team this season. Please. Yeah. And it's a big uh, match, right? Because they're going up against DRX that has not won yet, right? They would absolutely love to win this. And uh, maybe it's a lack of confidence. Maybe it's a lack of shot calling. We don't really know what's up yet. Maybe it's just a bit of the new roster blues, right? Everybody yeah. gets some of those new roster blues every once in a while. And uh, maybe they're just struggling with the beginning of spring. But as you mentioned, like there is a lot of potential on this team. I just need to see some of our bottom teams focus more on learning how to win the map and not win the team fight. Like I, I think that a lot of our LCK teams right now are so focused on the engage and how it works and looking for the most ideal situation possible without realizing that having control wards push deep and actually having wave control and side laning means that you can sometimes just walk up to an objective and sit there and be like, I actually have control. Like I've got this objective locked down. You have to come to me instead of actually a ramming and K ramming as we call it here until the enemy makes a mistake. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of that K ramming. There was um, even a couple of fights where both teams were posturing in mid and it was like, oh, we're gonna fight. And then one person would get caught like when Keen randomly died and then nothing happened for the entire time he was dead yeah. until he teleported back. And then they were just not fighting again for another three minutes until the elder did spawn. Either way, DRX got the win. Let's see who does pick up POG for this first game. Kind of a hard one. Zeka ends up picking it up. I suppose he got a couple of kills at the end. Um, he capitalized really sure. well <laughs> on uh, on that last engage from Kingen. Um, I can't say I agree with this choice because Kingen not only, like this is a, basically this Kingen is a highlight. highlight. This is actually a Kingen highlight, but then also um, <laughs> we're gonna have the king and highlight at the end, but the second king and highlight. Yeah, there are only two fights in the game. We got them already. Uh, we put them both up there, and look at king and setup. Now Zeka is ready, right? He's ready to collapse in, and this is part of why king and waits for this exact timing so that Zeka can follow up. It's very easy for Zeka to actually close this one out once the setup is there. Yeah, um, exactly. So it's not as impressive, <laughs> uh, perhaps as how patient king and played that one, but I want. I do want to take a peek. That pretty sauce, there. pretty sauce. Yeah, going for the Akali there. Got a couple of media votes in there as well. Ooh, I mean, you know what? Everybody <laughs> loves Akali, everybody loves Zekka. She did do some killings at the end. And Kingen was a little bit timid at times. There were times where Kingen could have played that better. I will I will give him, I will give him that. Um, it was not a perfect game for anybody, Valdez. True. I'm excited very, to see how it closes out, though. Very, very true. And uh, speaking of closing, that's going to do it for us, guys. I'm going to throw it back to Atlas and Chronicler to continue with this awesome series. Thank you very much, Valdez. It is awesome indeed, as was Zekka's play throughout the entirety of the yeah. game. Yeah. Uh, I actually think that the fact that he managed to stay ahead in farm throughout the whole game against Evicta as the Akali was very impressive. Um, however, I do understand that uh, also Kingen is pretty good. Managing Rage effectively, managing health bar, not so good. No, but Hasn't quite got both of the, the bars together uh, just yet. I couldn't in good conscience give it to King and after seeing him walk into a Victor that he knew was there like eight times in a row. Like, and I also like walk into the enemy jungler after he'd yes. seen him on the Krugs. Um, yeah. That was also a yeah. whoopsie. But uh, the real winner there was... Um, the Vegas. Anyway, also, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends uh, on the brand of Legal Edge you like. And oh God. I think it's important to note, because we have a lot of fun, right? And, and I think that that is completely okay. But imagine being DRX in this game, right? Like, you saw the lost trick that they were on. I think a lot of the inactivity, yeah. the hesitation, and the complete lack of action and decisiveness from this team is fed by such a long chain of struggle and losses as, oh, the croc is open. The croc is indeed. I open. don't think giving Keen Renekton generally is the way to go. Ah, but we've seen that in the LCK, when oh. we leave Renekton open, it goes mid lane. Oh no, don't like. Oh dear. Okay. Um, this is this is a decision that could be made. Ooh, Renekton mid is interesting. If Fate just plays set mid, I'll be like, which year is it? Um, I would not prefer the, the, the Jinx. Uh, yeah, just fresh. Jinx Thresh, right? Just Jinx Thresh it, yeah. 
In fact, I think DRX probably should have locked in a Felios Thresh uh, in order to avoid just getting Jinx Threshed. Agreed. Which would have been nice. Uh, LM just cycling through a whole bunch of champions. His middle is definitely one of his uh, more successful champions in the past. However, um, there was definitely a bit of a groan uh, from the left side of this particular desk. And uh, yeah, Nidalee not necessarily uh, the champion that she used to be. So we'll see what Quantum Freaks want to round this out with. But, you know, play Devil's Advocate here. I do think that specifically with Renekton, it makes sense. If um, you ban out a couple of strong bot side picks, you are going to absolutely run over King. And early on, just crash, you know, three waves into his turret, take him down with that Nidalee Renekton. But if I see Alan path from top to bot and stay away from that crocodile, I will not be happy. Because <laughs> honestly, I think that the Gragas is a great matchup uh, in Turanax, and I think it mitigates a lot. You can go grasp. Yep. You can play the early game and mitigate a lot. You have decent enough wave clear. Although I still think that Kwangdong Freaks, I King and needs to get taken down a lot. And the one upside of this for me is that I think Elim in that game, unlike in his Poppy game, did not have what the team needed. He was the one that needed to start these engages, yeah. and he didn't at any point, right? At, uh, and we were, we were again, uh, I think it's also for Kwangdong understandable considering the sub split they've had thus far, but if you are playing Jarvan and the enemy Nar has no Nar bar, the enemy Jinx has literally a third, not even, like 25% of a health bar because your Varus has done what he needs to do, which is so hard in late game fights, you need to go in. And now, that task is up to Hoyt. And Hoyt, I hope you're ready to press your R button a whole lot. Because with this comp again, Guangdong Freaks is the one that they're gonna have to win early. Because Ooh. trying to play this comp into a DRX with Aphelios, Rakan, Gragas is a nightmare. Yeah, the Jin, very, very obvious. Um, one thing I, I sort of want to go back on how I reacted to the Aphelios being locked in, because if you see Renekton, you understand that they're going to try and fight you in point-blank range. And Aphelios fights very, very well if that's happening, right? Um, so I do definitely respect that. Uh, Oriana going to be locked in here just to round out a pretty standard style composition. Definitely a lot of magic damage in the 2v2 and not a lot of consistent physical damage available. That Aphelios definitely will provide, and that will be the Victor locked in here for Zekka in the mid lane. So Ariana Victor, not exactly the most high octane matchup, um, but seeing the Nidalee is very exciting. And Quantum Freaks, a lot of early power. Fights around the mid game, if they ever actually occur this game, will be very, very good for Quantum Freaks if Keen can get in there. And Keen is going to have so much agency this game. Um, with the Ariana Ball uh, on top of him, with the fact that Hoyt can follow him into these fights as well, uh, should mean that the Renekton can control a lot of how this game goes. Give me textbook Renekton early play, right? Take early control of the lane, path towards that top side. Somehow make sure that you keep track of Pioshik so you don't get uh, don't get demolished there. Um, but you should be able to, because you should have Pryo in Basically, every single lane mid, of course, going to be a little bit harder as that is not necessarily a matchup. But even there, I think that early on, yeah. I mean, Ariana can clear out waves, right? And that's all yeah. she really needs to do. Um, but the bottom lane, not going to be as much consistent damage. Teddy has definitely been landing his skill shots very, very well. And a character that has a heck of a lot of skill shots at his disposal is certainly a good option. But we've seen Jins be either really good early and then the curtain call is so scary later in the game or they just kind of feel like they don't do enough uh, in these games as they go later and later. So if Afrika, sorry, not Afrika, Quantum Freaks do the same thing as they did game one, I have a feeling that the result might also be very similar. A dangerous situation here for Quantum Freaks, but they have to show us that they can pull the trigger, that they can start these fights and make something happen. We are now onto the rift to see whether they can do just that. All eyes on Keen to see whether this coveted Renekton pick is going to actually work out for the first time in the LCK. It's been banned every single game other than this one and one other one where it lost from the mid lane. Exactly. First Renekton top game. We'll yeah. Split. And I agree with you. Unlike last game, um, I don't think the Kwangdong Freak comps has anything to look for in late game. Like I, I, I don't think that there is anything that you'd want there. Uh, you have four characters that don't love going late, uh, and then you have Oriana, who uh, by herself is not going to be enough unless 
fate somehow gets ludicrously fed. And that generally shouldn't happen. So what we want to see is a lot of early prio, a lot of aggression set up around Elam on that Nidalee. And I don't care if he gets keen ahead. I don't care if Taddy and Hoyt are going to be able to set up repeated plays around that bot side. But something needs to be done by Kwangdong because much more so than the previous game. If you just let DRX sit around for the first 15 to 20 minutes, uh, they are going to demolish you in late yeah. stage of the game. No, they definitely will. Uh, King and Keen setting, uh, settling in up here towards the top side, and you imagine that Keen should start shoving this lane forward relatively quickly. He's built up a whole bunch of rage. And he can just cull this wave if he'd like to. Decides to hold on to it, gather as much rage up as possible, stack this one up, and head it towards King and as you would otherwise expect. Let's see how this one does turn out, as uh, right now, Keen is just yeah, taking damage, but it doesn't matter. Press is cute should be all right. Of course, the reason why Renekton is back in permaban status is because he got his stun back. And yeah. uh, that's real frightening for those going up against him because he was very point and click, able to set up for champions like this Nidalee, like we're talking about. So Quantum Freak's capitalizing on this pick, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, Elam actually head towards that top side and get something done. Because as we can see, actually pathing towards that top lane, so far, so good, as far as that is concerned. Ooh, and as Keen, I think you can do one or two things. Either you can take control of the wave here and try to synergize and uh, synchronize, rather, with Alem, or you can let King and shove in, which right now that is how it's looking, uh, with King and also using his Empowered W to try and get as much done. And that means that once Alem actually makes his way up to the top side, it's going to be a very, very long lane. And King N is then either going to get froze out of a whole lot uh, of minions, or he's going to have to take the risk of a Nidalee gang. But wait, oh yeah, battle here towards the bottom side of the map. Map. Speaking of battles, battle dance used by Beryl to make his escape. He's going to be all right. Health bars basically traded evenly, as we can see. But the shove is in favor. Fondon breaks. Zekker actually able to do a fair bit of work here as far as getting this wave in a place that he wants it. Mana bars on both of our mid lane is not exactly in the most optimal of positions. But that's all right. Still a couple of death rays available. As King and Yeah, he's just body slamming him around the lane. Having a good time. As we can see, and so far, it's not actually the Renekton carrying too hard. Definitely needs access to all of his buttons before it really yeah, does I'd become a, uh, a big menace. Uh, level four, and has only just began to find that, uh, that good position here. Yeah, I don't think you're too bothered. Uh, yeah, it's Greg really is, is really difficult to move, just in general. He is. But between sustain, uh, the utility, his trading patterns just being all around annoying, and him continuously clocking that grasp, uh, he is uh, a brick wall, effectively, as Alan did actually. Really nicely done. Good read there. A bit high risk. Uh, I'm not sure if someone of his team roamed up to check for that uh, scuttle, but got the double scuttle start. Building up an early lead here on the Nidalee. And that's good. That's a nice beginning. But as mentioned previously, you're not talking about a couple of camps up. You're not talking about small experience leads. You're talking about big, tangible, sizable leads here for Kwangdong if you want to avoid the scenario that befell you in the previous yeah. game. I remember it was give everything away to your opponent, win one fight and win the game. And it worked out for DRX. Yeah. Best believe. They are okay with going for it again. Grand entrance here towards the bottom side as Hoyt was trying to hold the wave. Death unable to really catch up. Didn't have the caliber and call the extra range or anything like that. And Teddy's going to make his way back in just before DRX crash this wave and look for a back timing of their own. I think the Jin will, in the end, after the Apollo is back, um, should be able to be ahead by about a wave or so uh, of CS. So definitely okay for Quandom Freaks there towards the bottom side as this. Ooh, this ward is back again. A lot of value being uh, achieved here as the Krug camp is well and truly under observation. It's really nicely done. Uh, making sure that they know up Yoshi, because that also means that Teddy can play a lot more forward. Quite now looking for a roam, but is like playing very defensively, so. Yeah, I think he was really actually spotted um, by someone as he was wandering on through. So Zekka is going to get that news. Beryl was also trying to hold the wave as Chaos Storm just going to be thrown into this mid lane. It's showing some of that uh, LPL experience. Definitely the Doinby special. Just hold the wave. 
the very first time that you get it, and grab yourself a nice back timing. And both of these mid laners are going to be going home. You can see Zekka just uh, poking his head in, seeing whether Fate is still in the area. And he's not. And actually, might just not. <laughs> Thought he was going to hold the wave. But no, it's just going to meet. As Teddy, I think, spotted someone going home. Yeah, he, uh, he, he knew, but also has no mana, and if he gets engaged on, he definitely dies, so I wanted to play it a little bit safe. Yep. And thus far, said the game is basically even. Yeah, Keen has found himself a nice lead, uses Teleport towards the top side, which is fine, considering the Teleport change, of course, that we saw this season, but as a whole, Kwangdung doing very little uh, mm -hmm. to... So Take away my worries after last game. Yeah, let me uh, let me talk to you about the DRX comfort zone. Do you know where that is? 500 gold behind. That 300 to 500 gold behind. That is their comfort zone. They got up, and so right now they are just they're just chilling. You, have you uh, are you all about like um, astronomy and stuff like that, and checking out the stars and like trying to work out whether there's other inhabitable places? Um, uh, out there in the universe, uh, no, the, 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 no, the habitable zone. But do enlighten me. For for DRX, the ultimate habitable zone is 300, 500 gold behind. Little known fact. And That's uh, why they fry. Yeah, I like to say that you know you don't just get commentary here. You also get borderline documentary um, when you're on the LCK broadcast. And I hope you guys appreciated that. It's very going to take a bit of damage here. Yoshik coming on in. Is this going to be a dive? As Deft is going to get engaged on Red White. Maybe fight. As there's the grand entrance and Hoyt's taking a lot of damage. Yoshik wanders all the way underneath this one. And Teddy is caught completely unawares. Really nicely played from DRX. And they'll grab first blood. And they are outside of their uh, habitable zone now as they have a lead. Hey, still close enough. Close enough. We'll take it. We'll take it as this is what we need to see. Yeah, bit of a dive here underneath this turret, but it's uh, yeah. going to be pushed back, and Kingen should actually be all right, to be honest. There's the pounce in as Alum going to get mini stunned, but thankfully for the Quandom Freaks, Keen had the turret aggro. Zekka finds himself a stun, but that's a good shockwave to deter Fate from doing any more. Kyoshik grabs himself the first Cloud Drake. Next one going to be that mountain, and I believe that means that we are almost guaranteed an Infernal Soul. That would be nice. Ah, uh, that's uh, a curtain call. As Deft. I think he just wanders out of that. Actually, no, it just goes up. Never mind. Love the music. Yeah. Very, very nice touch. And that, in the end, is the uh, grand entrance to come in. Okay, dissonance. Bit of damage there onto Zekka. His barrel's just happily dashing into people. And I like yeah. that. He noticed that there was a little bit of inactivity in the last game. A little. Not about that anymore. And uh, no, Beryl's just like, well, if you're not going to do anything about it, I'm just going to dive on top of you over and over again. And he's doing it, and he's doing it very, very well. Zekka with a whole bunch of mana, Fate with very little. And that is uh, how this one works. Beryl getting some slaps, but otherwise it's going to be okay. And Teddy grabs two plates on the bottom side. Let's have a look at this one one more time as uh, Pioshik makes his way in. Very clean. Walks yeah. up behind, has a wave. And if they knew, uh, then they surely wouldn't have gone that far. Really nice usage by King in there uh, of his W to reduce the incoming damage, which is why he looks so healthy here. Unfortunately, it is still Renek in Italy. Yeah. Uh, and Keen can tank that turret for what feels like eternity with the Dominus. And that does mean that that topside pressure is now found. Adam also getting the Eye of the Herald off of that. And I personally would love to see them throw all their gold into Keen. Just, it's been a strategy that's worked for <laughs> Wangdong slash Afrika for, for eons. Ages. Eons it in goes the past, back. indeed. You know, you, you asked me about astronomy. I like history. Yeah. Firstly, big history. Please buff. give us, give us the, uh, give us the lesson. Well, I mean, that was the lesson. Like, f feed Keen, and and he will provide for ah, you. I thought we were gonna have a little bit more fluff. Um, but that's no. all right. Why the? I mean, I There's know, but like, if, if you've watched a documentary, often they say something very simple, but in like 11 sentences. But at that, least. That, we, I do, we do that all the time, and I don't want to draw attention <laughs> to that. Okay, Atlas, like, they can't, ca they can't uh, catch on. Uh, Come on. I apologize, I apologize. I shouldn't have, oh. uh, shouldn't have broken the fourth wall. <laughs> as uh, King is trying to do some damage here to Keen, as barrels rotated up. Spotted on the ward, I believe, or at least has spotted the ward. 
and keen. Let's see whether he is going to stay keen. He's not, because of course, two versus one, he is not going to win. Dominus is available once again, though, and Pioshik's going to turn up as well. Fate standing in this river, and Zekka spots them out as there's the engage. The quickness comes down. Good grand entrance. They're just going to dive on top of Elam as best they can. He will be taken down, but now they have to deal with Keen. Hoyt makes his way in as well as DRX are grouped up nicely. Fate turns up with 100% health. There's the shockwave flashed by King in. Beryl wants a re-engage, and there goes King in, but he's just going to be taken down. Zekka there just a little bit too late. Otherwise, that play could have been absolutely amazing. In the end, though, it doesn't quite work out. It is a one for one. It's all right as the dust settles. Habitable zone has been acquired yet again, though. Actually, no, it hasn't. Eight a little bit. Never. Yeah, they, they were like, I think, 1.6k gold behind in the end. Oh, Zeka. Oh, it's a yeah. trap. He should. He, he knows this is a trap. This is not happening. They're back. Yeah, they are. Because Fate has a wave to get to, uh, which he will promptly teleport towards. P.O. Schick shoving that out, very nicely done. Yep. Alleviating pressure for the rest of his team. And I still haven't seen uh, this Rift Herald dropped, and it needs to go. It needs to go on top, because you need to get that first turret blood. And if you get Deft any more time, and he gets it on that bot side turret, I will be very upset. As looking back at this fight, it is just really nicely executed by P.O. Schick and Ellen. Uh, of course, or rather right by P.O. Schick on Ellen with uh, him standing on the ward, Barrow at the ready as well. And this was basically just a perfectly won fight uh, until that re-engage, which is understandable considering the fact that Zack is approaching, but if you don't actually hit anyone with the body slam, it is one yeah. of the silliest looking abilities in the game if it doesn't hit anyone. You just yeah. go and then you're there, and then you're dead. How's it going? Ellen's going to throw down uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly, sorry, and Shelly's not going to do anything at all. Well played by DRX to lock that one down, and in the meantime, Deft is on the bottom side, just finishing the rest of these plates off. That will get them uh, far closer to I've, a I've, good position. I told you I was going to be upset, and I really am. Uh, uh, mm. what, are, what are we upset about again? Well, King in. Is, ooh, finds the body slam on the dice. I actually really like that. Spear is going to connect, though, and there's the stun. King in, throws down the barrel as now Elam's going to skirt. I've seen this one before, as can King in survive is the answer. Body slam comes in, but uh, yeah, King with the dominance is going to be fine. Oh, the quickness is actually used there by Barrel. Thought that he was almost close enough. Pyoshik's on the bottom side of the map, though, so nothing doing. The Herald. I was, I was mad about the Herald. Ah, I'm mad about the... Got it. Yeah. Uh, I was not happy with how that went, the first turbot going off to DRX. And normally, if it was the previous game, I would have been not too bothered by it. But again, Huangdong, a 2k lead is not a lead. That's where you should be. And giving up first turbot is a bounty that was completely unnecessarily given over had you just played according to what you should have done. Just go on towards top and drop the Herald there. I'm 99% sure that... Alam had the time uh, last time I checked. Might be wrong there, maybe he was forced, but then just half a little bit early, there's two plates there. It's the freest pickup that you could possibly get. Yeah. Didn't On the plus side, we're playing around Keen, and that is a win for me. Yeah. That's uh, probably a win for Condom Freaks as well. It's not quite yet, but because uh, they do need to stay active and get stuff done, but this is yet another successful kill under a turret for the Nidalee Renekton combo, and that's precisely what you want. They gotta keep doing that. Uh, so yeah, that that is that is a Renekton. Yes, right there in your top lane, and I, uh, he might not win again. But I do think that it does teach us the lesson that Renekton top is still something that should be feared, and especially early in the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, as I, we can see, he's almost double the gold that yeah. King has. I, I honestly think that uh, Renekton not scaling is dependent on how it goes right in this state of the game, and also like what game you're playing. Exactly. As well. Because if you're heavily outranged and there's a lot of CC on the opposing side, which kind of is how it is, it is. Um, then it's, it's a bad time. Yeah. It's, it's a bad time. Uh, at the same time, though, he does have enablers, and that, that is something that we're really going to have to draw attention to as we get into these fights. Yes. DRX should be fine. I think that with the amount of zone control that they have available in combination with an explosive cask and Pioshik's ultimate and everything in Zaka's kit, Deft and Zaka should be completely fine. Yep. But I'd say that my misstep is very quickly punished, right? Because it is a slice and dice into a stun that you can't do anything about and then a shockwave on top of you. And then suddenly you can be dead. Uh, but as long as DRX plays around that, they should be completely okay. 
Well, Zekka's going for the loot and Zekko build. Wants to do a bunch more damage. I like that with the passivity that uh, Quandom Freaks have shown. May as well just try and maximize how much these death rays are going to be doing as they sail over the enemy team. And uh, you look down the line, you're like, if you don't look at top lane, you're like, wow, this game is so close. It's really cool. Wow, DRX is just ahead by a little bit. And then there's a 67 CS gap in the top lane. Keen is just really running away with it. But is it going to be enough? It's the question that we're answering. It could. Asking all the time. Uh, if they were up Drakes. Yeah. Which they are not. Yeah. Um, or any any part of sizable map control. and But they got the Herald. <laughs> yeah, I know you're doing it to Tommy, and it still works, Atlas. <laughs> that's 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 I how unfortunate uh, I think that scenario was. And the, I got dove here, but reinforcements are coming, so I like the disengage here. Yep. And and of course, um, the reason why I'm frustrated with ah uh, Teddy. Yeah, there's the cleanse. Cleanse. Oh. In there is the Barrel. teleport. Gonna That's have the to deep one. Do the grand entrance, and yeah, there's the teleport. That is a big, scary crocodile coming in. And yes, Deft and Barrel, not a whole lot that they're going to be able to do here, unless Deft trying to move back into position. Teddy getting on in here. Deft going down very low. Moonlight Vigil goes entirely wide. Deft still alive for the moment as Keen. Can he actually survive this? Def kiting it pretty nicely. Shockwave comes down onto two. That's definitely good for the other side of the fight. But otherwise, this is not really what you want. Pyoshik tidies up the crocodile, and it's a one fight for DRX. Def throws his ult to Narnia, and they still win. Death leaves, Atlas. And that is horrible outcome for Kwang Lung Freaks. That must have felt like they were in complete control of that situation. Because you're fighting exactly around your strong top side. This is the fight you want. It's that the was deeper four next people like, closing in on a Rakan and Feli. Oh, I know. I know. No. I know. And the response was there. Right. DRX are more than ready to take this on. And, and you see this and you're like, this is disaster. But Hoyt doesn't actually find the engage. And that is big. Because Deft and Barrel also dodge that solar flare. And they are fine, at least for now. And this is where the Gravitum comes through, right? Death stays alive for oh, a really Also, the really death long ray time. damage as well, yeah. Yeah, because Zekka was actually there. And then the problem is that Keen was never actually able to walk up here because he had to deal with a Victor, right? And yeah, Renekton is big, but if he gets kited out like this, there is very little that he can really do. Theoshik and King did an exceptional, uh, exceptional job of zoning. And Alan. Not able to get the execute, and then as Nidalee, if you're in a position like you just kind of die. Yeah. And here's another Rift Herald. If at first you do not succeed, give it another crack, I think is uh, how the saying goes. And this time, Shirley is going to be able to get, uh, what, get done what her sister was unable to. The better Rift Herald this game, as it turns out. Normally, Shirley just so much better because she provides you with that money. Not this time around. As DRX getting pushed out of the mid lane for the moment. Keen on a flank. And camouflage right now. As Barrel down relatively low. And now Keen comes on in. Flash out from Def. Gets him out of the way. Good knock up there from Kyoshik though. As Moonlight Vigil lands this time. And Keen is just destroyed before he can get anything done. Yes, the turret falls down. But they lose their gigantic crocodile. And Zekka was splitting topside this whole time. So the actual trade will be in favor of DRX. And he had teleport. DRX was in full control of that situation. And this feels so reminiscent of the Guangdong Freaks. The Freak are old. Keen desperately trying to carry. And but going things. too deep. Yeah. Going too deep, right? Like there was a teleport available for Zaka. If they were afraid they were going to lose that fight, he could have joined at a moment's notice. But if Pong Nung speaks falling, we also have Pio Shik's rise, as he has had, I think, the first truly exemplary game, the game that we know. He's yeah. shown us in the past. He's been able to do this. He's always the right moment, right place, right time. The Jin providing very little, and this turret dies so so slowly, because of that, Kingen finds a nice cast, throws that crocodile back into the turret, and nothing actually, nothing good comes from that for the Kwangdong Freaks. And now, in the wake of that, turret has been, or uh, sorry, Drake has been taken, DRX with Sword Point, a better scaling composition. Yeah, and now, they're gonna, if they manage to get the next Drake, then it's multiple lives as well. Oh, yeah. Um, oh. Which is oh. going to be oh. a 
huge worry yeah. uh, for Condor Freaks. They need to fight for this next one, which means that control that uh, especially Wolf was quite upset about uh, on the analyst chairs and collaborative carpet space with imaginary desk, that's yeah. really going to be brought into full force, right? Uh, because, yeah. Condom Freaks have not been utilizing any of those tempo advantages that they've managed to get. Yes, Keen has a 4,000 gold lead, but it's Doesn't becoming work. less and less relevant as this game goes on, and the less he plays around Fate and around Hoyt and getting these fights happening at the same time. Because if, if he manages to have the Orianna ball on him, he becomes so much more terrifying. That's so much extra guaranteed Dominus damage, the Cull the Meek damage, you know? Um, but yeah. if he's uh, trying to dive by himself, um, it's just not really going to be the same situation. And, and just get kited out. They're still a way uh, for Kwang to win this game. I mean, right? they're still technically winning. I, I mean, they're adding gold. I don't think they're winning. <laughs> I think that, I, I, I definitely think that um, that's an interesting discussion, actually. How does one define winning? Yeah, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a contextual thing, right? It yeah. depends. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't feel like going too deep into that. But the one way that Kwang Lung still have out of this is, as per usual in situations like this, because I don't think that um, their setup is amazing for setting up side lane kills. Uh, if DRX play respectful, which does what they've been able to do, then they should never really be under too much pressure. Barring that topside skirmish is just a good old keen flash, slice and dice, hits a couple of people with Fate, who by that point will have his second item finished, which will be the death cap, just for it's raw burst, right? It's just the big wombo combo. Yep. You blow up Zekka and, also a big old shield. and all deft. Yeah, exactly. And then you hope that that's enough. And that has to be enough. Because outside of that, Alum at this point, I think, is mostly relegated to throwing spears and watching him go into a Gragas and, or a Bioshik and not really do all that much. Um, and both Fade and Teddy kind of suffer from the same uh, issue, which is that their picks work really well when you can support, when you can play around someone else. If you're not fed yourself, which they're not really, yeah. um, then you're going to be looking to make sure that someone else on your team can kind of carry the weight and they can do so better. But Hasn't it's just really a worked out in their favor so far this series, um, as we've seen. That being said, slight advantage, like we were talking about, when it comes to gold and things like that. But look at Death. Collector now completed, looking for his Infinity Edge. Very color coordinated when it comes to his item build as well. Sticking with the blues and the yellows, and I like that a lot. Coordination when it comes to aesthetics. It's very good for how you feel about playing the game of League of Legends. As Keen, uh, walking on the spot here, um, teleporting around. Um, what? Is this what happens when you get 4,000 gold ahead? You're just allowed to teleport? Yes. Damn, that's really cool. He's more than a crocodile. He's become one with time and space. <laughs> yes, he's transcended. Which dimension is well, he in? We can't hey, comprehend it. R Renexon is is kind of a kind of a demigod in the law, right? Him and NASA's are always fighting for yeah, yeah. of uh, supremacy of uh, of Sharima. As I, I guess you know, maybe he could have gone to a workshop or two. Um, and if Sharima is a representation of you know Egypt and yeah. where the where the pyramids are, they were they were built by aliens, weren't they? That's what the, the that's what people say. I feel like you should li watch less documentaries in League of Legends. <laughs> I think I'm baiting a little bit too much. Uh, oh, that's as all right. Quantum freaks trying to take control of mid. The K Ram, as we were talking about, spears not connecting. Have to win this fight. Yeah, King in. Moving towards a little bit more. Zeka just throwing out some abilities. Goes golden though. As there it was. We're looking for fate, and that's the quickness. Goodbye, Oriana. And now the chaos rains down. Zeka still fighting for more, but they slink into the corruption. And remember, all of the gold is on the Renekton. So the four in the 4 1 is not as strong as DRX, because that four are all ahead. It's just not how you can play this game out if you want to win, Quandon Freaks. And now it is Soul Point and Fate is dead for another 25 seconds. He has Teleport, but he has no Flash, and I think they're not going to be able to save this Drake. Chemtech's soul now for DRX as they look to turn back to the mid lane. Farm minions, no, maybe they're looking for a little bit more. Zeka comes available. out of the smoke. Okay, right. let's just disengage. Chemtech Fog, indeed. Dissuading, but uh, not enough. Um, yeah, King just so not really doing any damage here to uh, King, and as you can see, 
He's got his Fimble Winter done. And, uh, yep. DRX will just move over towards the Baron. And will Quantum Freaks freak stop this one from being taken is kind of the question. And I guess uh, DRX, if they don't take it, then Quantum Freaks don't have to stop ah, them. Nice. There go. Bit of Very good. Bit of chess going on. As uh, this is an attempted engage. Don't mind that as much. But the problem is that Fade is baiting to going forward. And Barrel just having... This is old school Barrel that we're seeing right here on the Rakan. Yeah. I think that he has been, uh, to me, one of the biggest factors of why this game has looked as dominant as it has. Also looking at Oriana, 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 Oriana. Yeah, I Oriana. love that it, it Pioshik just makes the call and instantly Barrel's like, okay, yeah. Chan -chan, Chan -chan. someone told me to go, I'm going. And while I think it's it's natural and it's understandable to be frustrated with the Kwangdong freaks and the demons that they're clearly struggling with in terms of how to play out the comms, what to go for, what is our identity as a team that seemingly they still haven't found an answer to. Um, I have to say it's a pleasure to slowly see Pioshek turn back into the player that he was. Because even yeah. when he was, you know, you could argue he was kind of carried in 2020 DRX, but he was, <laughs> but he was always a pleasure to watch because he was an incredibly jubilant, yeah, and charismatic, and, and, and charismatic and when, player. And when you've got a player like that that does thrive off emotion, then you thrive off, like then the opposite is true for negative yeah. emotion as well, right? And so when you lose so many series in a row. Um, it becomes very, very difficult to keep that jubilance and to, to keep that, yeah. that feeling. So maybe if DRX are able to finish this one off, then it could just be that we get back our old Pyoshik that's just making funny dances and things like that. And that was definitely one of the best parts about the LCK. It was. Uh, not too sure about that one. And now as DRX, you can take a number of routes. You can try and hard force a team fight. You know, give that a go. Uh, you can play around Baron. You can just shove in sideways. Definitely don't do that, though. Yeah, Solar Flare comes on in. Pyoshik going to ult. That's going to keep him alive. That is a big tool that they no longer have. Zekka with a lot of damage, but now slightly out of position. Great gravity field that Keen has to now walk around. And then uses the Zonyas as Keen just headbutts the wall just a little. Chaos Storm goes down. More of a deterrent rather than any sort of engage option. And we are back to square one. That was almost a fight, though. Very close. Yeah, this game is not as bad as the previous one no, in terms of in terms of not there uh, of there not being any action. Although, if DRX actually sit around and do nothing until uh, the Elder Drake in three minutes, that in itself is still okay. Okay, if they do that, I I, I am fine with that. As long as they fight, don't <laughs> actually yeah. flip Elder. Right, that's the only thing you can't do. Like, I mean, that's honestly, how they won the last game. No, 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 no. So Atlas, Atlas. don't do it. Like, oh. don't run into the same issue. Because yes. if you're fighting against Elder, obviously you, know. you have a disadvantage if you have all of the other dragons. That's what we saw. You walk into that battle I... and you've killed four other of oh. the Elder Drake's brethren. The Elder Drake will cause that fight to go the other direction. It's science. It's just how it goes. It actually does. I learned that recently. That yeah. the more, yeah, the more drakes you've killed, the more damage the subsequent dragons do to you. Yeah. Um, that being said, I just don't want it to flip and decide the game on a smite. They can go to Elder Pit, but as long as King goes in, I think they'll be completely fine. And that is something that uh, thus far that hasn't actually been King. It's been Pioshik. That's completely fine as well. Barrel obviously also very happy to engage. And for Kwangdon freaks, uh, technically they're still ahead in terms of gold. Uh, and, and if they can get into the back line, they can pull exactly the play that DRX pulled on them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's still possible. Uh, got a minute and a half as Pyoshik has to flash. Did have Crescent Guard available, but uh, thought that they would just close in on top of him. He's just going to flash his way out. So, as Pyoshik without his flash, that's an engaged tool, now missing. As uh, Beryl spots Kane, throws a gleaming quill at him. One of the most dangerous abilities in the entirety of League of Legends. And Zekka backs away from that top lane, and the ebb and flow of the K-Ram hey. is going to continue moving throughout. Quill's mightier than the sword, Atlas. All right. We're going to speed ourselves up, as that is Keen caught out of position. The quickness is perfect as well, but he presses Dominus. The Moonlight Vigil comes down. The AoE damage is massive, but it's not enough to get the kills. But they soften them up, and can DRX take the Baron in time? They have Aphelios. He's got a lot of items, and this will not last very long. And now, I think they're going to shred for this in seconds. Huangdong can have the teleport available for Keen. Uh, I think that we are going to see the flip here. Yeah. 
There's the curtain call. Beryl trying to stay in front of it. Zekka taking a fair bit of damage from Fate, but Fate almost just taken out of this fight. Keen not going to get here in time as once again the Zonyas is beautiful from Zekka. Keen tries to get the Cold and damage to do enough, but the rest of his team not quite there. Death still alive, still at full health as Beryl goes down to his Chemtech Drake Soul Self. But he's probably just going to melt down. And yes, he does. Almost gets the knock up from beyond the grave as Hoyt. Dives on in, but he'll get taken down as well. Once more, Pyoshik tries to get some work done. Death That's big. is going to get shockwaved and then has to flash to get himself out of it. King is running for the hills, but he's by himself. And I've seen this before, everyone. I've seen this before, and it happened in the last game as Death tries to now Teddy get himself lives. forward, but Teddy will survive. And DRX, they lose everyone, and Kwondong Freaks lose just Hoyt. This should be Elder if they want it. I don't know if they have enough time. Zekka's still full health, has the Baron buff available. Pioshik is coming up soon. Beryl already making his way over, but I think you have to go for it. I think you have to try and yeah. take this objective. Zekka at full health. I mean, if they're trying to do it while Zekka is there, it is dangerous. Deft has some good long range weaponry. This is the window. It is. They found the window! 12 seconds until King is available. Pioshik has just come up now. He's, I can't believe this is happening again as Keen with the Dominus once more dives into the back line. He's just trying to buy time. The Moonlight Vigil sails by majestically but won't actually do any damage. And Quandon freaks back away. Oh no, Elam gets out of the pit because he couldn't take tank the dragon. And now DRX have got themselves all back into position. Good stun is going to come through. It's going to be a 50-50. Elam flashes. Oh, that steals it! He picks up the Elder, but he immediately dies. They lose two. Death gets a double. Is the Elder going to be enough? It's on three people. Oh my god, this game. I don't know, Atlas. Four Drakes is cursed. You yeah. can't get the Elder. It is. If you are an LCK team, just don't do it. Don't try it. As unbelievable, no dumbers available here, right? And this is a messy team fight. Everyone is busy with trying to make sure that the Baron doesn't get stolen. And the amount of damage that Keen does here is just insane. On the flip side of this, Teddy is actually slowing down the approach here, right? And this is really key because this means that Hoyt is going to be able to find this engage here over the one. That elongates the fight. And because, effectively, they're still taking them on one by one by one, that Camtech Soul actually gets very little value. Kingen, you're not playing AP Gragas, that's not actually going to kill anyone. And then the fact that they all are able to get away from Zekka here, the one member that's still insanely tanky. Oh. Here you see the shields that come through from Fate. Such a pivotal character. And look at the spear that Alum's about to hit here in a little bit, because they get bullied off, right? The health bus are too low, the teleport comes in. The fact that Elam hits this spear here is so big. They block that. I don't know if he gets it. The execution plus the smite. Yeah. Back, 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 back. Get us out of here. Well, we've now, uh, we've got 55 seconds. I'm actually amazed that, that, that nothing happened while we were in that very long replay. Oh, we're back in the comfort zone. Yeah, we are back. We are definitely back in the comfort zone. As 400 gold, idyllic conditions. Basically the same temperature as Rune Terra. As Curtain Call comes in, and DRX is going to back away. Remember, Curtain Call quite dangerous um, when he only needs to get you to 20% health. 33 seconds, and then, uh, <laughs> and then we're back to even footing. Actually, DRX should be ahead um, just because they do have that Chemtech Soul available. But the money is starting to roll in. The Kwondong Freaks, as much as that is relevant when uh, both teams are sitting at 60 plus thousand gold. Yeah. Now, Bloodthirster done for Deft. Had a pretty good game so far. Him and Pyoshik really have been uh, getting some work done. 3 0 5 for the Aphelios. Deft not being afraid to flash. It's definitely a good sign. But I mean, Fate has the ultra greed build in the Rabidans into the Void stuff with the Ludens. It's a lot of damage potential from this Ariana, and if he lands another Shockwave onto Def, it won't be lasting too long. Def does have now his uh, Bloodthirster. It's good news for him, but this game is far from over, and I'm not entirely sure who... Like, I mean, DRX are favored it's, right now, yeah. but I don't know what it necessarily means. That, that's the big question, because I think that now that the dust has settled, there was actually no fight that took place with the Elder Drake, um, and, and that is the real issue, because 
when you're playing in a straight 5v5, the Dirac squad is really hard to engage on, right? Because when Dekka and Deft both have their ultimates available, or have their flashes available, rather, um, you're basically relying on just Hoyt. And that's why that fight was also good. It was all over, it was over walls, right? Yeah. It was not a straight up 5v5. It was the fog. It was the sides of the pit. It was throughout the jungle. And in a situation like that, Kwangdong freaks are going to feel a lot better because that is where your mobility really shines. But in open spaces with enough vision and straight up front to back, DRX are still should be unmatchable. Even if you throw everything into Daft, he's going to come back. Yeah, this is actually uh, Kingen standing in front of these minions. This is exactly what DRX want as Shockwave is going to land just onto the Gragas. They take the turret, but they're trying to counter the splitting that Keen's trying to do. They're walking forward aggressively, exactly what they need to do. Making sure that Keen has to then back away and Kingen can go and get his health bar back because he needs that. Yeah, I really like the Guardian, uh, or the Gargoyles rather, stone play here from Kingen. Yeah. Nice, uh, nice, nice buy. Exactly what he needs. All he needs to do is buy time. He just needs to tank stuff, and he's been doing so. As the Baron last time around, it was a roller coaster, Atlas. I mean, all of the engages have been a roller coaster, and I'm, I am literally edge of my seat, trying to work he out is. what is going to happen. I, I, I can see it. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaning forward far more than I otherwise would. It's probably bad for my back, but I do not mind. I live life on the edge. Truly. Yes, indeed. Uh, adventurous I, night I here at the I feel SK. like I'm <laughs> reiterating that way too many times. Is DRX going to move back towards this Baron Pit? Spot it out. No vision. Yeah. As Zekka will get caught out as Beryl dives into the back line. Finds fate. And Zekka goes golden once again. Man, that Zonyas is paid for itself as Kane's going to get engaged on. Beryl battle dance is over. But that is a lot of buttons now on cooldown on DRX. Not a lot to show for it. Apart from a little bit of Hoyt's health bar. And now they have to move back and challenge for more mid control. And Kwandong Freaks actually in position. Able to get that one done. Red buff now onto Deft. And they're going to back Elder away. Again. And Elder is up in 30 seconds, exactly. See whether Pyoshik can have his finger on the smite trigger a little bit better this time. If he dies, he dies three times. Um, as he's got a Guardian Angel now as well. Derex just waiting for these cooldowns to come back up to quickness. About two thirds done. Seven seconds on this Elder and Fundon Freaks. They should do it ASAP, right? So they can do it before these buttons are available. It's only the dominance that was used as now Beryl has to dash himself out as Teddy does so much damage if he catches you unawares. And there it is. Curtain Call comes in. Beryl almost taken down. Whoa, that definitely skimmed his cape there just a little bit. And the damage is starting to really ramp up. This Oriana does so much. Deft. Red and white guns. Scary. But if they do damage from range, it's not going to be as much of an issue. And now you see the issue, right? With Void having no flash, engaging is a lot harder. And Beryl, I think, is just going to make his way back. I don't think you can walk into the pit as Guangdong. Unless you can somehow get in, Keen also can go for a flash slice and dies, but that is a really high risk play. Yeah. Though no curtain call. It's so hard to approach your Squang Freaks. Unlike the last game where they had all the bots, and this time they have too little. Yeah, Teddy is now grabbing himself a red buff. He does so. It's gonna be a flanking Teddy, and by the looks of things, it's actually gonna work. It's gonna get slowed down. Death now with a calibrum. Definitely good for the extra range availability. And Beryl looking for that flank. Hoyt just spotting the flanks off to the side. Homework being done here very nicely. You can see Vision now onto Deft. Keen taking a lot there as the Calibrum Q connects. Goshik holding on to this dragon, and now they're going to go for the engage. There's the Crescent Guard. Beryl off to the side. The quickness has been used, but he couldn't see his window. Hasn't decided to go in, and actually, oh no, the quickness not used just yet, as there's the barrel, but it's not going to land, and barrel just does a bit of a drive-by. No one's dead yet, but a lot of the buttons now unavailable for the rest of this fight. You can feel how intense it is for both of these teams. The dragon's getting amongst the Pyoshik's almost dead, as the curtain call comes in once again. Death gonna get snagged. Pyoshik! Oh dear. Teleport coming in, it's not over yet. Yeah, we're Breaks looking getting low. for a re-engage. The Drake, it's just going to be secured by Kwandong Freaks, but Deft picks up the kill onto the Leona, and it's actually man advantage now for DRX, but there's a big dragon buff now on Kwandong Freaks. I don't even know what it means. 
Jin Air Teddy is definitely back, by the way. The man is showing a carry performance on Jin oh, yeah. here. That is just disgusting, the amount of damage he was able to do in that fight. Simply revolting. But as you pointed out, there's still a man up. And yes, you have an elder buff, but I think we might get another still made. I'm scared to save. I don't think Kwang Dong, unless he can oh, find a fight. No. Deft is going to go golden, and DRX immediately react. They know that Teddy is 100% of what they need to deal with. Flash was used, actually, by Teddy in that situation. A very valuable cooldown. Now, Kingen can just find him with that explosive cask, which is back available right now. Hoyt making his way down the mid lane, and that will be 5v5 time. One and a half minutes of this Elder. Sidewaves don't exist. It's all about the team fight. They're all about the 5v5. That's how it ended last time. Oh, barrel dashing forward, dashing back. That's how it won this time, Atlas. Yeah, I think Condon Freaks probably could move towards Baron Pit and just kill it with five members and Elder Drake. I don't know. I don't know if they can. I mean, they definitely should. Yeah. But I, I don't know if they can. Can, will, should. These are words. Barrel, battle dances his way up. Kane gets himself into the Chemtech Fog, as the curtains were called, and then dismissed. No curtains tonight. Indeed. Not Perhaps yet on this game, at least. On. No, exactly right. Can we get a control ward into the back of that pit is the question. As Beryl is going to find this ward, he'll kill it. On oh, Freaks on this Baron, doing exactly what we asked them to do. Vision's still there, and I believe yeah. DRX know that they do not want to fight 5v5 against an Elder Buff team. That makes a lot of sense. But Baron now being given over is dangerous. 25 seconds left on the Elder buff, and now DRX, they can fight against a Kwangdom Freaks with Baron instead of a Kwangdom Freaks with Elder, and that might be what you want. And here, the Drake control is really, really nice, right? With Yoshi being as low as he is, uh, and the final shot hitting didn't even see. That wouldn't have mattered. He wouldn't have made, been able to make his way around the pit. Um, it is overall very nice, but they do give up Hoyt, and because of Hoyt dying, a large part of that buff actually does nothing. Yeah, right? I, and I mean, it's gone. It's, it is, yeah. And it got them a barrow. Baron. It did definitely get them a barrow, and that is certainly good news. 3,000 gold means zero yeah. this game. I think the value of the Chemtech Soul is far more oh, yeah. than that of 3,000 gold. So DRX should still be in a pretty good position. Six items on both Teddy and Deft. And, and Deft hasn't died this game still. No. I, I, I want to highlight the pressure that's on these teams and these players, right? Like, yeah. with how incredibly important. And you can look at this and you can think, these are just the bottom two teams. Like, who cares? But for these players, like, we know how competitive these guys are. We know how much they want to push it. For DRX going 0 and 4, yeah. of a roster of this caliber will just be a huge disappointment of players with such long stories, career like Deft. And Teddy. And, and Teddy. And Barrel. And right? Key. And Key. Yeah. Like, it, it doesn't end. And uh, that is something that. I think it's really easy when you're watching, but playing in a situation like this where you know a single misstep that you make can instantly end the game, yeah, it's terrifying. And expectations are, you know, scary things as well, right? Whoa, if you don't meet in. them, it becomes far more difficult He's to them. Waiting. Meet them. There we go. Uh, teleport into the back line. Solar Flare goes to Narnia. As there's a shockwave onto two, massive as Beryl almost dies, but manages to get the grand entrance onto Teddy Keen. Look, uh, King and looking for it, but Hoyt is gonna go down. Teddy gets far enough back in order to call these curtains, and Pyoshik has to break his stopwatch. Kingen thought he was gonna get hit by that spear, but he probably wasn't in Keen. Oh, just qu can't quite make his way in. Hoyt fell down, but DRX are all left standing. Their health bars, not so high, but they have a fountain to go back to. Def wants to defend this turret, but he's not going to be able to, and Kwang Dong Freaks, they back away before the rest of the cavalry return. So it is just a turret. It is not an inhibitor. DRX, I don't, I'm trying to call who won fights after these. I, things, no one did. It just doesn't no one really did. No, exist. No, 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 it doesn't matter. There, 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 will, there will be no fights. There is only one fight, and that's the fight of who wins. This is not a fight. All right. This is a precursor to that the fight. That shockwave did so much damage. Without that shockwave, Kwang will lose the game here. Because that flank isn't stifled, the entire team can actually move up. But because Fate hit two people there, because the Arax getting a little bit too trigger happy uh, with wanting to try and get that perfect synergy between King and, and Beryl, uh, they're going to have to give up and take three. Yes. How many uh, Barons? does one need to 
to win the game. I, sorry, elders. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. And we don't have these answers. If there's one thing we've learned is that no matter how many game-ending mechanics you add to a game, the LCK will find a way <laughs> to not make it work. Well, do you know what happened to Zeka? He just got his license to kill. Oh boy. We'll see whether well, he hasn't done it yet. It. Although I think that 006 also had a license to kill. It's the 00 that gives you the license to kill, so um, he's had it for this whole time. But maybe you didn't know that. As Teddy takes a lot of damage. Fine. Looks for the deadly flow. Doesn't get it. The spear's going wide as well. Pioshik losing a little bit of health. As now, DRX shirelliering their way forward. Just back and to all. The Elder is up once again. Barrel comes on in. There's the curtains. DRX grouped up, Solar Flare avoided for the stuns, but the slows come in, no follow-up. A lot of damage here is Deft if he finds any autos at all. Then Kwang Gong just die. He does so much damage, it is absurd. Curtain Call on cooldown. And so now the fight breaks out. Shockwave under two, but not able to get the kills just yet. And this time, it's DRX to pick up the Dragon. Hoyt is going to get eaten by it. And Keen now off to the side, not able to get the value as Teddy is going to get knocked up and eaten by Pioshik. Death dancing forward. Keen has to flash. And I think DRX may just have done it. They may just have picked up their first series win and their first win for six whole sets in a row. It is a huge moment for them. Fate is holding onto the wave though, so we might have to hold that thought as this is the hero minion. This Siege minion has to stay alive if DRX want to win right here. Fate is desperately going to try to hold on here. They can kill the minion, but there is a teleport! Yep, teleport right on top of it, but the turret is going to get mad at Zekka, who gets his, himself a shield, but King in is absolutely alive. massive. Death needs to keep hitting these turrets as Keen dives on top of him, but the dragon will kill. The shockwave connects, but it's not going to do enough. And DRX against all odds have done it again it's the same way they won but 706 and death will take down the nexus i am so tired that's gotta be a cathartic win for drx you can talk about how it was done but in the end of the day we all know the only thing that matters is getting that win and that they did yep finally they can get that. I'm gonna need. I'm gonna need all of you, back. all of you in Twitch chat. If there is a post match in on Reddit, make sure you get in there and say clean 2-0. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. It is a Deft Teams special. We haven't been able to do it for KT for quite some time because they've either actually been clean or they didn't win. Um, but this was definitely one of those classic moments. It didn't look pretty, but they got the 2-0 in the end. And honestly, absolutely heroic. I say that I feel tired after this. It's because of the level of intensity between these two teams. It would have been absolutely heartbreaking for Condom Freaks, but you can see the relief on DRX. This is a team that hadn't been able to pick up a win at all for so incredibly long, and finally they do it. They would have been thinking that that first match against Liv Sandbox, that was it. That was their opportunity. Get the season started properly. Wasn't the case. And then they had two very difficult opposition. And finally, they get there. And it's a 2-0, no less. As you said, that was clean 2-0. Nothing, Nothing to see here. And I, I want to reiterate um, that this was... A game where both teams are going to have to walk away from. It's going to be a lot of vote reviews. It's going to be a lot of lessons learned from this. For Kwangdong, again, they are clearly, they haven't found their identity yet. Are they an aggressive team? Are they going to try and play? And that is the first time in a long time that I have seen Pioshik smile. And I got to say, that, I mean, Pioshik, that feels good. That was, that was the waterworks. You can see how emotional this guy is after this win. Yeah. And... It's understandable because while Zeka and Deft and Barrel all came of different teams, Kingen and Pioshik have experienced a summer of loss. Yeah. Right? It's it's completely understandable. And the Deft living here is it's ludicrous. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand. Um, there were there were a lot of these moments where it, it just it all seemed to finally go DRX's way after what was such a long string or such a long series of unfortunate events. Yeah. And that book series is very long too.
Uh, Zeka, his Zonya's this game were actually insane. Just saying, he managed to, he got engaged on so many times and there are often times where you see that uh, a mid laner will get caught out of position. It happened to fate actually in this game as LM steals this particular elder, but it's not the first and it's not the last. This is not the one that matters. Wait, is that the, was that the first? I'm not sure, I've, I'm at a loss. Was this was, the one that, yeah, I think this was, was the, the last, right? Uh, no, 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 this, no, no, was this the is the second, second one. Yeah, this yeah, was the yeah, second, yeah, yeah. yeah, never mind, never mind. Because so Pioshik goes down. Yeah, second elder, there you go. Uh, no, Pioshik didn't go down. They, in fact, killed Void, I think. Oh, no, because he went into... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, went, he went low, yeah. Uh, this was another ult flying wide from death, but the really awkward part was Hoyt throwing his away at the beginning of the fight, and the Solar Flare could have been very valuable here. Yes, man. Let's have a look at the final fight and listen to DRX. Oh, that sigh. That, that is a lot sigh. of relief. That is a lot of relief. And it is exactly the same gold graph as get Well, a little bit more um, <laughs> trending still? towards Guangdong Freaks this time, but still it's basically the same thing. And it's not a story that we were surprised to see whatsoever um, after how these two teams played, but man. I'm very happy for DRX and uh, quite sad for Condom Freaks. Because there, there are. It, it's a, it's a, a night of two tails, right? On DRX's hand, you got to be yeah. so happy for these guys, but at the same time, Kwang Nong fought so hard, and we see so many individual moments of greatness, right? Keen with a couple of amazing, yep. uh, amazing moments. Teddy doing so much, topping damage chart as Jin is like. I, that's an achievement. Like it, yeah, so many times, Jins are just relegated to supports, and it's just not enough. No, it wasn't quite. It's uh, it's uh, it's just it's a Quandong that's starting to try and build themselves up into what they want to be, right? And this is not it, but they do have a lot of time, right? And it's best to be working on it in spring rather than collapsing in summer. Agreed. And. Hopefully they can figure it out because losing here uh, against DRX, a team that hasn't found any wins for a very, very long time is definitely unfortunate for them. But if we have a look at the other side of the coin, DRX was not a team that we expected to be all the way at the bottom of the standings, right? This is a team that has Deft and Beryl, two extraordinarily accomplished players. Um, but yes, um, just definitely a little bit of a shame. But ladies and gentlemen, um, I believe we're getting closer and closer to the POG, which I am very much looking forward to. But let's uh, bring up the standings first and have a look at how the LCK sits after the second week of play. Gen G and, and T1 well and truly at the top with T1 being able to win that extra game earlier today, which put them one point ahead. And I think you'd expect DRX and Kwong to maybe be a little bit higher, but this is in many ways, what a lot of us, I think, were expecting coming into the split. T1, Gen yeah. Nongshim doing thus far, I think, very, very nicely. Really, the roster coming to him. Dread having an amazing split so far. And KT also one of the uh, also surprises, I'd say. Domon, obviously, having played against Gen G already uh, and having played against Nongshim, should be expected that uh, they will slowly rise as well. And we're slowly getting a kind of a general idea of where everyone in the LCK situated, but there's still a lot of chaos, as, as we saw. It's yeah, nice I mean, well. it's the only, it's only the top six that we can actually separate um, by our point system. And uh, there is an equal seventh uh, <laughs> for the very end with Hummer Life just being able to pull themselves up to sixth. 
by getting that extra game win. So it is by no means uh, anything that's actually representative of how this season is going to go yet, just because the sample size is so low, right? We just haven't had enough games, and uh, strength of schedule is a very important thing to look at. T1, of course, not necessarily going up against the best just yet. That's why next week is so extraordinarily interesting, because T1, I think they're up against Nongshim and Damwon Kia, which are definitely tougher opposition than they've seen thus far. Oh, yeah. It's going to be really, really cool. I can't wait for that. Who did um, you give the POG, by the way? Going back to our, our I, most recent series, the DRX win. I wasn't Who got sure uh, between Pioshik and Beryl. I mm -hmm. feel like those two, to me, were the two standouts. I went with Pioshik in the end. Yep. Uh, I think it was a cathartic experience, and I really want to talk to him. Oh, well, I'm not going to, but... Uh, you want to uh, hear from him, right? Yeah, yeah you, you really do, right? And, and I think that if Beryl ends up getting it, I think it's fine. Beryl had an exceptional Rakan game as well. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, Pioshik to me was... Because it was such a transformation, and it was... I don't expect Pioshik to suddenly start, you know, clapping everyone. That's not what he needs to be, but at least go back to the Pioshik that we saw that, while having some, some downsides, was also, I think, a great addition to the LCK. No, absolutely. I mean, this guy was also doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff, right? He was playing his Kindred a lot, and he brought the Udia towards the LCK and was playing a very aggressive style, but also being able to do it with really good mechanics. And we just haven't seen that... For all summer. Yeah, that aggression and the proactivity out of Pyoshik whatsoever. And when he's not feeling it, he's just not feeling it, right? And uh, we need him to be feeling it again so that our DRX can actually pick up some more Ws. And I think after a 2-0 here, they're definitely going to be feeling better about it. Let's bring up player of the game, and it will be Kyoshik. There he is. So we actually get the Kyoshik interview, which is exactly what everyone wanted. Very deserved on the Zen. Starting off the game for his team very, very nicely. And really being the primary source of Engage, because while Pioshik, I think, had an exceptional uh, game, King and still very much trying to refine his footing. Uh, I think that in his case, it is still a lot of work to be done. But Pioshik, not even going back to some of the early plays, because his game was so long, that you kind of yeah. lose track of all the plays he made. But the engaging, the zoning that he did, the amount of damage that he was able to tank, uh, uh, all while, it felt like he died. Way more time. And it would have been fine. Like, we're not yeah. KDA players already this game. If you die a lot... He's you know, a tank. He's Dor supposed to, right? Yeah. Yeah, but like Doran also picked up a, a, a POG with like, what, 2, 5, and 6 as a KDA. That's uh -huh. fine. But the interesting thing is that he was actually able to set up all these plays, engage, be at the forefront of every single fight, and still be completely fine. Still, 9 out of 13, and wants. Deft picks up the rest. Interesting. Um, I like it. I, I value I value the vote um, for for Beryl. I thought that a lot of his engages were fantastic. It, it the yeah. fact that he was following up on everything and actually trying to make stuff happen alongside Pyoshik is my 100% favorite part. And uh, now we get to hear from Pyoshik, which is absolutely uh, the best thing here. And also Zekka as well for his first interview now that he's moved uh, over to the LCK, um, which is going to be really, really cool. And I believe we are going to have G-Sun alongside to translate that one. So let's start it up now. Thank you very much, guys. This is Jason for the interview translation for the first time for DRX. We are here joined by Zeka Piosik, the mid jungle duo of DRX. After a six mad six game losing streak, you guys got your first victory of the split. How do you feel, Piosik? You know, we were on a very long losing streak, starting from the last summer split, but it's been so long since we got a 2 victory, so I'm just so happy. And Zeka, how are you feeling? This is your first POG as well. Uh, in the previous three matches, you know, we expected to get at least one victory, but we were on a three-match losing streak, so I was losing my confidence, so we were all feeling small, so it's a huge relief that we were able to get this victory today. Pyosik, I can't tell that the Arx was so hungry and desperate for a victory, so what was the focal point th throughout the slump? We wanted to focus on the fundamentals because we thought we were lacking those. And then we also realized that our teamwork is not on point as well, so the atmosphere wasn't that good. But after the T1 series, our captain, 
theft actually, you know, said he wants a uh, feedback. Without the coaching staff, just the just the players, so we were able to actually like speak from the bottom of my, our heart. You know, we were just talking about everything. He was trying to lead the team to have better atmosphere and energy. I, I can tell that Pusik is getting a little bit emotional after the first and well-deserved victory, so please give a warm round of applause for Pusik. Congratulations once again. So let's get back to game number one. In game one, Kwangdong Freaks had the Dragon Soul, but you guys are able to turn the game around and then get the victory after winning a huge team fight at the Elder Drake. At the Elder fight, you know. As long as we can find the perfect engage, I was pretty sure that I can just collapse onto the enemy enemy carries. So. I made it and we pulled it off and I was just telling my teammates that we can do it. And I had this confidence that we will win the team fight in the later game. In game number two, Renekton, a champion that had 100% pigment rate, was let through and Kian was able to secure that pick. So what was the plan in that draft? Kian said he's really confident in playing against Renekton and also for us as well, as well as, I mean, if Keen plays Renekton, actually this champion has um, expiration date, you know, so we knew that later phase will be in favor of us. And then we had this classic Renekton Nidalee comp on the top side of Kwangdong Freaks. Renekton Nidalee, their early game dive is so strong, so as long as we can, you know, pass through that phase of the game, we knew that we had the lead and priority for mid and the late game. Game. game two, we had, we were able to hear the voice come from the DRX players and you were very vocal, very confident. Uh, was that because of, you know, winning game number one? Did it help you boost your confidence? I mean, I was probably the only one to open team fights and engage, so I was the one, you know, just playing on the line, you know, taking all the aggros, and I was feeling pretty confident because I was able to actually play that really well and playing the limits. So I was, yeah, feeling pretty confident. Game number two was an epic game. We had, so the longest game of the spring split was 40 minutes and seven seconds long, but it was for, this game was 48 minutes and six seconds. So when was the moment moment that you guys were confident to close out the game. Well, it was pretty exhausting because we played about back-to-back 50-minute -back long games, so, but after that, I was pretty happy. For me, in the final Elder fight, well, Beryl said, just push away, Gregus and Nidalee, then the Elder is ours. So after that shot call, you know, and after I pulled it off, I was pretty confident that we were able to take the victory. Some people actually criticize that DRX uh, isn't that decisive. So, you know, what is their focal point in terms of, you know, improvements for DRX? Well, I've been losing my confidence since last summer, probably. But after the T1 series, a lot of people actually said, you know, they were very confident. They're still a great player, so they were just trying to give, you know, tips to each other and also try to cheer us up. So after that T1 series, we in the screams, we focused on you know regaining our confidence. What about you, Zeka? Same confidence. You know, we were all just feeling so small. But with this victory, I think we will be able to bounce back. And also, I hope we can find even better teamwork in the future. Your next opponent is Freddy Brion. How are you going to prepare for that match? Freddy Brion, compared to 
I mean, Freddy Bruin is so strong against the stronger teams. They're the giant slayers. I think we have to, you know, prepare really well for that match. And Pusey, I can tell you are very emotional after this first victory. And we have so many fans out here. So any last message you would like to send to the fans? You know, it's been so long since I played in front of the um, live audience because after I had my debut, it was a COVID situation. So I really wanted to show something to the fans, but I was so embarrassed to stand in front of the audience, you know, with, ev with this long slump. But with this victory secured today, it feels awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing more of POG and DRX POG interview in the future. Once again, congratulations. And now back to our casters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jisun, for the translation. Definitely a lot of emotions. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm getting there. That was... Yeah. It's pretty heartbreaking. And look, Piyoshik has been very raw on broadcast before, right? He has been very emotional. He, live, he has his heart on his sleeve, and it shows in his play, right? When he's feeling good, he plays don't. good. And if you feel bad, often it uh, emotionally affects how you're going to play as well. Um, you can see the uh, challenger uh, bracket for the next couple of days on your screen right here. This guy is uh, well and truly keen to uh, keep you up to date with some challenger on his stream oh, for the next, next week. two days. Oh, oh, oh there's yeah. T1 matches. Oh That's I mean, I did mention this no, uh, I know moments did. before. I just have to reiterate. Yeah, no, it's uh, definitely going to be a lot of fun. And the Condom Freaks time is going to continue to be a little bit difficult with their first match on Wednesday. But Fred Brion might be a target that they could potentially take down. Um, having a look at DRX, they're against Fred Brion and Nongshim. Um, Nongshim, definitely a difficult task, but Fred Brion might oh, yeah. be someone that they could potentially pick up a win against and maybe Shut some you. momentum uh, for DRX so we can get Happy Pershik back, which is precisely what we want. Absolutely. I think that's all we can uh, really look for as cool matches. Yeah, uh, gonna seven days a week. You know, we, we yeah. keep going. Yep. Uh, two days of challengers, <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I might pop into the stream. You should. Uh, we'll see. I might, nice. uh, might be streaming myself. But, ladies and gentlemen, that will do it for tonight. And for this week, we'll see you for week three of LCK 2022 Spring in a couple of days' time. Never believe love has set me free.